Preface of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek McLaughlin. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Preface. A picture of life in the fifth century must needs contain much which will be painful to any reader, and which the young and innocent will do well to leave altogether unread. It has to represent a very hideous, though a very great, age, one of those critical and cardinal eras in the history of the human race, in which virtues and vices manifest themselves side by side, even at times in the same person, with the most startling openness and power. One who writes of such an era labors under a troublesome disadvantage. He dare not tell how evil people were. He will not be believed if he tells how good they were. In the present case that disadvantage is doubled, for while the sins of the church, however heinous, were still such as admit of being expressed in words, the sins of the heathen world, against which she fought, were utterly indescribable, and the Christian apologist is thus compelled, for the sake of decency, to state the Church's case far more weakly than the facts deserve. Not, be it ever remembered, that the slightest suspicion of immorality attaches either to the heroine of this book, or to the leading philosophers of her school, for several centuries. Howsoever base and profligate their disciples, or the Manichees, may have been, the great Neoplatonists were, as Manes himself was, persons of the most rigid and ascetic virtue. For a time had arrived in which no teacher who did not put forth the most lofty pretensions to righteousness could expect a hearing. That divine word, who is the light who lighteth every man which cometh into the world, had awakened in the heart of mankind a moral craving never before felt in any strength, except by a few isolated philosophers or prophets. The spirit had been poured out on all flesh, and from one end of the empire to the other, from the slave in the mill to the emperor on his throne, all hearts were either hungering and thirsting after righteousness, or learning to do homage to those who did so. And he who excited the craving was also furnishing that which would satisfy it, and was teaching mankind, by a long and painful education, to distinguish the truth from its innumerable counterfeits, and to find, for the first time in the world's life, a good news not merely for the select few, but for all mankind, without respect of rank or race. For somewhat more than four hundred years the Roman Empire and the Christian Church, born into the world almost at the same moment, had been developing themselves side by side as two great rival powers, in deadly struggle for the possession of the human race. The weapons of the Empire had been not merely an overwhelming physical force, and a ruthless lust of aggressive conquest, but, even more powerful still, an unequal genius for organization, and a uniform system of external law and order. This was generally a real boon to conquered nations, because it substituted a fixed and regular spoliation for the fortuitous and arbitrary miseries of savage warfare, but it arrayed, meanwhile, on the side of the empire, the wealthier citizens of every province, by allowing them their share in the plunder of the laboring masses below them. These, in the country districts, were utterly enslaved, while in the cities nominal freedom was of little use to masses kept from starvation by the alms of the government, and drugged into brutish good humor by a vast system of public spectacles, in which the realms of nature and of art were ransacked to glut the wonder, lust, and ferocity of a degraded populace. Against this vast organization the Church had been fighting for now four hundred years, armed only with its own mighty and all-embracing message, and with the manifestation of a spirit of purity and virtue, of love and self-sacrifice, which had proved itself mightier to melt and weld together the hearts of men than all the force and terror, all the mechanical organization, all the sensual baits with which the empire had been contending against that gospel in which it had recognized instinctively and at first sight its internecine foe. And now the church had conquered. The weak things of this world had confounded the strong. In spite of the devilish cruelties of persecutors, in spite of the contaminating atmosphere of sin which surrounded her, in spite of having to form herself, not out of a race of pure and separate creatures, 
but by a most literal new birth out of those very fallen masses who insulted and persecuted her, in spite of having to endure within herself continual outbursts of the evil passions in which her members had once indulged without cheek, in spite of a thousand counterfeits which sprang up around her and within her, claiming to be parts of her, and alluring men to themselves by that very exclusiveness and party arrogance which disproved their claim, in spite of all, she had conquered. The very emperors had arrayed themselves on her side. Julian's last attempt to restore paganism by imperial influence had only proved that the old faith had lost all hold upon the hearts of the masses. At his death the great tide-wave of new opinion rolled on unchecked, and the rulers of earth were fain to swim with the stream, to accept, in words at least, the church's laws as theirs, to acknowledge a king of kings to whom even they owed homage and obedience and to call their own slaves their poorer brethren, and often, too, their spiritual superiors. But if the emperors had become Christian, the empire had not. Here and there an abuse was lopped off, or an edict was passed for the visitation of prisons and for the welfare of prisoners, or a Theodosius was recalled to justice and humanity for a while by the stern rebukes of an Ambrose. But the empire was still the same, still a great tyranny, enslaving the masses, crushing national life, fattening itself and its officials on a system of worldwide robbery, and while it was paramount, there could be no hope for the human race. Nay, there were even those among the Christians who saw, like Dante afterwards, in the fatal gift of Constantine, and the truce between the Church and the Empire, fresh and more deadly danger. Was not the empire trying to extend over the church itself that upas shadow with which it had withered up every other form of human existence, to make her too its stipendiary slave official, to be pampered when obedient, and scourged whenever she dare assert a free will of her own, a law beyond that of her tyrants, to throw on her, by a refined hypocrisy, the care and support of the masses on whose lifeblood it was feeding? So thought many then, and, as I believe, not unwisely. But if the social condition of the civilized world was anomalous at the beginning of the fifth century, its spiritual state was still more so. The universal fusion of races, languages, and customs, which had gone on for four centuries under the Roman rule, had produced a corresponding fusion of creeds, a universal fermentation of human thought and faith. All honest belief in the old local superstitions of paganism had been long dying out before the more palpable and material idolatry of emperor worship, and the gods of the nations, unable to deliver those who had trusted in them, became one by one the vassals of the divus Caesar, neglected by the philosophic rich, and only worshipped by the lower classes, where the old rites still pandered to their grosser appetites, or subserved the wealth and importance of some particular locality. In the meanwhile, the minds of men, cut adrift from their ancient moorings, wandered wildly over pathless seas of speculative doubt, and especially in the more metaphysical and contemplative East, attempted to solve for themselves the questions of man's relation to the unseen by those thousand schisms, heresies, and theosophies. It is a disgrace to the word philosophy to call them by it. On the records of which the student now gazes bewildered, unable alike to count or to explain their fantasies. Yet even these, like every outburst of free human thought, had their use and their fruit. They brought before the minds of churchmen a thousand new questions which must be solved, unless the church was to relinquish forever her claims as the great teacher and satisfier of the human soul. To study these bubbles, as they formed and burst on every wave of human life, to feel, too often by sad experience, as Augustine felt, the charm of their allurements, to divide the truths at which they aimed from the falsehood which they offered as its substitute, to exhibit the Catholic Church as possessing, in the great facts which she proclaimed, full satisfaction, even for the most subtle metaphysical cravings of a diseased age. That was the work of the time, and men were sent to do it, and aided in their labor by the very causes which had produced the intellectual revolution. The general intermixture of ideas, creeds, and races, even the mere physical facilities for intercourse between different parts of the empire, helped to give the great Christian fathers of the 4th and 5th centuries a breadth of observation, a depth of thought, 
a large-hearted and large-minded patience and tolerance, such as, we may say boldly, the Church has since beheld but rarely, and the world never, at least if we are to judge those great men by what they had, and not by what they had not, and to believe, as we are bound, that had they lived now and not then, they would have towered as far above the heads of this generation as they did above the heads of their own. And thus an age, which, to the shallow insight of a sneerer like Gibbon, seems only a rotting and aimless chaos of sensuality and anarchy, fanaticism and hypocrisy, produced a Clement and an Athanase, a Chrysostom and an Augustine, absorbed into the sphere of Christianity all which was most valuable in the philosophies of Greece and Egypt, and in the social organization of Rome as an heirloom for nations yet unborn and laid in foreign lands by unconscious agents the foundations of all European thought and ethics. But the health of a church depends not merely on the creed which it professes, not even on the wisdom and holiness of a few great ecclesiastics, but on the faith and virtue of its individual members. The men's sana must have a corpus sanum to inhabit. And even for the Western Church, the lofty future which was in store for it would have been impossible without some infusion of new and healthier blood into the veins of a world drained and tainted by the influence of Rome. And the new blood, at the era of this story, was at hand. The great tide of those Gothic nations, of which the Norwegian and the German are the purest remaining types, though every nation of Europe, from Gibraltar to St. Petersburg, owes to them the most precious elements of strength, was sweeping onward, wave over wave, in a steady southwestern current, across the whole Roman territory, and only stopping and recoiling when it reached the shores of the Mediterranean. Those wild tribes were bringing with them into the magic circle of the Western Church's influence the very materials which she required for the building up of a future Christendom, and which she could find as little in the Western Empire as in the Eastern. Comparative purity of morals, sacred respect for woman, for family life, law, equal justice, individual freedom, and, above all, for honesty in word and deed. Bodies untainted by hereditary effeminacy, hearts earnest though genial, and blessed with a strange willingness to learn, even from those whom they despised. A brain equal to that of the Roman in practical power, and not too far behind that of the Eastern in imaginative and speculative acuteness and their strength was felt at once. Their vanguard, confined with difficulty for three centuries beyond the eastern Alps, at the expense of sanguinary wars, had been adopted wherever it was practicable, into the service of the empire, and the heart's core of the Roman legion was composed of Gothic officers and soldiers. But now the main body had arrived. Tribe after tribe was crowding down to the Alps, and trampling upon each other on the frontiers of the empire. The Huns, singly their inferiors, pressed them from behind with the irresistible weight of numbers. Italy, with her rich cities and fertile lowlands, beckoned them on to plunder. As auxiliaries they had learned their own strength and a Roman weakness. A casus belli was soon found. How iniquitous was the conduct of the sons of Theodosius in refusing the usual bounty by which the Goths were bribed not to attack the empire! The whole pent-up deluge burst over the plains of Italy, and the Western Empire became from that day forth a dying idiot, while the new invaders divided Europe among themselves. The fifteen years before the time of this tale had decided the fate of Greece, the last four that of Rome itself. The countless treasures which five centuries of rapine had accumulated around the capital had become the prey of men clothed in sheepskins and horsehide and the sister of an emperor had found her beauty, virtue, and pride of race worthily matched by those of the hard-handed northern hero who led her away from Italy as his captive and his bride, to found new kingdoms in South France and Spain, and to drive the newly arrived vandals across the Straits of Gibraltar into the then blooming coastland of northern Africa. Everywhere the mangled limbs of the old world were seething in the Medea's cauldron, to come forth whole, and young, and strong. The Longbeards, noblest of their race, had found a temporary resting place on the Austrian frontier, after long southward wanderings from the Swedish mountains, soon to be dispossessed again by the advancing Huns, and, crossing the Alps, to give their name forever to the plains of Lombardy. 
A few more tumultuous years, and the Franks would find themselves lords of the Lower Rhineland, and before the hairs of Hypatia's scholars had grown gray, the mythic Hengist and Horsa would have landed on the shores of Kent, and an English nation have begun its worldwide life. But some great providence forbade to our race, triumphant in every other quarter, a footing beyond the Mediterranean, or even in Constantinople, which to this day preserves in Europe the faith and manners of Asia. The Eastern world seemed barred by some stern doom from the only influence which could have regenerated it. Every attempt of the Gothic races to establish themselves beyond the sea, whether in the form of an organized kingdom, as the Vandals attempted in Africa, or of a mere band of brigands, as did the Goths in Asia Minor, under Gainus, or of a Praetorian guard, as did the Varangens of the Middle Age, or as religious invaders, as did the Crusaders, ended only in the corruption and disappearance of the colonists. That extraordinary reform in morals, which, according to Salvian and his contemporaries, the Vandal conquerors worked in North Africa, availed them nothing. They lost more than they gave. Climate, bad example, and the luxury of power degraded them in one century into a race of helpless and debauched slaveholders, doomed to utter extermination before the semi-Gothic armies of Belisarius, and with them vanished the last chance that the Gothic races would exercise on the Eastern world the same stern yet wholesome discipline under which the Western had been restored to life. The Egyptian and Syrian churches, therefore, were destined to labor not for themselves, but for us. The signs of disease and decrepitude were already but too manifest in them. That very peculiar turn of the Greco-Eastern mind, which made them the great thinkers of the then world, had the effect of drawing them away from practice to speculation, and the races of Egypt and Syria were effeminate, over-civilized, exhausted by centuries during which no infusion of fresh blood had come to renew the stock. Morbid, self-conscious, physically indolent, incapable then, as now, of personal or political freedom, they afforded material out of which fanatics might easily be made, but not citizens of the kingdom of God. The very ideas of family and national life, those two divine roots of the church, severed from which she is certain to wither away into that most godless and most cruel of specters, a religious world, had perished in the East from the evil influence of the universal practice of slaveholding, as well as from the degradation of that Jewish nation, which had been for years the great witness for those ideas. And in all classes, like their forefather Adam, like, indeed, the old Adam, in every man and in every age, were shifting the blame of sin from their own consciences to human relationships and duties, and therein to the God who had appointed them, and saying, as of old, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The passionate Eastern character, like all weak ones, found total abstinence easier than temperance, religious thought more pleasant than godly action and a monastic world grew up all over the east of such vastness that in Egypt it was said to rival in numbers the lay population, producing, with an enormous decrease in the actual amount of moral evil, an equally great enervation and decrease of the population. Such a people could offer no resistance to the steadily increasing tyranny of the Eastern Empire. In vain did such men as Chrysostom and Basil oppose their personal influence to the hideous intrigues and villainies of the Byzantine court. The ever-downward career of Eastern Christianity went on unchecked for two more miserable centuries, side by side with the upward development of the Western Church. And, while the successors of the great St. Gregory were converting and civilizing a newborn Europe, the churches of the East were vanishing before Mohammedan invaders strong by living trust in that living God, whom the Christians, while they hated and persecuted each other for arguments about him, were denying and blaspheming in every action of their lives. But at the period whereof this story treats, the Greco-Eastern mind was still in the middle of its great work. That wonderful metaphysic subtlety, which, in phrases and definitions too often unmeaning to our grosser intellect, saw the symbols of the most important spiritual realities, and felt that on the distinction between homo uosius and homo iosius might hang the solution of the whole problem of humanity, 
was set to battle in Alexandria, the ancient stronghold of Greek philosophy, with the effete remains of the very scientific thought to which it owed its extraordinary culture. Monastic isolation from family and national duties especially fitted the fathers of that period for the task, by giving them leisure, if nothing else, to face questions with a lifelong earnestness impossible to the more social and practical northern mind. Our duty is, instead of sneering at them as pedantic dreamers, to thank heaven that men were found, just at the time when they were wanted, to do for us what we could never have done for ourselves, to leave to us as a precious heirloom, bought most truly with the lifeblood of their race, a metaphysic at once Christian and scientific, every attempt to improve on which has hitherto been found a failure and to battle victoriously with that strange brood of theoretic monsters begotten by effete Greek philosophy upon Egyptian symbolism, called the astrology, Parsi dualism, Brahminic spiritualism, graceful and gorgeous phantoms, whereof somewhat more will be said in the coming chapters. I have, in my sketch of Hypatia and her fate, closely followed authentic history, especially Socrates' account of the closing scene, as given in Book 7, Paragraph 15, of his Ecclesiastical History. I am inclined, however, for various historical reasons, to date her death two years earlier than he does. The tradition that she was the wife of Isidore, the philosopher, I reject, with Gibbon, as a palpable anachronism of at least fifty years, Isidore's master, Proclus, not having been born till the year before Hypatia's death contradicted, moreover, by the very author of it, Photius, who says distinctly, after comparing Hypatia and Isidore, that Isidore married a certain Domna. No hint, moreover, of her having been married appears in any contemporary authors, and the name of Isidore nowhere occurs among those of the many mutual friends to whom Synesius sends messages in his letters to Hypatia, in which, if anywhere, we should find mention of a husband, had one existed. To Synesius's most charming letters, as well as to those of Isidore, the good abbot of Pelusium, I beg leave to refer those readers who wish for further information about the private life of the 5th century. I cannot hope that these pages will be altogether free from anachronisms and errors. I can only say that I have labored honestly and industriously to discover the truth, even in its minutest details and to sketch the age, its manners, and its literature as I found them, altogether artificial, slipshod, effete, resembling far more the times of Louis Cannes than those of Sophocles and Plato. And so I send forth this little sketch, ready to give my hearty thanks to any reviewer who, by exposing my mistakes, shall teach me and the public somewhat more about the last struggle between the young church and the old world. End of preface. Chapter One of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Newfound. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. CHAPTER I. THE LAURA In the four hundred and thirteenth year of the Christian era, some three hundred miles above Alexandria, the young monk Philemon was sitting on the edge of a low range of inland cliffs, crested with drifting sand. Behind him the desert sand-waste stretched, lifeless, interminable, reflecting its lurid glare on the horizon of the cloudless vault of blue. At his feet, the sand dripped and trickled in yellow rivulets from crack to crack and ledge to ledge, or a whirled past him in tiny jets of yellow smoke before the fitful summer airs. Here and there, upon the face of the cliffs which walled in the opposite side of the narrow glen below, were cavernous tombs, huge old quarries with obelisks and half-cut pillars, standing as the workmen had left them centuries before. The sand was slipping down and piling up around them, their heads were frosted with the arid snow. Everywhere was silence, desolation, the grave of a dead nation in a dying land. And there he sat, musing above it all, 
full of life and youth and health and beauty, a young Apollo of the desert. His only clothing was a ragged sheepskin, bound with a leathern girdle. His long black locks, unshorn from childhood, waved and glistened in the sun. A rich dark down on cheek and chin showed the spring of healthful manhood. His hard hands and sinewy sunburnt limbs told of labor and endurance. His flashing eyes and beetling brow, of daring, fancy, passion, thought, which had no sphere of action in such a place. What did his glorious young humanity alone among the tombs? So perhaps he too thought, as he passed his hand across his brow, as if to sweep away some gathering dream, and sighing, rose and wandered along the cliffs, peering downward at every point and cranny, in search of fuel for the monastery from which he came. Simple as was the material which he sought, consisting chiefly of the low arid desert shrubs, with now and then a fragment of wood from some deserted quarry or ruin, it was becoming scarcer and scarcer round Abbot Pambo's Laura at Satis, and long before Philemon had collected his daily quantity he had strayed farther from his home than he had ever been before. Suddenly, at the turn of the glen, he came upon a sight new to him, a temple carved in the sandstone cliff, and in front a smooth platform, strewn with beams and mouldering tools, and here and there a skull, bleaching among the sand, perhaps of some workman slaughtered at his labor in one of the thousand wars of old. The abbot, his spiritual father, indeed the only father whom he knew, for his earliest recollections were of the Laura and the old man's cell, had strictly forbidden him to enter, even to approach, any of these relics of ancient idolatry. But a broad terrace road led down to the platform from the tableland above. The plentiful supply of fuel was too tempting to be passed by. He would go down, gather a few sticks, and then return to tell the abbot of the treasure which he had found, and consult him as to the propriety of revisiting it. So down he went, hardly daring to raise his eyes to the alluring iniquities of the painted imagery which, gaudy in crimson and blue, still blazed out upon the desolate solitude, uninjured by that brainless air. But he was young, and youth is curious, and the devil, at least in the fifth century, busy with young brains. Now Philemon believed most utterly in the devil, and night and day devoutly prayed to be delivered from him. So he crossed himself, and ejaculated honestly enough, Lord, turn away mine eyes, lest they behold vanity, and looked nevertheless. And who could have helped looking at those four colossal kings, who sat there grim and motionless, their huge hands laid upon their knees in everlasting self-assured repose, seeming to bear up the mountain on their stately heads. A sense of awe, weakness, all but fear came over him. He dare not stoop to take up the wood at his feet, their great stern eyes watched him so steadily. Round their knees and round their thrones were mystic characters engraved, symbol after symbol, line below line the ancient wisdom of the Egyptians, wherein Moses, the man of God, was learned of old. Why should not he know it, too? What awful secrets might not be hidden there about the great world, past, present, and future, of which he knew only so small a speck? Those kings who sat there, they had known it all. Their sharp lips seemed parting, ready to speak to him. Oh, that they would speak for once! and yet that grim, sneering smile, that seemed to look down on him from the heights of their power and wisdom with calm contempt, him, the poor youth, picking up the leaving and rags of their past majesty, he dared look at them no more. So he looked past them into the temple halls, into a lustrous abyss of cool green shade, deepening on and inward, pillar after pillar, vista after vista, into deepest night and dimly through the gloom he would descry, on every wall and column, gorgeous arabesques, long lines of pictured story, triumphs and labors, rows of captives in foreign and fantastic dresses, leading strange animals, bearing the tributes of unknown lands, rows of ladies at feasts, their heads crowned with garlands, 
the fragrant lotus flower in every hand, while slaves brought wine and perfumes, and children sat upon their knees, and husbands by their side. And dancing girls, in transparent robes and golden girdles, tossed their tawny limbs wildly among the throng. What was the meaning of it all? Why had it all been? Why had it gone on thus, the great world, century after century, millennium after millennium, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and knowing nothing better? How could they know anything better? Their forefathers had lost the light ages and ages before they were born, and Christ had not come for ages and ages after they were dead. How could they know? And yet they were all in hell, every one of them. Every one of these ladies who sat there, with her bushy locks and garlands and jeweled collars and lotus flowers and gauzy dress, displaying all her slender limbs, who, perhaps when she was alive, smiled so sweetly and went so gaily, and had children and friends, and never once thought of what was going to happen to her. What must happen to her? She was in hell, burning for ever and ever and ever, there below his feet. He stared down on the rocky floors. If he could but see through them, and the eye of faith could see through them, he should behold her writhing and twisting among the flickering flame, scorched, glowing, in everlasting agony, such as the thought of enduring for a moment made him shudder. He had burnt his hands once, when a palm-leaf but caught fire. He recollected what that was like. She was enduring ten thousand times more than that for ever. He should hear her shrieking in vain for a drop of water to cool her tongue. He had never heard a human being shriek but once, a boy bathing on the opposite Nile bank, whom a crocodile had dragged down. And that scream, faint and distant as it came across the mighty tide, had rung intolerable in his ears for days. And to think of all which echoed through these vaults of fire, forever. Was the thought bearable? Was it possible? Millions upon millions burning forever for Adam's fall. Could God be just in that? It was the temptation of a fiend. He had entered the unhallowed precincts where devils still lingered about their ancient shrines. He had let his eyes devour the abominations of the heathen, and given place to the devil. He would flee home to confess it all to his father. He would punish him as he deserved, pray for him, forgive him. And yet could he tell him all? Could he, dare he, confess to him the whole truth, the insatiable craving to know the mysteries of learning, to see the great roaring world of men which had been growing up in him slowly, month after month, till now it had assumed this fearful shape? He could stay no longer in the desert. This world which sent all souls to hell, was it as bad as monks declared it was? It must be, else how could such be the fruit of it? But it was too awful a thought to be taken on trust. No, he must go and see. Filled with such fearful questionings, half-articulate and vague, like the thoughts of a child, the untutored youth went wandering on, till he reached the edge of the cliff below which lay his home. It lay pleasantly enough, that lonely Laura, or lane of rude cyclopean cells, under the perpetual shadow of the southern wall of crags, amid its grove of ancient date trees. A branching cavern in the cliff supplied the purposes of a chapel, a storehouse, and a hospital, while on the sunny slope across the glen lay the common gardens of the Brotherhood, green with millet, maize, and beans, among which a tiny streamlet, husbanded and guided with the most thrifty care, wandered down from the cliff foot, and spread perpetual verdure over the little plot which voluntary and fraternal labor had painfully redeemed from the inroads of the all-devouring sand. For that garden, like everything else in the Laura, except each brother's seven feet of stone sleeping hut, was the common property, and therefore the common care and joy of all. For the common good, as well as for his own, each man had toiled up the glen with his palm-leaf basket of black mud from the river Nile, over whose broad sheet of silver the glen's mouth yawned abrupt. For the common good, 
Each man had swept the ledges clear of sand, and sown in the scanty artificial soil, the harvest of which all were to share alike. To buy clothes, books, and chapel furniture for the common necessities, education, and worship, each man sat, day after day, week after week, his mind full of high and heavenly thoughts, weaving the leaves of their little palm cups into baskets, which an aged monk exchanged for goods with the more prosperous and frequented monasteries of the opposite bank. Thither Philemon rowed the old man over, week by week, in a light canoe of papyrus, and fished, as he sat waiting for him, for the common meal. A simple, happy, gentle life was that of the Laura, all portioned out by rules and methods, which were held hardly less sacred than those of the scriptures on which they were supposed, and not so wrongly either, to have been framed. Each man had food and raiment, shelter on earth, friends and counsellors, living trust in the continual care of Almighty God, and, blazing before his eyes by day and night, the hope of everlasting glory beyond all poets' dreams and what more would man have had in those days? Thither they had fled out of cities, compared with which Paris is earnest, and Gomorrah chaste, out of a rotten, infernal, dying world of tyrants and slaves, hypocrites and wantons, to ponder undisturbed on duty and on judgment, on death and eternity, heaven and hell, to find a common creed, a common interest, a common hope, common duties, pleasures, and sorrows. True, they had many of them fled from the post where God had placed them, when they fled from man into the Thebaid waste. What sort of post, and what sort of an age they were, from which these old monks fled, we shall see, perhaps, before this tale is told out. "'Thou art late, son,' said the abbot, steadfastly working away at his palm-basket, as Philemon approached. "'Fuel is scarce and I was forced to go far. A monk should not answer till he is questioned. I did not ask the reason. Where didst thou find that wood? Before the temple, far up the glen. The temple? What didst thou see there? No answer. Pombo looked up with his keen black eye. Thou hast entered it, and lusted after its abominations. I, I did not enter but I looked. And what didst thou see? Women? Philemon was silent. Have I not bidden you never to look on the face of women? Are they not the first fruits of the devil, the authors of all evil, the subtlest of Satan's snares? Are they not accursed for ever, for the deceit of their first mother, by whom sin entered the world? A woman first opened the gates of hell, and until this day they are portresses thereof. Unhappy boy! What hast thou done? They were but painted on the walls. Ah! said the abbot, as if suddenly relieved from a heavy burden. But how knowest thou them to be women, when thou hast never yet, unless thou liest, which I believe not of thee, seen the face of a daughter of Eve? Perhaps, perhaps, said Philemon, as if suddenly relieved by a new suggestion, perhaps they were only devils. They must have been, I think, for they were so very beautiful. Ah! How knowest thou that devils are beautiful? I was launching the boat a week ago with Father Aufugus, and on the bank, not very near, there were two creatures, with long hair, and striped all over the lower half of their bodies with black and, and red and yellow and they were gathering flowers on the shore. Father Aufugus turned away, but I—I I could not help thinking them the most beautiful things that I had ever seen. So I asked him why he turned away, and he said that those were the same sort of devils which tempted the blessed St. Anthony. Then I recollected having heard it read aloud, how Satan tempted Anthony in the shape of a beautiful woman. And so those figures on the wall were very like— and I thought they might be— And the poor boy, who considered that he was making confession of a deadly and shameful sin, blushed scarlet, and stammered, and at last stopped. And thou thoughtest them beautiful? O oh, utter corruption of the flesh! O oh, subtlety of Satan! The Lord forgive thee, as I do, my poor child. 
henceforth thou goest not beyond the garden walls. Not beyond the walls! Impossible! I, I cannot! If thou wert not my father, I would say I will not. I must have liberty. I must see for myself. I must judge for myself what this world is of which you all talk so bitterly. I long for no pomps and vanities. I will promise you this moment, if you will, never to re-enter a heathen temple, to hide my face in the dust whenever I approach a woman. But I must, I must see the world. I must see the great mother church in Alexandria, and the patriarch, and his clergy. If they can serve God in the city, why not I? I could do more for God there than here. Not that I despise this work, not that I am ungrateful to you. Oh, never, never that! But I pant for the battle. Let me go. I am not discontented with you, but with myself. I know that obedience is noble, but danger is nobler still. If you have seen the world, why should not I? If you had fled from it because you found it too evil to live in, why should not I? And may turn to you here of my own will, never to leave you. And yet Cyril and his clergy have not fled from it. Desperately and breathlessly did Philemon drive this speech out of his inmost heart, and then waited, expecting the good abbot to strike him on the spot. If he had, the young man would have submitted patiently. So would any man, however venerable, in that monastery. Why not? Duly, after long companionship, thought, and prayer, they had elected Pombo for their abbot, Abba, father, the wisest, eldest-hearted, and headed of them. If he was that, it was time that he should be obeyed. And obeyed he was, with a loyal, reasonable love, and yet with an implicit, soldier-like obedience, which many a king and conqueror might envy. Were they cowards and slaves? The Roman legionaries should be good judges on that point. They used to say that no armed barbarian, goth or vandal, moor or Spaniard, was so terrible as the unarmed monk of the Thebaid. Twice the old man lifted his staff to strike, twice he laid it down again, and then, slowly rising, left Philemon kneeling there, and moved away deliberately, and with his eyes fixed on the ground, to the house of the brother Alfugus. Every one in the Laura honoured Alfugus. There was a mystery about him which heightened the charm of his surpassing sanctity, his childlike sweetness and humility. It was whispered, when the monks seldom and cautiously did whisper together in their lonely walks, that he had been once a great man, that he had come from a great city, perhaps from Rome itself, and the simple monks were proud to think that they had among them a man who had seen Rome. At least Abbot Pombo respected him. He was never beaten, never even reproved, perhaps he never required it, but still it was the meed of all, and was not the abbot a little partial? Yet, certainly, when Theophilus sent up a messenger from Alexandria rousing every Laura with the news of the sack of Rome by Alaric, did not Pombo take him first to the cell of Alfugus, and sit with him there three whole hours in secret consultation, before he told the awful story to the rest of the brotherhood? And did not Alfugus himself give letters to the messenger, written with his own hand, containing, as was said, deep secrets of world policy known only to himself? So, when the little lane of holy men, each peering stealthily over his plating work from the doorway of his sandstone cell, saw the abbot, after his unwonted passion, leaving the culprit kneeling, and take his way toward the sage's dwelling, they judged that something strange and delicate had befallen the common weal, and each wished, without envy, that he were as wise as the man whose counsel was to solve the difficulty. For an hour or more the abbot remained there, talking earnestly and low, and then a solemn sound as of the two old men praying with sobs and tears, and every brother bowed his head and whispered a hope that he whom they served might guide them for the good of the Laura, and of his church, and of the great heathen world beyond. And still Philemon knelt motionless, awaiting his sentence. His heart filled, who can tell how? The heart knoweth its own bitterness, 
and a stranger intermeddleth not with its joy. So thought he as he knelt, so think I too, knowing that in the pettiest character there are unfathomable depths, which the poet, all-seeing though he may pretend to be, can never analyze, but must only dimly guess at, and still more dimly sketch them by the actions which they beget. At last Pombo returned, deliberate, still, and slow as he had gone, and seating himself within his cell, spoke. And the youngest said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to my share. And he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Thou shalt go, my son. But first come after me and speak with Aufugus. Philemon, like every one else, loved Aufugus, and when the abbot retired and left the two alone together, he felt no dread or shame about unburdening his whole heart to him. Long and passionately he spoke, in answer to the gentle questions of the old man, who, without the rigidity or pedantic solemnity of the monk, interrupted the youth, and let himself be interrupted in return, gracefully, genially, almost playfully. And yet, there was a melancholy about his tone as he answered to the youth's appeal. Tertullian, Oregon, Clement, Cyprian, all these moved in the world, all these and many more beside, whose names we honor, whose prayers we invoke, were learned in the wisdom of the heathen, and fought and labored, unspotted in the world. And why not I? Cyril, the patriarch himself, was he not called from the caves of Nitria to sit on the throne of Alexandria? Slowly the old man lifted his band, and putting back the thick locks of the kneeling youth, gazed with soft pitying eyes long and earnestly into his face. And thou wouldst see the world, poor fool, and thou wouldst see the world? I would convert the world. Thou must know it first. And shall I tell thee what the world is like, which seems to thee so easy to convert? Here I sit, a poor unknown old monk, until I die, fasting and praying, if perhaps God will have mercy on my soul. But little thou knowest how I have seen it. Little thou knowest, or thou wouldst be well content to rest here till the end. I was Arsenius. Ah! <laughs> vain old man that i am thou hast never heard that name at which once queens would whisper and grow pale vanitas vanitatum omnia vanitas and yet he at whose frown half the world trembles has trembled himself at mine i was the tutor of arcadius the emperor of byzantium even so my son even so there I saw the world which thou wouldst see, and what saw I? Even what thou wilt see. Eunuchs the tyrants of their own sovereigns, bishops kissing the feet of parricides and harlots, saints tearing saints in pieces for a word, while sinners cheer them on to the unnatural fight, liars thanked for lying, hypocrites taking pride in their hypocrisy, the many sold and butchered for the malice, the caprice, the vanity of the few. The plunderers of the poor plundered in their turn by worse devourers than themselves. Every attempt at reform the parent of worse scandals, every mercy begetting fresh cruelties, every persecutor silenced, only to enable others to persecute him in their turn. Every devil who is exorcised returning with seven others worse than himself. Falsehood and selfishness, spite and lust, confusion seven times confounded. Satan casting out Satan everywhere, from the emperor who wantons on his throne to the slave who blasphemes beneath his fetters. If Satan cast out Satan, his kingdom shall not stand. In the world to come, but in this world it shall stand and conquer even worse and worse until the end. These are the last days spoken of by the prophets, the beginning of woes such as never have been seen on earth before. On earth distress of nations with perplexity, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for the dread of those things which are coming on the earth. 
I have seen it long. Year after year I have watched them coming nearer and ever nearer in their course like the whirling sandstorms of the desert, which sweep past a caravan and past again, and yet overwhelm it after all, that black flood of the northern barbarians. I foretold it, I prayed against it, but, like Cassandra's of old, my prophecy and my prayers were alike unheard. My pupils spurned my warnings. The lusts of youth, the intrigues of courtiers, were stronger than the warning voice of God. Then I ceased to hope. I ceased to pray for the glorious city, for I knew that her sentence was gone forth. I saw her in the spirit, even as St. John saw her in the revelations, her and her sins and her ruin. And I fled, secretly at night, and buried myself here in the desert, to await the end of the world. Night and day I pray the Lord to accomplish his elect, and to hasten his kingdom. Morning by morning I look up, trembling, and yet in hope, for the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, when the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the skies pass away like a scroll, and the fountains of the nether fire burst up around our feet, and the end of all shall come. And thou wouldst go into the world from which I fled? If the harvest be at hand, the Lord needs laborers. If the times be awful, I should be doing awful things in them. Send me, and let that day find me, where I long to be, in the forefront of the battle of the Lord. The Lord's voice be obeyed. Thou shalt go. Here are letters to Cyril the patriarch. He will love thee for my sake, and for thine own sake, too, I trust. Thou goest for our free will as well as thine own. The abbot and I have watched thee long, knowing that the Lord had need of such as thee elsewhere. We did but prove thee, to see by thy readiness to obey whether thou wert fit to rule. Go, and God be with thee. Covet no man's gold or silver neither eat flesh nor drink wine, but live as thou hast lived, a Nazarite of the Lord. Fear not the face of man, but look not on the face of woman. In an evil hour came they into the world, the mothers of all mischiefs which I have seen under the sun. Come, the abbot waits for us at the gate. With tears of surprise, joy, sorrow, almost of dread, Philemon hung back. Nay, come, why shouldst thou break thy brethren's hearts and ours by many leave-takings? Bring from the storehouse a week's provision of dried dates and millet. The papyrus boat lies at the ferry. Thou shalt descend in it. The Lord will replace it for us when we need it. Speak with no man on the river except the monks of God. When thou hast gone five days' journey downward, ask for the mouth of the canal of Alexandria. Once in the city, any monk will guide thee to the archbishop. Send us news of thy welfare by some holy mouth. Come. Silently they paced together down the glen to the lonely beach of the great stream. Pombo was there already, his white hair glittering in the rising moon, as with slow and feeble arms he launched the light canoe. Philemon flung himself at the old men's feet and besought with many tears their forgiveness and their blessing. We have nothing to forgive. Follow thou thine inward call. If it be of the flesh, it will avenge itself. If it be of the spirit, who are we that we should fight against God? Farewell. A few minutes more, and the youth and his canoe were lessening down the rapid stream in the golden summer twilight. Again a minute, and the swift southern night had fallen, and all was dark but the cold glare of the moon on the river, and on the rock-faces, and on the two old men, as they knelt upon the beach, and with their heads upon each other's shoulders, like two children, sobbed and prayed together for the lost darling of their age. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two, Part One of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek McLaughlin. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 2. The Dying World. Part 1. In the upper story of a house in the Museum Street of Alexandria, built and fitted up on the old Athenian model, was a small room. It had been chosen by its occupant not merely on account of its quiet, for though it was tolerably out of hearing of the female slaves who worked and chattered and quarrelled under the cloisters of the women's court on the south side, yet it was exposed to the rattle of carriages and the voices of passengers in the fashionable street below, and to strange bursts of roaring, squealing, trumpeting from the menagerie, a short way off, on the opposite side of the street. The attraction of the situation lay, perhaps, in the view which it commanded over the wall of the museum gardens, of flower-beds, shrubberies, fountains, statues, walks, and alcoves, which had echoed for nearly seven hundred years to the wisdom of the Alexandrian sages and poets. School after school they had all walked, and taught, and sung there, beneath the spreading plains and chestnuts, figs and palm-trees. The place seemed fragrant with all the riches of Greek thought and song, since the days when Ptolemy Philadelphus walked there with Euclid and Theocritus, Callimachus and Lycophron. On the left of the garden stretched the lofty eastern front of the museum itself, with its picture galleries, halls of statuary, dining halls, and lecture rooms, one huge wing containing that famous library, founded by the father of Philadelphus, which held in the time of Seneca, even after the destruction of a great part of it in Caesar's siege, four hundred thousand manuscripts. There it towered up, the wonder of the world, its white roof bright against the rainless blue, and beyond it, among the ridges and pediments of noble buildings, a broad glimpse of the bright blue sea. The room was fitted up in the purest Greek style, not without an affectation of archaism, in the severe forms and subdued half-tints of the frescoes which ornamented the walls with scenes from the old myths of the theme. Yet the general effect, even under the blazing sun which poured in through the mosquito-nets of the courtyard windows, was one of exquisite coolness and cleanliness and repose. The room had neither carpet nor fireplace, and the only movables in it were a sofa-bed, a table, and an armchair all of such delicate and graceful forms as may be seen on ancient vases of a far earlier period than that whereof we write. But, most probably, had any of us entered that room that morning, we should not have been able to spare a look either for the furniture, or the general effect, or the museum gardens, or the sparkling Mediterranean beyond. But we should have agreed that the room was quite rich enough for human eyes, for the sake of one treasure which it possessed and, beside which, nothing was worth a moment's glance. For in the light armchair, reading a manuscript which lay on the table, sat a woman, of some five and twenty years, evidently the tutelary goddess of that little shrine, dressed in perfect keeping with the archaism of the chamber, in simple, old, snow-white ionic robe, falling to the feet and reaching to the throat, and of that peculiarly severe and graceful fashion in which the upper part of the dress falls downward again from the neck to the waist in a sort of cape, entirely hiding the outline of the bust, while it leaves the arms and the point of the shoulders bare. Her dress was entirely without ornament, except the two narrow purple stripes down the front, which marked her rank as a Roman citizen, the gold-embroidered shoes upon her feet, and the gold net, which looped back from her forehead to her neck, hair the color and gloss of which were hardly distinguishable from that of the metal itself, such as Athene herself might have envied for tint and mass and ripple. Her features, arms, and hands were of the severest and grandest type of old Greek beauty, at once showing everywhere the high development of the bones, and covering them with that firm, round, ripe outline, and waxy morbidezza of skin, which the old Greeks owed to their continual use not only of the bath and muscular exercise, but also of daily unguents. There might have seemed to us too much sadness in that clear grey eye, too much self-conscious restraint in those sharp curved lips, 
too much affectation in the studied severity of her posture as she read, copied, as it seemed, from some old vase or bas-relief. But the glorious grace and beauty of every line of face and figure would have excused, even hidden those defects, and we should have only recognized the marked resemblance to the ideal portraits of Athene which adorned every panel of the walls. She has lifted her eyes off her manuscript. She is looking out with kindling countenance over the gardens of the museum, her ripe, curling Greek lips, such as we never see now, even among her own wives and sisters, open. She is talking to herself. Listen. Yes, the statues there are broken. The libraries are plundered. The alcoves are silent. The oracles are dumb. And yet, who says that the old faith of heroes and sages is dead? The beautiful can never die. If the gods have deserted their oracles, they have not deserted the souls who aspire to them. If they have ceased to guide nations, they have not ceased to speak to their own elect. If they have cast off the vulgar herd, they have not cast off Hypatia. I, to believe in the old creeds while every one else is dropping away from them, to believe in spite of disappointments, to hope against hope, to show oneself superior to the herd by seeing boundless depths of living glory in myths which have become dark and dead to them, to struggle to the last against the new and vulgar superstitions of a rotting age for the faith of my forefathers, for the old gods, the old heroes, the old sages who gauged the mysteries of heaven and earth, and perhaps to conquer, at least to have my reward, to be welcomed into the celestial ranks of the heroic, to rise to the immortal gods, to the ineffable powers, onward, upward ever, through ages and through eternities, till I find my home at last, and vanish in the glory of the nameless and the absolute one. And her whole face flashed out into wild glory, and then sank again suddenly into a shudder of something like fear and disgust, as she saw, watching her from under the wall of the gardens opposite, a crooked, withered Jewish crone, dressed out in the most gorgeous and fantastic style of barbaric finery. Why does that old hag haunt me? I see her everywhere, till the last month at least, and here she is again. I will ask the prefect to find out who she is and get rid of her before she fascinates me with that evil eye. Thank the gods, there she moves away. Foolish, foolish of me, a philosopher. I, to believe against the authority of Porphyry himself, too, in evil lies and magic. But there is my father, pacing up and down, in the library. As she spoke, the old man entered from the next room. He was a Greek also, but of a more common and perhaps lower type, dark and fiery, thin and graceful. His delicate figure and cheeks, wasted by meditation, harmonized well with the staid and simple philosophic cloak which he wore as a sign of his profession. He paced impatiently up and down the chamber, while his keen glittering eyes and restless gestures betokened intense inward thought. I have it! No! Again it escapes me! It contradicts itself! Miserable man that I am! If there is faith in Pythagoras, the symbol should be an expanding series of the powers of three— and yet that accursed binary factor will introduce itself. Did not you work the sum out once, Hypatia? Sit down, my dear father, and eat. You have tasted no food yet this day. What do I care for food? The inexpressible must be expressed. The work must be done if it cost me the squaring of the circle. How can he whose sphere lies above the stars stoop every moment to earth? Aye, she answered, half bitterly and would that we could live without food, and imitate perfectly the immortal gods. But while we are in this prison-house of matter, we must wear our chain, even wear it gracefully, if we have the good taste, and make the base necessities of this body of shame symbolic of the divine food of the reason. There is fruit, with lentils and rice, waiting for you in the next room, and bread, unless you despise it too much. The food of slaves, he answered. Well, I will eat, and be ashamed of eating. Stay, did I tell you? Six new pupils in the mathematical school this morning. It grows. It spreads. We shall conquer yet. She sighed. 
How do you know that they have not come to you, as Critias and Alcibiades did to Socrates, to learn a merely political and mundane virtue? Strange that men should be content to grovel and be men, when they might rise to the rank of gods. Ah, my father, that is my bitterest grief, to see those who have been pretending in the morning lecture-room to worship every word of mine as an oracle, lounging in the afternoon round Pelagia's litter, and then at night, for I know that they do it, the dice and the wine and worse, that Pallas herself should be conquered every day by Venus Pandemos, that Pelagia should have more power than I. Not that such a creature as that disturbs me. No created thing, I hope, can move my equanimity. But if I could stoop to hate, I should hate her. Hate her. And her voice took a tone which made it somewhat uncertain whether, in spite of all the lofty impassibility which she felt bound to possess, she did not hate Pelagia with a most human and mundane hatred. But at that moment the conversation was cut short by the hasty entrance of a slave-girl, who, with fluttering voice, announced, "'His Excellency! Madam! The Prefect! His chariot has been at the gate for these five minutes, and he is now coming upstairs!' "'Foolish child,' answered Hypatia, with some affectation of indifference. "'And why should that disturb me? Let him enter.' The door opened, and in came, preceded by the scent of half a dozen different perfumes, a florid, delicate-featured man, gorgeously dressed out in senatorial costume, his fingers and neck covered with jewels. "'The representative of the Caesars honours himself by offering at the shrine of Athene Polias, and rejoices to see in her priestess as lovely a likeness as ever of the goddess whom she serves.' Don't betray me, but I really cannot help talking sheer paganism whenever I find myself within the influence of your eyes. Truth is mighty, said Hypatia, as she rose to greet him with a smile and a reverence. Ah, so they say. Your excellent father has vanished. He is really too modest, honest, though, about his incapacity for state secrets. After all, you know, it was your Minervaship which I came to consult. How has this turbulent Alexandrian rascaldom been behaving itself in my absence? The herd has been eating, and drinking, and marrying as usual, I believe, answered Hypatia in a languid tone. And multiplying, I don't doubt. Well, there will be less lot to the empire if I have to crucify a dozen or two, as I positively will the next riot. It is really a great comfort to a statesman that the masses are so well aware that they deserve hanging and therefore so careful to prevent any danger of public justice depopulating the province. But how go on the schools? Hypatia shook her head sadly. Ah, boys will be boys, I plead guilty myself. Video meliora proboque, deteriora sequor. You must not be hard on us. Whether we obey you or not in private life, we do in public, and if we enthrone you Queen of Alexandria, you must allow your courtiers and bodyguards a few court licenses. Now don't sigh, or I shall be inconsolable. At all events, your worst rival has betaken herself to the wilderness, and gone to look for the city of the gods above the cataracts. Whom do you mean? asked Hypatia, in a tone most unphilosophically eager. Pelagia, of course. I met that prettiest and naughtiest of humanities halfway between here and Thebes, transformed into a perfect andromache of chaste affection. And to whom, pray? To a certain Gothic giant. What men those barbarians do breed! I was afraid of being crushed under the elephant's foot at every step I took with him. What? asked Hypatia. Did your excellency condescend to converse with such savages? To tell you the truth, he had some forty stout countrymen of his with him, who might have been troublesome to a perplexed prefect, not to mention that it is always as well to keep on good terms with these Goths. Really, after the sack of Rome and Athens cleaned out like a beehive by wasps, things begin to look serious. And as for the great brute himself, he has rank enough in his way, boasts of his descent from some cannibal god or other really hardly deigned to speak to a paltry Roman governor till his faithful and adoring bride interceded for me. Still the fellow understood good living, and we celebrated our new treaty of friendship with noble libations. But I must not talk about that to you. However, I got rid of them, 
quoted all the geographical lies I had ever heard, and a great many more, quickened their appetite for their fool's errand notably, and started them off again. So now the star of Venus is set, and that of Pallas in the ascendant. Wherefore tell me, what am I to do with St. Firebrand? Cyril? Cyril. Justice. Ah, fairest wisdom, don't mention that horrid word out of the lecture-room. In theory it is all very well, but in poor imperfect earthly practice a governor must be content with doing very much what comes to hand. In abstract justice, now, I ought to nail up Cyril, deacons, district visitors, and all, in a row, on the sand-fill outside. That is simple enough, but, like a great many simple and excellent things, impossible. You fear the people? Well, my dear lady, and has not the villainous demagogue got the whole mob on his side? Am I to have the Constantinople riots reenacted here? I really cannot face it. I have not the nerve for it. Perhaps I am too lazy. Be it so. Hypatia sighed. Ah, that your excellency but saw the great duel which depends on you alone. Do not fancy that the battle is merely between paganism and Christianity. Why, if it were, you know, I, as a Christian, under a Christian and sainted emperor, not to mention his august sister, we understand, interrupted she, with an impatient wave of her beautiful hand. Not even between them, not even between philosophy and barbarism. The struggle is simply one between the aristocracy and the mob, between wealth, refinement, art, learning, all that makes a nation great, and the savage herd of child-breeders below, the many ignoble, who were meant to labor for the noble few. Shall the Roman Empire command or obey her own slaves, is the question which you and Cyril have to battle out and the fight must be internecine. "'I should not wonder if it became so, really,' answered the prefect, with a shrug of his shoulders. "'I expect every time I ride to have my brains knocked out by some mad monk.' "'Why not? In an age when, as has been well and often said, emperors and consulars crawl to the tombs of a tent-maker and a fisherman, and kiss the mouldy bones of the vilest slaves.' Why not among a people whose god is the crucified son of a carpenter? Why should learning, authority, antiquity, birth, rank, the system of empire which has been growing up, fed by the accumulated wisdom of ages, why, I say, should any of these things protect your life a moment from the fury of any beggar who believes that the son of God died for him as much as for you, and that he is your equal, if not your superior, in the sight of his low-born and illiterate deity? Footnote. These are the arguments and the language which were commonly employed by Porphyry, Julian, and the other opponents of Christianity. My most eloquent philosopher, this may be, and perhaps is, all very true. I quite agree that there are very great practical inconveniences of this kind in the new, I mean, the Catholic faith. But the world is full of inconveniences. The wise man does not quarrel with his creed for being disagreeable any more than he does with his finger for aching. He cannot help it, and must make the best of a bad matter. Only tell me how to keep the peace. And let philosophy be destroyed? That it never will be, as long as Hypatia lives to illuminate the earth. And, as far as I am concerned, I promise you a clear stage, and a great deal of favor, as is proved by my visiting you publicly at this moment before I have given audience to one of the four hundred boars, great and small, who are waiting in the tribunal to torment me. Do help me and advise me. What am I to do? I have told you. Ah, yes, as to general principles. But out of the lecture-room I prefer a practical expedient. For instance, Cyril writes to me here, plague on him, he would not let me even have a week's hunting in peace, that there is a plot on the part of the Jews to murder all the Christians. Here is the precious document. Do look at it, in pity. For aught I know or care, the plot may be an exactly opposite one, and the Christians intend to murder all the Jews. But I must take some notice of the letter. I do not see that, Your Excellency. Why, if anything did happen, after all, conceive the missives which would be sent flying off to Constantinople against me. Let them go. If you are secure in the consciousness of innocence, what matter? Consciousness of innocence? I shall lose my prefecture. Your danger would be just as great if you took notice of it. 
whatever happened, you would be accused of favoring the Jews. And really, there might be some truth in the accusation. How the finances of the provinces would go on without their kind assistance, I dare not think. If those Christians would but lend me their money, instead of building almshouses and hospitals with it, they might burn the Jews' quarter tomorrow, for aught I care. But now, but now, you must absolutely take no notice of this letter. The very tone of it forbids you, for your own honor, and the honor of the empire. Are you to treat with a man who talks of the masses at Alexandria as the flock whom the king of kings has committed to his rule and care? Does your excellency, or this proud bishop, govern Alexandria? Really, my dear lady, I have given up inquiring. But he has not. He comes to you as a person possessing an absolute authority over two-thirds of the population, which he does not scruple to hint to you is derived from a higher source than your own. The consequence is clear. If it be from a higher source than yours, of course it ought to control yours. And if you will confess that it ought to control it, you will acknowledge the root and ground of every extravagant claim which he makes, if you deign to reply. But I must say something, or I shall be pelted in the streets. You philosophers, however raised above your own bodies you may be, must really not forget that we poor worldlings have bones to be broken. Then tell him, and by word of mouth merely, that as the information which he sends you comes from his private knowledge and concerns not him as bishop, but you as magistrate, you can only take it into consideration when he addresses you as a private person, laying a regular information at your tribunal. Charming! Queen of diplomatists as well as philosophers, I go to obey you. Ah, why were you not Pulcheria? No, for then Alexandria had been dark, and Orestes missed the supreme happiness of kissing a hand which Pallas, when she made you, must have borrowed from the workshop of Aphrodite. Recollect that you are a Christian, answered Hypatia, half smiling. So the prefect departed, and, passing through the outer hall, which was already crowded with Hypatia's aristocratic pupils and visitors, bowed his way out past them and regained his chariot, chuckling over the rebuff which he intended to administer to Cyril, and comforting himself with the only text of Scripture of the inspiration of which he was thoroughly convinced. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. End of chapter 2, part 1Chapter 2, Part 2 of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek McLaughlin. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 2 The Dying World. Part 2. At the door was a crowd of chariots slaves with their masters' parasols, and the rabble of onlooking boys and market folk, as usual in Alexandria then, as in all great cities since, who were staring at the prefect, and having their heads wrapped by his guards, and wondering what sort of glorious personage Hypatia might be, and what sort of glorious house she must live in, to be fit company for the great governor of Alexandria. Not that there was not many a sulky and lowering face among the mob, for the great majority of them were Christians, and very seditious and turbulent politicians, as Alexandrians, men of Macedonia, were bound to be. And there was many a grumble among them, all but audible, at the prefect's going in state to the heathen woman's house, heathen sorceress, some pious old woman called her, before he heard any poor soul's petition in the tribunal or even said his prayers in church. Just as he was stepping into his curricle, a tall young man, as gorgeously bedizened as himself, lounged down the steps after him, and beckoned lazily to the black boy who carried his parasol. Ah, Raphael Aben Ezra, my excellent friend, what propitious deity, ahem, martyr, brings you to Alexandria just as I want you? Get up by my side and let us have a chat on our way to the tribunal. The man addressed came slowly forward with an ostentatiously low salutation, which could not hide, and indeed was not intended to hide, the contemptuous and lazy expression of his face, and asked in a drawling tone, 
and for what kind of purpose does the representative of the caesars bestow such an honor on the humblest of his etc etc your penetration will supply the rest don't be frightened i'm not going to borrow money of you answered orestes laughingly as the jew got into the curricle i am glad to hear it really one usurer in a family is enough my father made the gold and if i spend it i consider that i do all that is required of a philosopher a charming team of white niceans is not this and only one gray foot among all the four yes horses are a bore i begin to find like everything else always falling sick or running away or breaking one's peace of mind in some way or other Besides, I have been pestered out of my life there in Cyrene by commissions for dogs and horses and bows from that old Episcopal Nimrod, Synesius. What, is the worthy man as lively as ever? Lively? He nearly drove me into a nervous fever in three days, up at four in the morning, always in the most disgustingly good health and spirits, farming, coursing, shooting, riding over hedge and ditch after rascally black robbers, preaching, intriguing, borrowing money, baptizing and excommunicating, bullying that bully, Andronicus, comforting old women and giving pretty girls dowries, scribbling one half-hour on philosophy and the next on farriery, sitting up all night writing hymns and drinking strong liquors, off again on horseback at four the next morning, and talking by the hour all the while about philosophic abstraction from the mundane tempest. Heaven defend me from all two-legged whirlwinds. By the by, there was a fair daughter of my nation came back to Alexandria on the same ship with me, with a cargo that may suit your highness. There are a great many daughters of your nation who might suit me without any cargo at all. Ah, but they have had good practice, the little fools, ever since the days of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. But I mean old Miriam, you know. She has been lending Synesius money to fight the black fellows with, and really it was high time. They had burnt every homestead for miles through the province. But the daring old girl must do a little business for herself, so she went off in the teeth of the barbarians, right away to the Atlas, bought all their lady prisoners, and some of their own sons and daughters, too, of them, for beads and old iron, and has come back with as pretty a cargo of Libyan beauties as a prefect of good taste could wish to have the first choice of. You may thank me for that privilege. After, of course, you had suited yourself, my cunning Raphael? Not I. Women are bores, as Solomon found out long ago. Did I never tell you? I began, as he did, with the most select harem in Alexandria. But they quarreled so that one day I went out and sold them all but one, who was a Jewess. So there were objections on the part of the rabbis. Then I tried one, as Solomon did, but my garden shut up, and my sealed fountain wanted me to be always in love with her. So I went to the lawyers, allowed her a comfortable maintenance, and now I am as free as a monk and shall be happy to give your excellency the benefit of any good taste or experience which i may possess thanks worthy jew we are not yet as exalted as yourself and will send for the old erichtho this very afternoon now listen a moment to base earthly and political business cyril has written to me to say that you jews have plotted to murder all the christians well why not I most heartily wish it were true, and think, on the whole, that it very probably is so. By the immortal saints, man, you are not serious. The four archangels forbid. It is no concern of mine. All I say is that my people are great fools, like the rest of the world, and have, for aught I know or care, some such intention. They won't succeed, of course, and that is all you have to care for. But if you think it worth the trouble— which I do not, I shall have to go to the synagogue on business in a week or so, and then I would ask some of the rabbis. Laziest of men! And I must answer Cyril this very day. An additional reason for asking no questions of our people. Now you can honestly say that you know nothing about the matter. Well, after all, ignorance is a stronghold for poor statesmen, so you need not hurry yourself. 
I assure your excellency, I will not. Ten days hence or so, you know. Exactly, after it is all over. And can't be helped. What a comfort it is now and then that can't be helped. It is the root and marrow of all philosophy. Your practical man, poor wretch, will try to help this and that, and torment his soul with ways and means, and preventives and forestallings, your philosopher quietly says, it can't be helped. If it ought to be, it will be. If it is, it ought to be. We did not make the world, and we are not responsible for it. There is the sum and substance of all true wisdom, and the epitome of all that has been said and written thereon from Philo the Jew to Hypatia the Gentile. By the way, here's Cyril coming down the steps of the Caesarium. A very handsome fellow, after all, though he is looking as sulky as a bear. With his cubs at his heels, what a scoundrelly visage that tall fellow deacon, or reader, or whatever he is by his dress, has. There they are, whispering together. Heaven give them pleasant thoughts and pleasanter faces. Amen, quoth Orestes, with a sneer, and he would have said amen in good earnest, had he been able to take the liberty, which we shall, and listen to Cyril's answer to Peter, the tall reader. From Hypatia, as you say? Why, he only returned to the city this morning. I saw his foreign hand standing at her door, as I came down the museum street hither, half an hour ago. And twenty carriages besides, I don't doubt. The street was blocked up with them. There, look round the corner now. Chariots, litters, slaves, and fops. When shall we see such a concourse as that where it ought to be? Cyril made no answer, and Peter went on. Where it ought to be, my father, in front of your door at the Serapium. The world, the flesh, and the devil know their own, Peter, and as long as they have their own to go to, we cannot expect them to come to us. But what if their own were taken out of the way? They might come to us for want of better amusement, devil and all. Well, if I could get a fair hold of the two first, I would take the third into the bargain and see what could be done with him. But never, while these lecture-rooms last, these Egyptian chambers of imagery, these theatres of Satan, where the devil transforms himself into an angel of light, and apes Christian virtue, and bedizens his ministers like ministers of righteousness, as long as that lecture-room stands, and the great and the powerful flock to it, to learn excuses for their own tyrannies and atheisms, so long will the kingdom of God be trampled under foot in Alexandria. So long will the princes of this world, with their gladiators and parasites and money-lenders, be masters here, and not the bishops and priests of the living God. It was now Peter's turn to be silent, and as the two, with their little knot of district visitors behind them, walk moodily along the great esplanade which overlooked the harbour, and then vanish suddenly up some dingy alley into the crowded misery of the sailors' quarter, we will leave them to go about their errand of mercy, and, like fashionable people, keep to the grand parade, and listen again to our two fashionable friends in the carved and gilded curricle with four white blood-horses. A fine sparkling breeze outside the ferros, Raphael. Fair for the wheat-ships, too. Are they gone yet? Yes, why? I sent the first fleet off three days ago, and the rest are clearing outwards to-day. Oh, ah, so then you have not heard from Heracleon. Heracleon? What the blessed saints has the Count of Africa to do with my wheat-ships? Oh, nothing, it's no business of mine. Only he is going to rebel. But here we are at your door. To what? asked Orestes in a horrified tone to rebel and attack Rome. Good gods! A god, I mean. A fresh boar. Come in and tell a poor miserable slave of a governor. Speak low, for heaven's sake. I hope these rascally grooms haven't overheard you. Easy to throw them into the canal if they have, quoth Raphael, as he walked coolly through hall and corridor after the perturbed governor. Poor Orestes never stopped till he reached a little chamber of the inner court beckoned the Jew in after him, locked the door, threw himself into an armchair, put his hands on his knees, and sat, bending forward, 
staring into Raphael's face with a ludicrous terror and perplexity. "'Tell me all about it. Tell me this instant.' "'I have told you all I know,' quoth Raphael, quietly seating himself on a sofa and playing with a jeweled dagger. "'I thought, of course, that you were in the secret, or I should have said nothing. It's no business of mine, you know.' Orestes, like most weak and luxurious men, Romans especially, had a wild beast vein in him, and it burst forth. Hell and the Furies! You insolent provincial slave! You will carry these liberties of yours too far. Do you know who I am, you accursed Jew? Tell me the whole truth, or, by the head of the emperor, I'll twist it out of you with red-hot pinchers. Raphael's countenance assumed a dogged expression which showed that the old Jewish blood still beat true, under all its affected shell of Neoplatonist nonchalance, and there was a quiet, unpleasant earnest in his smile as he answered, Then, my dear governor, you will be the first man on earth who ever yet forced a Jew to say or do what he did not choose. We'll see, yelled Orestes. Here, slaves! And he clapped his hands loudly. "'Calm yourself, Your Excellency,' quoth Raphael, rising. "'The door is locked, the mosquito-net is across the window, and this dagger is poisoned. "'If anything happens to me, you will offend all the Jew money-lenders, "'and die in about three days in a great deal of pain, "'having missed our assignation with old Miriam, "'lost your pleasantest companion, "'and left your own finances and those of the prefecture "'in a considerable state of embarrassment.' How much better to sit down, hear all I have to say philosophically, like a true pupil of Hypatia, and not expect a man to tell you what he really does not know. Orestes, after looking vainly around the room for a place to escape, had quietly subsided into his chair again, and by the time that the slaves knocked at the door he had so far recovered his philosophy as to ask, not for the torturers, but for a page and wine. "'Oh, you Jews!' quoth he, trying to laugh off matters. "'The same incarnate fiends that Titus found you.' "'The very same, my dear prefect. "'Now, for this matter, which is really important, at least to Gentiles, "'Heraclean will certainly rebel. "'Synesius let out as much to me. "'He has fitted out an armament for Ostia, stopped his own wheat-ships, and is going to write to you to stop yours, and to starve out the eternal city, Goths, Senate, Emperor, and all. Whether you will comply with his reasonable little request depends, of course, on yourself. And that again very much on his plans. Of course, you cannot be expected to, uh, we will euphemize, unless it be made worth your while. Orestes sat buried in deep thought. "'Of course not,' said he at last, half unconsciously. And then, in sudden dread of having committed himself, he looked up fiercely at the Jew. "'And how do I know this is not some infernal trap of yours? Tell me how you found out all this, or by Hercules—' He had quite forgotten his Christianity by this time. "'By Hercules and the twelve gods, I'll—' "'Don't use expressions unworthy of a philosopher. My source of information was very simple and very good.' He has been negotiating a loan from the rabbis at Carthage. They were either frightened, or loyal, or both, and hung back. He knew, as all wise governors know when they allow themselves time, that it is no use to bully a Jew, and applied to me. I never lend money. It is unphilosophical. But I introduced him to old Miriam, who dare do business with the devil himself, and by that move, whether he has the money or not, I cannot tell. But this I can tell, that we have his secret, and so have you now. And if you want more information, the old woman, who enjoys an intrigue as much as she does Falernian, will get it you. Well, you are a true friend after all. Of course I am. Now, is not this method of getting at the truth much easier and pleasanter than setting a couple of dirty negroes to pinch and pull me, and so making it a point of honour with me to tell you nothing but lies? Here comes Ganymede with the wine, just in time to calm your nerves, and fill you with the spirit of divination. To the goddess of good counsels, my lord. 
What wine this is! True Syrian, fire and honey, fourteen years old, next vintage, my Raphael. Out, hypochorisma! See that he is not listening. The impudent rascal! I was humbugged into giving two thousand gold pieces for him two years ago. He was so pretty. They said he was only just rising thirteen, and he has been the plague of my life ever since, and is beginning to want the barber already. Now, what is the Count dreaming of? His wages for killing Stilicho. What, is it not enough to be Count of Africa? I suppose he sets off against that, his services, during the last three years. Well, he saved Africa. And thereby Egypt also. And you, too, as well as the Emperor, may be considered as owing him somewhat. My good friend, my debts are far too numerous for me to think of paying any of them. But what wages does he want? The purple. Orestes started, and then fell into thought. Raphael sat watching him a while. Now, most noble lord, may I depart? I have said all I have to say, and unless I get home to luncheon at once— I shall hardly have time to find old Miriam for you, and to get through our little affair with her before sunset. Stay. What force has he? Forty thousand already, they say. And those Donatist ruffians are with him to a man, if he can but scrape together wherewith to change their bludgeons into good steel. Well, go. So, a hundred thousand might do it said he, meditating, as Raphael bowed himself out. He won't get them. I don't know, though. The man has the head of a Julius. Well, that fool Attalus talked of joining Egypt to the Western Empire. Not such a bad thought, either. Anything is better than being governed by an idiot child and three canting nuns. I expect to be excommunicated every day for some offence against Pulcheria's prudery. Heraclean Emperor at Rome— and I, lord and master, on this side the sea. The Donatists pitted again fairly against the Orthodox to cut each other's throats in peace. No more of Cyril's spying and tail-bearing to Constantinople. Not such a baddish affair. But then, uh, it would take so much trouble. With such words, Orestes went into his third warm bath for that day. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Serenity Lee. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 3 The Goths. For two days the young monk held on, paddling and floating rapidly down the Nile stream leaving city after city to right and left with longing eyes, and looking back to one villa after another, till the reaches of the banks hid them from his sight, with many a yearning to know what sort of places those gay buildings and gardens would look like on a nearer view, and what sort of life the thousands led who crowded the busy quays, and walked and drove in an endless stream along the great high roads which ran along either bank. He carefully avoided every boat that passed him, from the gilded barge of the wealthy landlord or merchant, to the tiny raft buoyed up with empty jars, which was floating down to be sold at some market in the delta. Here and there he met and hailed a crew of monks, drawing their nets in a quiet bay, or passing along the great watery highway from monastery to monastery, but all the news he received from them was that the canal of Alexandria was still several days' journey below him. It seemed endless, that monotonous vista of the two high clay banks, with their sluices and water-wheels, their knots of palms and date-trees, Endless seemed that wearisome succession of bars of sand and banks of mud, every one like the one before it, every one dotted with the same line of logs and stones strewn along the water's edge, which turned out, as he approached them, to be basking crocodiles and sleeping pelicans. His eye, wearied with the continual confinement and want of distance, longed for the boundless expanse of the desert for the jagged outlines of those far-off hills which he had watched from boyhood rising mysteriously at morn out of the eastern sky and melting mysteriously into it again at even beyond which dwelt a whole world of wonders elephants and dragons satyrs and anthropophagi ay and the phoenix itself tired and melancholy his mind returned inward to prey on itself 
and the last words of Arsenius rose again and again to his thoughts. Was his call of the spirit or of the flesh? How should he test that problem? He wished to see the world that might be carnal, true, but he wished to convert the world. Was not that spiritual? Was he not going on a noble errand, thirsting for toil, for saintship, for martyrdom itself, if it would but come and cut the Gordian knot of all temptations, and save him, for he dimly felt that it would save him, a whole sea of trouble in getting safe and triumphant out of that world into which he had not yet entered? And his heart shrank back from the untried homeless wilderness before him. But no, the die was cast, and he must down and onward, whether in obedience to the spirit or the flesh. Oh, for one hour of the quiet of that dear Laura and the old familiar faces. At last, a sudden turn of the bank brought him in sight of a gaudily painted barge, oil board of which armed men in uncouth and foreign dresses were chasing with barbaric shouts some large object in the water. In the bows stood a man of gigantic stature, brandishing a harpoon in his right hand, and in his left holding the line of a second, the head of which was fixed in the huge purple sides of a hippopotamus, who foamed and wallowed a few yards down the stream. An old grizzled warrior at the stern, with a rudder in either hand, kept the boat's head continually towards the monster, in spite of its sudden and frantic wheelings, and when it dashed madly across the stream, some twenty oars flashed through the water in pursuit. All was activity and excitement, and it was no wonder if Philemon's curiosity had tempted him to drift down almost abreast of the barge ere he descried, peeping from under a decorated awning in the afterpart, some dozen pairs of languishing black eyes turned alternately to the game and to himself. The serpents, chattering and smiling, with pretty little shrieks and shaking of glossy curls and gold necklaces, and fluttering of muslin dresses within a dozen yards of him, blushing scarlet. He knew not why. He seized his paddle and tried to back out of the snare. But somehow his very efforts to escape those sparkling eyes diverted his attention from everything else. The hippopotamus had caught sight of him, and, furious with pain, rushed straight at the unoffending canoe. The harpoon line became entangled round his body. In a moment he and his frail bark were overturned, and the monster, with his huge white tusks gaping wide, closed on him as he struggled in the stream. Luckily, Philemon, contrary to the want of monks, was a bather, and swam like a waterfowl. Fear he had never known. Death from childhood had been to him, as to the other inmates of the Laura, a contemplation too perpetual to have any paralyzing terror in it, even then, when life seemed just about to open on him anew. But the monk was a man, and a young one, and had no intention of dying tamely or unavenged. In an instant he had freed himself from the line, drawn the short knife, which was his only weapon, and diving suddenly, avoided the monster's rush, and attacked him from behind with stabs, which, though not deep, still dyed the waters with gore at every stroke. The barbarians shouted with delight. The hippopotamus turned furiously against his new assailant, crushing, alas, the empty canoe to fragments with a single snap of his enormous jaws. But the turn was fatal to him. The barge was close upon him, and as he presented his broadside to the blow, the sinewy arm of the giant drove a harpoon through his heart, and with one convulsive shudder the huge blue mass turned over on its side and floated dead. Poor Philemon! He alone was silent, amid the yells of triumph. Sorrowfully he swam around and round his little paper wreck. It would not have floated a mouse. Wistfully he eyed the distant banks, half-minded to strike out for them and escape, and thought of the crocodiles and paddled round again, and thought of the basilisk eyes. He might escape the crocodiles, but who could escape women? And he struck out valiantly for shore, when he was brought to a sudden stop by finding the stem of the barge close on him, a noose thrown over him by some friendly barbarian, and himself hauled on board, amid the laughter, praise, astonishment, and grumbling of the good-natured crew, who had expected him, as a matter of course, to avail himself at once of their help and could not conceive the cause of his reluctance. Philemon gazed with wonder on his strange hosts, their pale complexions, globular heads and faces, high cheekbones, tall and sturdy figures, their red beards and yellow hair knotted fantastically above the head, their awkward dresses, half Roman or Egyptian, and half of foreign fur, soiled and stained in many a storm and fight, 
but tastelessly bedizened with classic jewels, brooches, and Roman coins strung like necklaces. Only the steersman, who had come forward to wonder at the hippopotamus, and to help in dragging the unwieldy brute on board, seemed to keep genuine and unornamented the costume of his race. The white linen leggings, strapped with thongs of deerskin, the quilted leather cuirass, the bear's fur cloak, the only ornaments of which were the fangs and claws of the beast itself, and a fringe of grizzled tufts which looked but too like human hair. The language which they spoke was utterly unintelligible to Philemon, though it need not be so to us. "'A well-grown lad and a brave one, Wolf the son of Ovida,' said the giant to the old hero of the bearskin cloak, "'and understands wearing skins in this furnace mouth of a climate rather better than you do. "'I keep to the dress of my forefathers, Almeric the Amal. "'What did to sack Rome in may do to find Asgard in.' The giant, who was decked out with helmet, cuirass, and senatorial boots, in a sort of mongrel mixture of the Roman military and civil dress, his neck wreathed in a dozen gold chains, and every finger sparkling with jewels, turned away with an impatient sneer. "'Asgard, Asgard, if you are in such a hurry to get to Asgard up this ditch in the sand, you had better ask the fellow how far it is thither.' Wolf took him quietly at his word, and addressed a question to the young monk, which he could only answer by a shake of the head. Ask him in Greek, man. Greek is a slave's tongue. Make a slave talk to him in it, not me. Here, some of you girls. Pelagia, you understand this fellow's talk. Ask him how far it is to Asgard. You must ask me more civilly, my rough hero, replied a soft voice from underneath the awning. Beauty must be sued and not commanded. Come then, my olive tree, my gazelle, my lotus flower, my... What was the last nonsense you taught me? And ask this wild man of the sands how far it is from these accursed endless rabbit burrows to Asgard. The awning was raised, and lying luxuriously on a soft mattress, fanned with peacock feathers, and glittering with rubies and topazes, appeared such a vision as Philemon had never seen before. A woman of some two and twenty summers, formed in the most voluptuous mould of Grecian beauty, whose complexion showed every violet vein through its veil of luscious brown. Her little bare feet, as they dimpled the cushions, were more perfect than Aphrodite's, softer than a swan's bosom. Every swell of her bust and arms showed through the thin gauze robe, while her lower limbs were wrapped in a shawl of orange silk, embroidered with wreaths of shells and roses. Her dark hair lay carefully spread out upon the pillow, in a thousand ringlets entwined with gold and jewels, her languishing eyes blazed like diamonds from a cavern, under eyelids darkened and deepened with black antimony. Her lips pouted of themselves, by habit or by nature, into a perpetual kiss. Slowly she raised one little lazy hand. Slowly the ripe lips opened, and in most pure and melodious attic she lisped her huge lover's question to the monk, and repeated it before the boy could shake off the spell and answer. "'Asgard?' What is Asgard? The beauty looked at the giant for further instructions. The city of the immortal gods, interposed the old warrior, hastily and sternly to the lady. The city of God is in heaven, said Philemon to the interpreter, turning his head away from those gleaming, luscious, searching glances. His answer was received with a general laugh by all except the leader, who shrugged his shoulders. It may as well be up in the skies as up the Nile. We shall be just as likely, I believe, to reach it by flying as by rowing up this big ditch. Ask him where the river comes from, Pelagia. Pelagia obeyed, and thereon followed a confusion worse confounded, composed of all the impossible wonders of that mythic fairyland with which Philemon had gorged himself from boyhood in his walks with the old monks, and of the equally trustworthy traditions which the Goths had picked up at Alexandria. There was nothing which that river did not do. It rose in the Caucasus. Where was the Caucasus? He did not know. In Paradise? In Indian Ethiopia? In Ethiopian India? Where were they? He did not know. Nobody knew. It ran for a hundred and fifty days' journey through deserts where nothing but flying serpents and satyrs lived, and the very lion's manes were burnt off by the heat. Good sporting there, at all events, among these dragons— quoth Smid, the son of Troll, armorer to the party. 
"'As good as Thor's when he caught Snake Midgard with the bullock's head,' said Wolf. "'It turned to the east for a hundred days' journey more, "'all round Arabia and India, among forests full of elephants and dog-headed women. "'Better and better, Snid,' growled Wolf, approvingly. "'Fresh beef cheap there, Prince Wolf, eh?' quoth Smid. "'I must look over the arrowheads. "'To the mountains of the Hyperboreans, where there was eternal night, and the air was full of feathers. That is, one third of it came from thence, and another third came from the southern ocean, over the moon mountains, where no one had ever been, and the remaining third from the country where the phoenix lived, and nobody knew where that was. And then there were the cataracts, and the inundations, and, and, and above the cataracts, nothing but sand hills and ruins, as full of devils as they could hold. And as for Asgard, no one had ever heard of it, till every face grew longer and longer, as Pelagia went on interpreting and misinterpreting. And at last the giant smote his hand upon his knee, and swore a great oath that Asgard might rot till the twilights of the gods, before he went a step farther up the Nile. "'Curse the monk!' growled Wolf. "'How should such a poor beast know anything about the matter?' "'Why should he not know as well as that ape of a Roman governor?' asked Smid. "'Oh, the monks know everything,' said Pelagia. "'They go hundreds and thousands of miles up the river, and cross the deserts among fiends and monsters, where anyone else would be eaten up or go mad at once.' "'Ah, the dear holy men! It's all by the sign of the blessed cross!' exclaimed all the girls together, devoutly crossing themselves, while two or three of the most enthusiastic were half-minded to go forward and kneel to Philemon for his blessing, but hesitated, their Gothic lovers being heathenishly stupid and prudish on such points. "'Why should he not know as well as the prefect?' "'Well said, Smid. I believe that prefect's quill-driver was humbugging us when he said Asgard was only ten days' sail up.' "'Why?' asked Wolf. I never give any reasons. What's the use of being in a mall, and a son of Odin, if one has always got to be giving reasons like a rascally Roman lawyer? I say the governor looked like a liar, and I say this monk looks like an honest fellow, and I choose to believe him, and there is an end of it. Don't look so cross at me, Prince Wolf. I'm sure it's not my fault. I could only say what the monk told me, whispered poor Pelagia. Who looks cross at you, my queen? roared the Amal. Let me have him out here and buy Thor's hammer. I'll— Who spoke to you, you stupid darling? answered Pelagia, who lived in hourly fear of thunderstorms. Who is going to be cross with anyone except I with you for mishearing and misunderstanding and meddling as you are always doing? I shall do as I threatened and run away with Prince Wolf if you are not good. Don't you see that the whole crew are expecting you to make them an oration? Whereupon the Amal rose. See you here, Wolf the son of Ovida, and warriors all. If we want wealth, we shan't find it among the sand hills. If we want women, we shall find nothing prettier than these among dragons and devils. Don't look angry, Wolf. You have no mind to marry one of those dog-headed girls the monk talked of, have you? Well, then, we have money and women, and if we want sport, it's better sport killing men than killing beasts, so we had better go where we shall find most of that game, which we certainly shall not up this road. As for fame and all that, though I've had enough, there's plenty to be got anywhere along the shores of that Mediterranean. Let's burn and plunder Alexandria. Forty of us Goths might kill down all these donkey riders in two days and hang up that lying prefect who sent us here on this fool's errand. Don't answer, Wolf. I knew he was humbugging us all along, but you were so open-mouthed to all he said that I was bound to let my elders choose for me. Let's go back. Send over for any of the tribes. Send to Spain for those vandals. They have had enough of Adolf by now, curse him. I'll warrant them. Get together an army and take Constantinople. I'll be Augustus and Pelagia Augusta. You and Smith here, the two Caesars, and we'll make the monk the chief of the eunuchs, eh? Anything you like for a quiet life. But up this accursed kennel of hot water, I go no farther. Ask your girls, my heroes, and I'll ask mine. Women are all prophetesses. Every one of them. When they're not harlots, growled Wolf to himself. I will go to the world's end with you, my king, sighed Pelagia. But Alexandria is certainly pleasanter than this. 
Old Wolf sprang up fiercely enough. Hear me, Amalric the Amal, son of Odin, and heroes all. When my father swore to be Odin's men, and gave up the kingdom to the holy Amals, the sons of the Asir, what was the bond between your fathers and mine? Was it not that we should move and move, southward and southward ever, till we came back to Asgard, the city where Odin dwells for ever, and gave into his hands the kingdom of all the earth? And did we not keep our oath? Have we not held to the Amals? Did we not leave Adolf, because we could not follow a Balth, while there was an Amal to lead us? Have we not been true men to you, son of the Aesir? No man ever saw Wolf, the son of Ovida, fail friend or foe. Then why does his friend fail him? Why does his friend fail himself? If the bison bull lie down and wallow, what will the herd do for a leader? If the king wolf lose the scent, how will the pack hold it? If the youngling forgets the song of Asgard, who will sing it to the heroes? Sing it yourself, if you choose. Pelagia sings quite well enough for me. In an instant the cunning beauty caught at the hint and poured forth a soft, low, sleepy song. Loose the sail, rest the oar, float away down, fleeting and gliding by tower and town. Life is so short at best, snatch while thou canst thy rest, sleeping by me. Can you answer that, wolf? shouted a dozen voices. Hear the song of Asgard, warrior of the Goths. Did not Alaric the king love it well? Did I not sing it before him in the palace of the Caesars, till he swore, for all the Christian that he was, to go southward in search of the holy city? And when he went to Valhalla, and the ships were wrecked off Sicily, and Adolf the Balth turned back like a lazy hound, and married the daughter of the Romans, whom Odin hates, and went northward again to Gaul, did I not sing you all the song of Asgard and Messina there, till you swore to follow the Amal through fire and water until we found the hall of Odin, and received the mead cup from his own hand? Hear it again, warriors of the Goths. Not that song, roared the Amal, stopping his ears with both his hands. Will you drive us blood mad again, just as we are settling down into our sober senses and finding out what our lives were given us for? Hear the song of Asgard! On to Asgard, wolves of the Goths! shouted another, and a babble of voices arose. Haven't we been fighting and marching these seven years? Haven't we drunk blood enough to satisfy Odin ten times over? If he wants us, let him come himself and lead us. Let us get our winds again before we start afresh. Wolf the Prince is like his name, and never tires. He has a winter wolf's legs under him. That is no reason why we should have. Haven't you heard what the monk says? We can never get over these cataracts. We'll stop his old wife's tales for him, and then settle for ourselves, said Smid. And springing from the thwart where he had been sitting, he caught up a bill with one hand, and seized Philemon's throat with the other. In a moment more it would have been all over with him. For the first time in his life Philemon felt a hostile grip upon him, and a new sensation rushed through every nerve as he grappled with the warrior clutched with his left hand the uplifted wrist, and with his right the girdle, and commenced, without any definite aim, a fierce struggle, which, strange to say, as it went on, grew absolutely pleasant. The women shrieked to their lovers to part the combatants, but in vain. Not for worlds! A very fair match, and a very fair fight! Take your long legs back, Itho, or they will be over for you. That's right, my smid, don't use the knife. They will be overboard in a moment. By all the Valkyrs that are down, and Smid undermost. There was no doubt of it, and in another moment Philemon would have wrenched the bill out of his opponent's hand, when, to the utter astonishment of the onlookers, he suddenly loosed his hold, shook himself free by one powerful wrench, and quietly retreated to his seat, conscious stricken at the fearful thirst for blood which had suddenly boiled up within him as he felt his un enemy under him. The onlookers were struck dumb with astonishment. They had taken for granted that he would, as a matter of course, have used his right of splitting his vanquished opponent's skull, an event which they would, of course, have deeply deplored, but with which, as men of honor, they could not on any account interfere, but merely console themselves for the loss of their comrade by flaying his conqueror alive, carving him into the blood eagle, or any other delicate ceremony which might serve as a vent for their sorrow and a comfort for the soul of the deceased. Smid rose, with a bill in his hand, and looked round him, perhaps to see what was expected of him. He half lifted his weapon to strike. Philemon, seated, looked him calmly in the face. 
the old warrior's eye caught the bank, which was now receding rapidly past them, and when he saw that they were really floating downwards again, without an effort to stem the stream, he put away his bill and sat himself down deliberately in his place, astonishing the onlookers quite as much as Philemon had done. Five minutes good fighting and no one killed! This is a shame! quoth another. Blood we must see, and it had better be yours, Master Monk, than your betters. And therewith he rushed on poor Philemon. He spoke the heart of the crew. The sleeping wolf in them had been awakened by the struggle, and blood they would have, and not frantically like Celts or Egyptians, but with the cool, humorous cruelty of the Teuton. They rose all together, and turning Philemon over on his back, deliberated by what death he should die. Philemon quietly submitted. If submission have anything to do with that state of mind in which sheer astonishment and novelty have broken up all the custom of man's nature, till the strangest deeds and sufferings are taken as matters of course, his sudden escape from the Laura, the new world of thought and action into which he had been plunged, the new companions with whom he had fallen in, had driven him utterly from his moorings, and now anything and everything might happen to him. He who had promised never to look upon woman found himself, by circumstances over which he had no control, amid a boatful of the most objectionable species of that most objectionable genus, and the utterly worst having happened, everything else which happened must be better than the worst. For the rest, he had gone forth to see the world, and this was one of the ways of it, so he made up his mind to see it, and be filled with the fruit of his own devices." and he would have been certainly filled with the same in five minutes more, in some shape too ugly to be mentioned. But, as even sinful women have hearts in them, Pelagia shrieked out, Amalric! Amalric! Do not let them! I cannot bear it! The warriors are free men, my darling, and know what is proper. And what can a life of such a brute be to you? Before he could stop her, Pelagia had sprung from her cushions and thrown herself into the midst of the laughing ring of wild beasts. "'Spare him! Spare him for my sake!' shrieked she. "'Oh, my pretty lady, you mustn't interrupt warrior's sports!' In an instant she had torn off her shawl and thrown it over Philemon, and as she stood, with all the outlines of her beautiful limbs revealed through the thin robe of spangled gauze, "'Let the man who dares touch him beneath that shawl, though it be a saffron one!' The Goths drew back. For Pelagia herself they had as little respect as the rest of the world had, but for a moment she was not the Messalina of Alexandria, but a woman, and true to the old woman-worshipping instinct, they looked one and all at her flashing eyes, full of noble pity and indignation, as well as of mere woman's terror, and drew back and whispered together. Whether the good spirit or the evil one would conquer seemed for a moment doubtful, when Pelagia felt a heavy hand on her shoulder, and turning, saw Wolf the son of Ovida. Go back, pretty woman. Men, I claim the boy. Smid, give him to me. He is your man. You could have killed him if you had chosen, and did not, and no one else shall. Give him us, Prince Wolf. We have not seen blood for many a day. You might have seen rivers of it if you had had the hearts to go onward. The boy is mine, and a brave boy. He has upset a warrior fairly this day, and spared him, and we will make a warrior of him in return." and he lifted up the prostrate monk. "'You are my man now. Do you like fighting?' Philemon, not understanding the language in which he was addressed, could only shake his head, though if he had known what its import was, he could hardly in honesty have said no. "'He shakes his head. He does not like it. He is craven. Let us have him!' "'I had killed kings when you were shooting frogs!' cried Smid. "'Listen to me, my sons. A coward grips sharply at first, and loosens his hand after a while, because his blood is soon hot and soon cold. A brave man's grip grows firmer the longer he holds, because the spirit of Odin comes upon him. I watch the boy's hands on my threat, and he will make a man, and I will make him one. However, we may as well make him useful at once, so give him an oar. Well, answered his new protector, he can as well row us as be rowed by us, and if we are to go back to a cow's death and the pool of Hela, the quicker we go, the better. And as the men settled themselves again to their oars, one was put into Philemon's hand, which he managed with such strength and skill that his late tormentors, who, in spite of an occasional inclination to robbery and murder, were thoroughly good-natured, honest fellows, 
clapped him on the back and praised him as heartily as they had just now heartily intended to torture him to death, and then went forward, as many of them as were not rowing, to examine the strange beast which they had just slaughtered, pawing him over from tusks to tail, putting their heads into his mouth, trying their knives on his hide, comparing him to all beasts, like and unlike, which they had ever seen, and laughing and shoving each other about with the fun and childish wonder of a party of schoolboys, till Smid, who was the wit of the party, settled the comparative anatomy of the subject for them. Valhalla! I've figured out what he's most like! One of those big blue plums which gave us all the stomach ache when we were encamped in the orchards above Ravenna. End of chapter 3「Hypatia's favorite maid entered her chamber with a somewhat terrified face. The old Jewess, madam, the hag who has been watching so often lately under the wall opposite, she frightened us all out of our senses last evening by peeping in. We all said she had the evil eye, if any one ever had. Well, what of her? She is below, madam, and will speak with you. Not that I care for her. I have my amulet on. I hope you have. Silly girl, those who have been initiated as I have in the mysteries of the gods can defy spirits and command them. Do you suppose that the favorite of Pallas Athene will condescend to charms and magic? Send her up. The girl retreated with a look half of awe, half of doubt, at the lofty pretensions of her mistress, and returned with old Miriam, keeping, however, prudently behind her, in order to test as little as possible the power of her own amulet by avoiding the basilisk eye which had terrified her. Miriam came in, and advancing to the proud beauty, who remained seated, made an obeisance down to the very floor, without, however, taking her eyes for an instant off Hypatia's face. Her countenance was haggard and bony, with broad, sharp-cut lips, stamped with a strangely mingled expression of strength and sensuality. But the feature about her, which instantly fixed Hypatia's attention, and from which she could not in spite of herself withdraw it, was the dry, glittering, coal-black eye which glared out from underneath the grey fringe of her swarthy brows, between black locks covered with gold coins. Hypatia could look at nothing but those eyes, and she reddened and grew all but unphilosophically angry as she saw that the old woman intended her to look at them and feel the strange power which she evidently wished them to exercise. After a moment's silence, Miriam drew a letter from her bosom and with a second's low obeisance presented it. From whom is this? Perhaps the letter itself will tell the beautiful lady, the fortunate lady, the discerning lady, answered she, in a fawning, wheedling tone. How should a poor old Jewess know great folks' secrets? Great folks? Hypatia looked at the seal, which fixed a silk cord round the letter. It was Orestes, and so was the handwriting. Strange that he should have chosen such a messenger. What message could it be which required such secrecy? She clapped her hands for the maid. Let this woman wait in the ante-room. Miriam glided out backwards, bowing as she went. As Hypatia looked up over the letter to see whether she was alone, she caught a last glimpse of that eye still fixed upon her, and an expression in Miriam's face which made her, she knew not why, shudder and turn chill. Foolish that I am! What can that witch be to me? But now for the letter. To the most noble and most beautiful, the mistress of philosophy, beloved of Athene, 
her pupil and slave sends greeting my slave and no name mentioned there are those who consider that the favourite hen of honorius which bears the name of the imperial city would thrive better under a new feeder and the count of africa has been dispatched by himself and by the immortal gods to superintend for the present the poultry-yard of the caesars at least during the absence of adolf and placidia there are those also who consider that in his absence the numidian lion might be prevailed on to become the yoke fellow of the egyptian crocodile and a farm which ploughed by such a pair should expend from the upper cataract to the pillars of hercules might have charms even for a philosopher but while the ploughman is without a nymph arcadia is imperfect what was dionysus without his ariadne ares without aphrodite zeus without hera even artemis had her endymion athens alone remains unwedded but only because hephaestus was too rough a wooer such is not he who now offers to the representative of athene the opportunity of sharing that which may be with the help of her wisdom which without her is impossible shall eros invincible for ages be balked at last of the noblest game against which he ever drew his bow if hypatia's colour had faded a moment before under the withering glance of the old jewess it rose again swiftly enough as she read line after line of this strange epistle till at last crushing it together in her hand she rose and hurried into the adjoining library where theon sat over his books father do you know anything of this look what orestes has dared to send me by the hands of some base jewish witch and she spread the letter before him and stood impatient her whole figure dilated with pride and anger as the old man read it slowly and carefully and then looked up apparently not ill pleased with the contents what father asked she half reproachfully do you not too feel the insult which has been put upon your daughter my dear child with a puzzled look do you not see that he offers you i know what he offers me father the empire of africa i am to descend from the mountain heights of science from the contemplation of the unchangeable and ineffable glories into the foul fields and farmyards of earthly practical life and become a drudge among political chicanery and the petty ambitions and sins and falsehoods of the earthly herd and the price which he offers me me the stainless me the virgin me the untamed is his hand pallas athene dost thou not blush with thy child but my child my child an empire would the empire of the world restore my lost self-respect my just pride would it save my cheek from blushes every time i recollected that i bore the hateful and degrading name of wife the property the puppet of a man submitting to his pleasure bearing his children wearing myself out with all the nauseous cares of wifehood no longer able to glory in myself pure and self-sustained but forced by day and night to recollect that my very beauty is no longer the sacrament of athene's love for me but the plaything of a man and such a man as that luxurious frivolous heartless courting my society as he has done for years only to pick up and turn to his own base earthly uses the scraps which fall from the festal table of the gods i have encouraged him too much vain fool that i have been no i wrong myself it was only i thought i thought that by his being seen at our doors the cause of the immortal gods would gain honour and strength in the eyes of the multitude i have tried to feed the altars of heaven with earthly fuel and this is my just reward i will write to him this moment return by the fitting messenger which he has sent insult for insult 
in the name of heaven, my daughter, for your father's sake, for my sake, Hypatia, my pride, my joy, my only hope, have pity on my grey hairs. And the poor old man flung himself at her feet, and clasped her knees imploringly. Tenderly she lifted him up, and wound her long arms round him, and laid his head on her white shoulder, and her tears fell fast upon his grey hair. But her lip was firm and determined. Think of my pride, my glory in your glory. Think of me, not for myself. You know I never cared for myself, sobbed out the old man. But to die seeing you empress, unless I died first in childbed, father, as many a woman dies who is weak enough to become a slave, and submit to tortures only fit for slaves. But, but, said the old man, racking his bewildered brains for some argument far enough removed from nature and common sense to have an effect on the beautiful fanatic. But the cause of the gods, what you might do for it, remember, Julian. Hypatia's arms dropped suddenly. Yes, it was true. The thought flashed across her mind with mingled delight and terror. Visions of her childhood rose swift and thick, temples, sacrifices, priesthoods, colleges, museums. What might she not do? What might she not make Africa? Give her ten years of power, and the hated name of Christian might be forgotten. And Athene Polias, colossal in ivory and gold, watching in calm triumph over the harbours of a heathen Alexandria. But the price! And she hid her face in her hands, and bursting into bitter tears, walked slowly away into her own chamber, her whole body convulsed with an internal struggle. The old man looked after her, anxiously and perplexed, and then followed, hesitating. She was sitting at her table, her face buried in her hands. He did not dare to disturb her, in addition to all the affection, the wisdom, the glorious beauty, on which his whole heart fed day by day. He believed her to be the possessor of those supernatural powers and favours to which she so boldly laid claim. And he stood watching her in the doorway, praying in his heart to all gods and demons, principalities and powers, from Athene down to his daughter's guardian spirit, to move a determination which he was too weak to gainsay, and yet too rational to approve. At last the struggle was over, and she looked up, clear, calm, and glorious again. It shall be, for the sake of the immortal gods, for the sake of art and science and learning and philosophy, it shall be. If the gods demand a victim, here am I. If a second time in the history of the ages the Grecian fleet cannot sail forth, conquering and civilizing, without the sacrifice of a virgin, I give my throat to the knife. Father, call me no more Hypatia, call me Iphigenia, and me Agamemnon, asked the old man, attempting a faint jest through his tears of joy. I dare say you think me a very cruel father, but spare me, father, I have spared you, and she began to write her answer. I have accepted his offer, conditionally, that is and on whether he have courage or not to fulfil that condition depends. Do not ask me what it is. While Cyril is leader of the Christian mob, it may be safer for you, my father, that you should be able to deny all knowledge of my answer. Be content, I have said this, that if he will do as I would have him do, I will do as you would have me do. Have you not been too rash? Have you not demanded of him something which, for the sake of public opinion, he dare not grant openly, and yet which he may allow you to do for yourself when once I have? If I am to be a victim, the sacrificing priest shall at least be a man, and not a coward and a time-server. If he believes this Christian faith, let him defend it against me, for either it or I shall perish. If he does not, as he does not, let him give up living in a lie, and taking on his lips 
blasphemies against the immortals, from which his heart and reason revolt. And she clapped her hands again for the maid-servant, gave her the letter silently, shut the doors of her chamber, and tried to resume her commentary on Plotinus. Alas! what were all the wire-drawn dreams of metaphysics to her in that real and human struggle of the heart? What availed it to define the process by which individual souls emanated from the universal one, while her own soul had, singly and on its own responsibility, to decide so terrible an act of will, or to write fine words with pen and ink about the immutability of the supreme reason, while her own reason was left there to struggle for its life amid a roaring, shoreless waste of doubts and darkness. Oh, how grand and clear and logical it had all looked half an hour ago, and how irrefragibly she had been deducing from it all, syllogism after syllogism, the non-existence of evil. How it was but a lower form of good, one of the countless products of the one great all-pervading mind, which could not err or change, only so strange and recondite in its form, as to excite antipathy in all minds but that of the philosopher, who learned to see the stem which connected the apparently bitter fruit with the perfect root from whence it sprang. Could she see the stem there, the connection between the pure and supreme reason, and the hideous caresses of the debauched and cowardly Orestes? Was not that evil, pure, unadulterate with any vein of good, past, present, or future? True, she might keep her spirit pure amid it all. She might sacrifice the base body, and ennoble the soul by the self-sacrifice. And yet would that not increase the horror, the agony, the evil of it to her, at least most real evil, not to be explained away, and yet the gods required it. Were they just merciful in that? Was it like them to torture her, their last unshaken votary? Did they require it? Was it not required of them by some higher power, of whom they were only the emanations, the tools, the puppets, and required of that higher power by some still higher one, some nameless absolute destiny of which Orestes and she and all heaven and earth were but the victims, dragged along in an inevitable vortex, helpless, hopeless, toward that for which each was meant, and she was meant for this. The thought was unbearable, it turned her giddy. No, she would not, she would rebel. Like Prometheus, she would dare destiny and brave the worst. And she sprang up to recall the letter. Miriam was gone and she threw herself on the floor and wept bitterly end of chapter 4 part 1
when she has read through your letter and Hypatia's answer. Read them? Of course. You don't fancy she is going to be fool enough to carry a message without knowing what it is. Don't be angry. She won't tell. She would give one of those two grave lights there, which she calls her eyes, to see the thing prosper. Why? Your Excellency will know when the letter comes. Here she is. I hear steps in the cloister. Now, one bet before they enter. I give you two to one. She asks you to turn pagan. What in? Negro boys? Anything you like. Taken. Come in, slaves. And Hypo Charisma entered, pouting. That Jewish fury is outside with the letter, and has the impudence to say she won't let me bring it in. Bring her in, then, quick. I wonder what I am here for, if people have secrets that I am not to know, grumble the spoilt youth. Do you want a blue ribbon round those white sides of yours, you monkey? answered Orestes. Because if you do, the hippopotamus hide hangs ready outside. Let us make him kneel down here for a couple of hours, and use him as a dice-board, said Raphael, as he used to do to the girls in Armenia. Ah, you recollect that, and how the barbarian papas used to grumble, till I had to crucify one or two, eh? That was something like life. I love those out-of-the-way stations, where nobody asks questions, but here one might as well live among the monks in Nitria. Here comes Canidia. Ah, the answer, hand it here, my queen of go-betweens. Orestes read it, and his countenance fell. I have won? Out of the room, slaves, and no listening. I have won, then? Orestes tossed the letter across to him, and Raphael read. The immortal gods accept no divided worship, and he who would command the counsels of their prophetess must remember that they will vouchsafe to her no illumination till their lost honours be restored. If he who aspires to be the Lord of Africa dare trample on the hateful cross and restore the Caesarium to those for whose worship it was built, if he dare proclaim aloud with his lips and in his deeds that contempt for novel and barbarous superstitions which his taste and reason have already taught him, then he would prove himself one with whom it were a glory to labour to dare to die in a great cause. But till then, and so the letter ended. What am I to do? Take her at a word. Good heavens, I shall be excommunicated, and, and, what is to become of my soul? What will become of it in any case, my most excellent lord? answered Raphael blandly. You mean, I know what you cursed Jews think will happen to every one but yourselves. But what would the world say? I an apostate, and in the face of Cyril and the populace, I daredn't, I tell you. No one asked your excellency to apostatize. Why what? What did you say just now? I asked you to promise. It will not be the first time that promises before marriage have not exactly coincided with performance afterwards. I daredn't, that is, I won't promise. I believe now. This is some trap of your Jewish intrigue, just to make me commit myself against those Christians whom you hate. I assure you, I despise all mankind far too profoundly to hate them. How disinterested my advice was, when I proposed this match to you, you never will know. Indeed, it would be boastful in me to tell you. But really, you must make a little sacrifice to win this foolish girl. With all the depths and daring of her intellect to help you, you might be a match for Romans, Byzantines, and Goths at once. And as for beauty, why, there is one dimple inside that wrist, just at the setting on of the sweet little hand, worth all the other flesh and blood in Alexandria. By Jove, you admire her so much, I suspect you must be in love with her yourself. Why don't you marry her? I'll make you my Prime Minister, and then we shall have the use of her wits without the trouble of her fancies. By the twelve gods, if you marry her and help me, I'll make you what you like." Raphael rose and bowed to the earth. "'Your serene high-mightiness overwhelms me. 
but I assure you, that never having as yet cared for any one's interest but my own, I could not be expected, at my time of life, to devote myself to that of another, even though it were to yours. Candid? Exactly so. And moreover, whosoever I may marry, will be practically, as well as theoretically, my private and peculiar property, you comprehend. Candid again? Exactly so, and waiving the third argument, that she probably might not choose to marry me, I beg to remark that it would not be proper to allow the world to say that I, the subject, had a wiser and fairer wife than you, the ruler, especially a wife who had already refused that ruler's complimentary offer. By Jove! And she has refused me in good earnest. I'll make her repent it. I was a fool to ask her at all. What's the use of having guards if one can't compel what one wants? If fair means can't do it, foul shall. I'll send for her this moment. Most illustrious Majesty, it will not succeed. You do not know that woman's determination. Scourges and red-hot pincers will not shake her alive, and dead she will be of no use whatsoever to you, while she will be of great use to Cyril. How? He will be most happy to make the whole story a handle against you. Give out that she died a virgin martyr, in defence of the most holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Get miracles worked at her tomb, and pull your palace about your ears on the strength thereof. Cyril will hear of it anyhow. That's another dilemma into which you have brought me, you intriguing rascal. Why this girl will be boasting all over Alexandria that I have offered her marriage, and that she has done herself the honour to refuse me. She will be much too wise to do anything of the kind. She has sense enough to know that if she did so, you would inform a Christian populace what condition she offered you, and, with all her contempt for the burden of the flesh, she has no mind to be lightened of that pretty load by being torn in pieces by Christian monks, a very probable ending for her in any case, as she herself, in her melancholy moods, confesses. What will you have me do, then? Simply nothing. Let the prophetic spirit go out of her, as it will, in a day or two, and then, I know nothing of human nature, if she does not bait a little of her own price. Depend on it, for all her ineffabilities and impassibilities, and all the rest of the seventh heaven moonshine at which we play here in Alexandria, a throne is far too pretty a bait for even Hypatia the Pythoness to refuse. Leave well alone is a good rule, but leave ill alone is a better. So now another bet before we part, and this time three to one. Do nothing either way, and she sends to you of her own accord, before a month is out. In Caucasian mules, done. Be it so. Well, you are the most charming counsellor for a poor perplexed devil of a prefect. If I had but a private fortune like you, I could just take the money, and let the work do itself which is the true method of successful government. Your slave bids you farewell. Do not forget our bet. You dine with me to-morrow. And Raphael bowed himself out. As he left the prefect's door, he saw Miriam on the opposite side of the street, evidently watching for him. As soon as she saw him, she held on her own side, without appearing to notice him, till he turned a corner, and then crossing, caught him eagerly by the arm. Does the fool dare? Who dare what? You know what I mean. Do you suppose old Miriam carries letters without taking care to know what is inside them? Will he apostatize? Tell me, I am secret as the grave. The fool has found an old worm-eaten rag of conscience somewhere in the corner of his heart and dare not. Curse the coward! And such a plot as I had laid! I would have swept every Christian dog out of Africa within the year. What is the man afraid of? Hellfire! Why he will go there in any case, the accursed Gentile! 
So I hinted to him, as delicately as I could, but like the rest of the world, he has a sort of partiality for getting thither by his own road. Coward! And whom shall I get now? Oh, if that Pelagia had as much cunning in her old body as Hypatia has in her little finger, I'd seat her and her goth upon the throne of the Caesars. But she has five senses and just enough wit to use them, eh? Don't laugh at her for that, the darling. I do delight in her, after all. It warms even my old blood to see how thoroughly she knows her business, and how she enjoys it, like a true daughter of Eve. She has been your most successful pupil, certainly, mother. You may well be proud of her. The old hag chuckled to herself a while, and then suddenly turning to Raphael. See here, I have a present for you. And she pulled out a magnificent ring. Why, mother, you are always giving me presents. It was but a month ago you sent me this poisoned dagger. Why not, eh? Why not? Why should not Jew give to Jew? Take the old woman's ring. What a glorious opal! Ah, that is an opal indeed, and the unspeakable name upon it, just like Solomon's own. Take it, I say. Whosoever wears that, never need fear fire, steel, poison, or woman's eye. Your own included, eh? Take it, I say. And Miriam caught his hand, and forced the ring on his finger. There, now you are safe and now call me mother again. I like it. I don't know why, but I like it. And Raphael Aben Ezra, don't laugh at me and call me witch and hag, as you often do. I don't care about it from any one else. I'm accustomed to it. But when you do it, I always long to stab you. That's why I gave you the dagger. I used to wear it, and I was afraid I might be tempted to use it some day when the thought came across me how handsome you look and how quiet, when you were dead, and your soul up there so happy in Abraham's bosom, watching all the Gentiles frying and roasting for ever down below. Don't laugh at me, I say, and don't thwart me. I may make you the Emperor's Prime Minister some day. I can if I choose. Heaven forbid, said Raphael, laughing. Don't laugh. I cast your nativity last night, and I know you have no cause to laugh. A great danger hangs over you and a deep temptation, and if you weather this storm, you may be Chamberlain, Prime Minister, Emperor, if you will. And you shall be. By the four archangels, you shall. And the old woman vanished down a by-lane, leaving Raphael utterly bewildered. Moses and the Prophets does the old lady intend to marry me? What can there be in this very lazy and selfish personage who bears my name to excite so romantic an affection? Well, Raphael Eben Ezra, thou hast one more friend in the world besides Bran the Mastiff, and therefore one more trouble, seeing that friends always expect a due return of affection and good offices and what not. I wonder whether the old lady has been getting into a scrape kidnapping, and wants my patronage to help her out of it. Three quarters of a mile of roasting sun between me and home. I must hire a gig or a litter or something off the next stand, with a driver who has been eating onions, and of course there is not a stand for the next half mile. O oh, divine ether, as Prometheus had it, and ye swift-winged breezes! I wish there were any here. When will it all be over? Three and thirty years have I endured already of this babel of knaves and fools, and with this abominable good health of mine, which won't even help me with gout or indigestion, I am likely to have three and thirty years more of it. I know nothing, and I care for nothing, and I expect nothing, and I actually can't take the trouble to prick a hole in myself and let the very small amount of wits out, to see something really worth seeing, and try its strength on something really worth doing. If, after all, the other side of the grave does not turn out to be just as stupid as this one, when will it be all over, and I in Abraham's bosom, or any one else's, provided it be not a woman's? 
End of chapter 4「Chapter Five, Part One of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Huckabee. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter Five A Day in Alexandria. Part One. In the meanwhile, Philemon, with his hosts, the Goths, had been slipping down the stream, passing, one after another, world-old cities now dwindled to decaying towns, and numberless canal mouths now fast falling into ruin with the fields to which they ensured fertility, under the pressure of Roman extortion and misrule. They had entered one evening the mouth of the great canal of Alexandria, and slid easily all night across the star-bespangled shadows of Lake Mariotis, and found themselves, when the next morning dawned, among the countless masts and noisy quays of the greatest seaport in the world. The motley crowd of foreigners, the hubbub of all dialects, from the Crimea to Cadiz, the vast piles of merchandise, and heaps of wheat, lying unsheltered in that rainless air, the huge bulk of the corn ships lading for Rome, whose tall sides rose story over story like floating palaces above the buildings of some inner dock. These sights and a hundred more made the young monk think that the world did not look at first sight a thing to be despised. In front of heaps of fruit fresh from the market boats, black groups of glossy negro slaves were basking and laughing on the quay, looking anxiously and coquettishly round in hopes of a purchaser. They evidently did not think the change from desert toil to city luxuries a change for the worse. Philemon turned away his eyes from beholding vanity, but only to meet fresh vanity wheresoever they fell. He felt crushed by the multitude of new objects, stunned by the din around, and scarcely recollected himself enough to seize the first opportunity of escaping from his dangerous companions. Holloa! roared Smid the armourer, as he scrambled on to the steps of the slip. You are not going to run away without bidding us good-bye. Stop with me, boy, said old Wolf. I saved you, and you are my man. Philemon turned and hesitated. I am a monk, and God's man. You can be that anywhere. I will make you a warrior. The weapons of my warfare are not of flesh and blood. But prayer and fasting, answered poor Philemon, who felt already that he should have ten times more need of the said weapons in Alexandria than ever he had had in the desert. Let me go. I am not made for your life. I thank you. Bless you. I will pray for you, sir, but let me go. Curse the craven hound, roared half a dozen voices. Why did you not let us have our will with him, Prince Wolf? You might have expected such gratitude from a monk. He owes me my share of the sport, quoth Smid. And here it is, and a hatchet was thrown with practised aim, whistling right for Philemon's head. He had just time to swerve, and the weapon struck and snapped against the granite wall behind. Well saved, said Wolf coolly, while the sailors and market women above yelled murder, and the custom house officers and the other constables and catchpoles of the harbour, rushed to the place, and retired again quietly at the thunder of a mouth from the boat's stern. Never mind, my good fellows, we're only Goths, and on a visit to the prefect, too. Only Goths, my donkey-riding friends, echoed Smid, and at that ominous name the whole posse comitatus tried to look unconcerned, and found suddenly that their presence was absolutely required in an opposite direction. Let him go, said Wolf, as he stalked up the steps. Let the boy go. I never set my heart on any man yet, he growled to himself in an undervoice. But what he disappointed me, and I must not expect more from this fellow. Come, men, ashore, and get drunk. Philemon, of course, now that he had leave to go, longed to stay. At all events, he must go back and thank his hosts. 
he turned unwillingly to do so, as hastily as he could, and found Pelagia and her gigantic lover just entering a palanquin. With downcast eyes he approached the beautiful basilisk, and stammered out some commonplace, and she, full of smiles, turned to him at once. "'Tell us more about yourself before we part. "'You speak such beautiful Greek, true Athenian. "'It is quite delightful to hear one's own accent again. "'Were you ever at Athens?' "'When I was a child, I recollect. "'That is, I think.' "'What?' asked Pelagia eagerly. "'A great house in Athens, "'and a great battle there, "'and coming to Egypt in a ship.' "'Heavens!' said Pelagia and paused. How strange! Girls, who said he was like me? I'm sure we meant no harm, if we did say it in a joke, pouted one of the attendants. Like me? You must come and see us. I have something to say to you. You must. Philemon misinterpreted the intense interest of her tone, and if he did not shrink back, gave some involuntary gesture of reluctance. Pelagia laughed aloud. Don't be vain enough to suspect, foolish boy, but come. Do you think that I have nothing to talk about but nonsense? Come and see me. It may be better for you. I live in... And she named a fashionable street, which Philemon, though he inwardly vowed not to accept the invitation, somehow could not help remembering. Do leave the wild man and come, growled the Amal from within the palanquin. You are not going to turn none, I hope. "'Not while the first man I ever met in the world stays in it,' answered Pelagia, as she skipped into the palanquin, taking care to show the most lovely white heel and ankle, and, like the Parthian, send a random arrow as she retreated. But the dart was lost on Philemon, who had been already hustled away by the bevy of laughing attendants amid baskets, dressing-cases, and bird-cages, and was fain to make his escape into the Babel round and inquire his way to the Patriarch's house. "'Patriarch's house?' answered the man whom he first addressed. A little lean, swarthy fellow, with merry black eyes, who, with a basket of fruit at his feet, was sunning himself on a balk of timber, meditatively chewing the papyrus cane, and examining the strangers with a look of absurd sagacity. "'I know it. Without a doubt I know it. All Alexandria has good reason to know it.' "'Are you a monk?' "'Yes.' "'Then ask your way of the monks. "'You won't go far without finding one.' "'But I do not even know the right direction. "'What is your grudge against monks, my good man?' "'Look here, my youth. "'You seem too ingenuous for a monk. "'Don't flatter yourself that it will last. "'If you can wear the sheepskin "'and haunt the churches here for a month "'without learning to lie "'and slander and clap and hoot, and perhaps play your part in a sedition, and murder, satiric drama. Why, you are a better man than I take you for. I, sir, am a Greek and a philosopher, though the whirlpool of matter may have, and indeed has, involved my ethereal spark in the body of a porter. Therefore, youth, continued the little man, starting up upon his bulk like an excited monkey, and stretching out one oratorio poor. I bear a treble hatred to the monkish tribe. First, as a man and a husband, for, as for the smiles of beauty, or otherwise, such as I have, I have. And the monks, if they had their wicked will, would leave neither men nor women in the world. Sir, they would exterminate the human race in a single generation, by voluntary suicide. Secondly, as a porter, for if all men turn monks, nobody would be idle, and the profession of portering would be annihilated. Thirdly, sir, as a philosopher, for as the false coin is odious to the true, so is the irrational and animal asceticism of the monk to the logical and methodic self-restraint of one who, like your humblest of philosophers, aspires to a life according to the pure reason. And pray, asked Philemon, half laughing, who has been your tutor in philosophy? The fountain of classic wisdom, Hypatia herself. As the ancient sage, the name is unimportant to a monk, pumped water nightly that he might study by day, so I, 
the guardian of cloaks and parasols, at the sacred doors of her lecture-room, imbibed celestial knowledge. From my youth I felt in me a soul above the matter-entangled herd. She revealed to me the glorious fact that I am a spark of divinity itself. A fallen star I am, sir, continued he, pensively stroking his lean stomach. A fallen star, fallen if the dignity of philosophy will allow of the simile, among the hogs of the lower world. Indeed, even into the hog bucket itself. Well, after all, I will show you the way to the archbishops. There is a philosophic pleasure in opening one's treasures to the modest young. Perhaps you will assist me by carrying this basket of fruit. And the little man jumped up, put his basket on Philemon's head, and trotted off up a neighbouring street. Philemon followed, half contemptuous, half wondering at what this philosophy might be, which could feed the self-conceit of anything so abject as this ragged little apish guide. But the novel roar and whirl of the street, the perpetual stream of busy faces, the line of curricles, palanquins, laden asses, camels, elephants, which met and passed him, and squeezed him up steps and into doorways, as they threaded their way through the great moon gate into the ample street beyond, drove everything from his mind but wondering curiosity, and a vague helpless dread of that great living wilderness, more terrible than any dead wilderness of sand which he had left behind. Already he longed for the repose, the silence of the Laura, for faces which knew him and smiled upon him, but it was too late to turn back now. His guide held on for more than a mile up the great main street, crossed in the centre of the city, at right angles, by one equally magnificent, at each end of which, miles away, appeared, dim and distant, over the heads of the living stream of passengers, the yellow sand-hills of the desert, while at the end of the vista, in front of them, gleamed the blue harbour, through a network of countless masts. At last they reached the quay at the opposite end of the street, and there burst upon Philemon's astonished eyes a vast semicircle of blue sea, ringed with palaces and towers. He stopped involuntarily, and has his little guide stopped also, and looked askance at the young monk to watch the effect which that grand panorama should produce on him. There, behold our works, as Greeks, as benighted heathens. Look at it, and feel yourself what you are. A very small, conceited, ignorant young person, who fancies that your new religion gives you a right to despise every one else. Did Christians make all this? Did Christians build that pharos there, on the left horn? Wonder of the world! Did Christians raise that mile-long mole which runs towards the land, with its two drawbridges connecting the two ports? Did Christians build this esplanade, or this gate of the sun above our heads? or that caesarium on our right here. Look at those obelisks before it. He pointed upwards to those two world-famous ones, one of which still lies on its ancient site as Cleopatra's needle. Look up, look up, I say, and feel small, very small indeed. Did Christians raise them, or engrave them from base to point with the wisdom of the ancients? Did Christians build that museum next to it, or design its statues and its frescoes. Now, alas, re-echoing no more to the hummings of the attic bee, did they pile up out of the waves that palace beyond it, or that exchange, or fill that temple of Neptune with breathing brass and blushing marble? Did they build that Timonium on the point, where Antony, worsted at Actium, forgot his shame in Cleopatra's arms? Did they quarry out that island of Antirodus into a nest of docks, or cover those waters with sails of every nation under heaven? Speak, thou son of bats and moles, thou six feet of sand, thou mummy out of the cliff caverns. Can monks do works like these? Other men have laboured, and we have entered into their labours, answered Philemon, trying to seem as unconcerned as he could. He was, indeed, too utterly astonished to be angry at anything. The overwhelming vastness, multiplicity and magnificence of the whole scene, 
the range of buildings such as Mother Earth never, perhaps, carried on her lap before or since, the extraordinary variety of form, the pure Doric and Ionic of the earlier Ptolemies, the barbaric and confused gorgeousness of the later Roman, and here and there an imitation of the grand elephantine style of old Egypt, with its gaudy colours relieving while they deepened the effect of its massive and simple outlines. The eternal repose of that great belt of stone contrasting with the restless ripple of the glittering harbour, and the busy sails which crowded out into the sea beyond, like white doves taking their flight into boundless space, all dazzled, overpowered, saddened him. This was the world. Was it not beautiful? Must not the men who made all this have been, if not great, yet he knew not what? Surely they had great souls and noble thoughts in them. Surely there was something godlike in being able to create such things. Not for themselves alone, too, but for a nation, for generations yet unborn. And there was the sea, and beyond it nations of men innumerable. His imagination was dizzy with thinking of them. Were they all doomed, lost? Had God no love for them? At last recovering himself, he recollected his errand, and again asked his way to the archbishop's house. "'This way, O youthful non-entity,' answered the little man, leading the way round the great front of the caesarium at the foot of the obelisks. Philemon's eye fell on some new masonry on the pediment, ornamented with Christian symbols. "'How? Is this a church?' It is the Caesarium. It has become temporarily a church. The immortal gods have, for the time being, condescended to waive their rights. But it is the Caesarium nevertheless. This way, down this street to the right. There, he said, pointing to a doorway in the side of the museum, is the last haunt of the muses, the lecture room of Hepatia, the school of my unworthiness. And there, stopping at the door of a splendid house on the opposite side of the street, is the residence of that blessed favourite of Athene, Neith, as the barbarians of Egypt would denominate the goddess. We men of Macedonia retain the time-honoured Grecian nomenclature. You may put down your basket. And he knocked at the door, and delivering the fruit to a black porter, made a polite obeisance to Philemon, and seemed on the point of taking his departure. But where is the archbishop's house? close to the Serapeum. You cannot miss the place. Four hundred columns of marble, now ruined by Christian persecutors, stand on an eminence. But how far off? About three miles, near the gate of the moon. Why, was not that the gate by which we entered the city on the other side? Exactly so. You will know your way back, having already traversed it. Philemon checked a decidedly carnal inclination to seize the little fellow by the throat and knock his head against the wall, and contented himself by saying, Then do you actually mean to say, you heathen villain, that you have taken me six or seven miles out of my road? Good words, young man. If you do me harm, I call for help. We are close to the Jews' quarters, and there are some thousands there who will swarm out like wasps on the chance of beating a monk to death. Yet that which I have done, I have done with good purpose. First, politically, or according to practical wisdom, in order that you, not I, might carry the basket. Next, philosophically, or according to the intuitions of pure reason, in order that you might, by beholding the magnificence of that great civilization which your fellows wish to destroy, learn that you are an ass, and a tortoise, and a non-entity, and so beholding yourself to be nothing, may be moved to become something and he moved off. Philemon seized him by the collar of his ragged tunic, and held him in a grip, from which the little man, though he twisted like an eel, could not escape. Peaceably, if you will, if not, by main force, you shall go back with me, and show me every step of the way. It is a just penalty. The philosopher conquers circumstances by submitting to them. I go peaceably. Indeed, the base necessities of the hog bucket side of existence compel me of themselves back to the moon gate for another early fruit job. 
so they went back together. Now why Philemon's thoughts should have been running on the next new specimen of womankind to which he had been introduced, though only in name, let psychologists tell. But certainly, after he had walked some half mile in silence, he suddenly woke up, as out of many meditations, and asked, But who is this Hypatia, of whom you talk so much? Who is Hypatia, rustic? The Queen of Alexandria! In wit, Athene, Hera in her majesty, in beauty, Aphrodite. And who are they? asked Philemon. The porter stopped, surveyed him slowly from foot to head, with an expression of boundless pity and contempt, and was in the act of walking off in the ecstasy of his disdain, when he was brought to suddenly by Philemon's strong arm. Ah, I recollect, there is a compact. Who is Athene, the goddess, giver of wisdom? Hera, spouse of Zeus, queen of the celestials. Aphrodite, mother of love. You are not expected to understand. Philemon did understand, however, so much as this, that Hypatia was a very unique and wonderful person in the mind of this little guide, and therefore asked the only further question by which he could as yet test any Alexandrian phenomenon. And is she a friend of the patriarch? The porter opened his eyes very wide, put his middle finger in a careful and complicated fashion between his fore and third fingers, and extending it playfully towards Philemon, performed therewith certain mysterious signals, the effect whereof being totally lost on him. The little man stopped, took another look at Philemon's stately figure, and answered, Of the human race in general, my young friend, the philosopher must rise above the individual, to the contemplation of the universal. Aha! Here is something worth seeing. The gates are open, and he stopped at the portal of a vast building. Is this the patriarch's house? The patriarch's tastes are more plebeian. He lives, they say, in two dirty little rooms, knowing what is fit for him, the patriarch's house, its antipodes, my young friend, that is, if such beings have a cosmic existence, on which point Patia has her doubts. This is the temple of art and beauty, the Delphic tripod of poetic inspiration, the solace of the earthworm drudge, in a word, the theatre which your patriarch, if he could, would convert to-morrow into a... But the philosopher must not revile. Ah, I see the prefect's apparatus at the gate. He is making the polity, as we call it here, the dispositions, settling, in short, the bill of fare for the day, in compliance with the public palate. A facetious pantomime dances here on this day, every week, admired by some, the Jews especially, to the more classic taste, many of his movements, his recoil especially, are wanting in the true antique severity, might be called perhaps, on the whole, indecent. Still, the weary pilgrim must be amused. Let us step in and hear. But before Philemon could refuse, an uproar arose within, a rush outward of the mob, and inward of the prefect's apparatus. It is false, shouted many voices. A Jewish calumny. The man is innocent. There is no more sedition in him than there is in me, roared a fat butcher who looked as ready to fell a man as an ox. He was always the first and the last to clap the holy patriarch at sermon. Dear tender soul, whimpered a woman, and I said to him only this morning, Why don't you flog my boys, Master Hyrax? How can you expect them to learn if they are not flogged? And he said he never could abide the sight of a rod. It made his back tingle so, which was plainly a prophecy, and proves him innocent, for how could he prophesy if he was not one of the holy ones? Monks to the rescue! Hirax, a Christian, is taken and tortured in the theatre, thundered a wild hermit, with his beard and hair streaming about his chest and shoulders. Natria, Natria, for God and the mother of God, monks of Natria. 
Down with the Jewish slanderers! Down with the heathen tyrants! And the mob, reinforced as if by magic by hundreds from without, swept down the huge vaulted passage, carrying Philemon and the porter with them. My friends, quoth the little man, trying to look philosophically calm, though he was fairly off his legs and hanging between heaven and earth on the elbows of the bystanders. Whence this tumult? The Jews got up a cry that Herax wanted to raise a riot, curse them and their Sabbath. They're always writing on Saturdays about this dancer of theirs, instead of working like honest Christians. And writing on Sunday instead, ahem, sectarian differences, which the philosopher... The rest of the sentence disappeared with the speaker, as a sudden opening of the mob let him drop, and buried him under innumerable legs. Philemon, furious at the notion of persecution, maddened by the cries around him, found himself bursting fiercely through the crowd, till he reached the front ranks, where tall gates of open ironwork barred all further progress, but left a full view of the tragedy which was enacting within, where the poor innocent wretch, suspended from a gibbet, writhed and shrieked at every stroke of the hide-whips of his tormentors. In vain Philemon and the monks around him knocked and beat at the gates. They were only answered by laughter and taunts from the apparitors within. Curses on the turbulent mob of Alexandria, with its patriarch, clergy, saints and churches, and promises to each and all outside that their turn would come next, while the piteous screams grew fainter and more faint and at last, with a convulsive shudder, motion and suffering ceased for ever in the poor mangled body. They have killed him, martyred him, back to the archbishop, to the patriarch's house, he will avenge us. And as the horrible news, and the watchword which followed it, passed outwards through the crowd, they wheeled round as one man, and poured through street after street towards Cyril's house, while Philemon, beside himself with horror, rage and pity hurried onward with them a tumultuous hour or more was passed in the street before he could gain entrance and then he was swept along with the mob in which he had been fast wedged through a dark low passage and landed breathless in a quadrangle of mean and new buildings overhung by the four hundred stately columns of the ruined serapeum the grass was already growing on the ruined capitals and architraves. Little did even its destroyers dream, then, that the day would come when only one of that four hundred would be left, as Pompey's pillar, to show what the men of old could think and do. End of chapter 5, part 1Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Imagine. Hypatia by Charles Kinsley. Chapter 5. A Day in Alexandria. Part 2. Philemon at last escaped from the crowd and putting the letter which he had carried in his bosom into the hands of one of the priests who was mixing with the mob was beckoned by him into a corridor and up a flight of stairs and into a large low mean room and there by virtue of the world-wide freemasonry which christianity had for the first time on earth established found himself in five minutes awaiting the summons of the most powerful man south of the mediterranean a curtain hung across the door of the inner chamber through which philemon could hear plainly the steps of someone walking up and down hurriedly and fiercely they will drive me to it at last burst out a deep sonorous voice they will drive me to it their blood be on their own head it is not enough for them to blaspheme god and his church to have monopoly of all the cheating fortune-telling usury sorcery and cunning of the city but they must deliver my clergy into the hands of the tyrant. It was so even in the apostle's time, suggested a softer but far more unpleasant voice. Then it shall be so no longer. God has given me the power to stop them, and God do so to me, and more also, if I do not use that power. Tomorrow I sweep out this ogen stable of villainy, 
and leave not a Jew to blaspheme and cheat in Alexandria. I am afraid such a judgment, however righteous, might offend His Excellency. His Excellency? His tyranny! How does Orestes chuckle to this circumcised? But because they lend money to him and to his creatures. He would keep up a din of fiends in Alexandria if they would do as much for him. And then to play them off against me and mine? To bring religion into contempt by setting them up together by the ears? And to end with outrages like this? Seditious. Have they not cause enough? The sooner I remove one of their temptations, the better. Let the other tempter beware, lest his judgment be at hand. The prefect, your holiness? asked the other boy slyly. Who spoke of the prefect? Whosoever is a tyrant, and a murderer, and an oppressor of the poor, and a favorer of the philosophy which despises and enslaves the poor, should not he perish, though he be seven times a prefect? At this juncture, Philemon, thinking perhaps that he had already heard too much, notified his presence by some slight noise, at which the secretary, as he seemed to be, hastily lifted the curtain, and somewhat sharply demanded his business. The names of Pambo and Arsenius, however, seemed to pacify him at once, and the trembling youth was ushered into the presence of him who, in reality, though not in name, sat on the throne of the pharaohs not indeed in their outward pomp. The furniture of the chamber was but a grade above that of the artisans. The dress of the great man was coarse and simple. If personal vanity peeped out anywhere, it was in the careful arrangement of the bushy beard, and of the few curling locks which the tonsure had spared. But the height and majesty of his figure, the stern and massive beauty of his features, the flashing eye, curling lip and projecting brow, all marked him as one born to command. As the youth entered, Cyril stopped short in his walk, and looking him through and through with a glance which burned upon his cheeks like fire, and made him all but wish the kindly earth would open and hide him, took the letters, read them, and then began. Mm. Philemon, a Greek, you are said to have learned to obey. If so, you have also learned to rule. Your father, Abbot, has transferred you to my tutelage. You are now to obey me, and I will. Well said. Go to that window, then, and leap into the court. Philemon walked to it and opened it. The pavement was fully twenty feet below. But his business was to obey and not to take measurements. There was a flower in the vase upon the sill. He quietly removed it, and in an instant more would have leaped for life or death when Cyril's voice thundered. Stop! The lad will pass, my Peter. I shall not be afraid now for the secrets which he may have overheard. Peter smiled assent, looking all the while as if he thought it a great pity that the young man had not been allowed to put tail bearing out of his own power by breaking his neck. You wish to see the world. Perhaps you have seen something of it today. I saw the murder. Then you saw what you came hither to see, what the world is, and what justice and mercy it can deal out. You would not dislike to see God's reprisal to man's tyranny, or to be a fellow worker with God therein, if I judge rightly by your looks. I would avenge that man. Ah, my poor, simple schoolmaster, and his fate is the portent of portents to you now. Stay a while, till you have gone with Ezekiel into the inner chambers of the devil's temple, and you will see worse things than these, women weeping for Tammuz, bemoaning the decay of an idolatry which they themselves disbelieve. That, too, is on the list of Hercule's labor, Peter mine. At this moment a deacon entered. Your Holiness, the rabbis of the accursed nation are below, at your summon. We brought them in through the back gate, for fear of... Right, right. An accident to them might have ruined us. I shall not forget you. Bring them up. Peter, take this youth. Introduce him to the Parabolani. Who will be the best man for him to work under? The brother Theopompus is especially sober and gentle. Cyril shook his head laughingly. Go into the next room, my son. No, Peter. Put him under some fiery saint, some true born archers, who will talk him down and work him to death and show him the best and worst of everything. Cratophon will be the man. 
Now then, let me see my engagements. Five minutes for this juice. Orestes did not choose to frighten them. Let us see whether Cyril cannot. Then an hour to look over the hospital accounts. An hour for the schools. A half hour for the reserved cases of distress. And another half hour for myself. And then divine service. See that the boy is there. Do bring in everyone in their turn, Peter mine. So much time goes in hunting for this man and that man, and life is too short for all that. Where are these Jews? And Cyril plunged into the latter half of his day's work with that untiring energy, self-sacrifice and method which commanded for him, in spite of all the suspicions of his violence, ambition and intrigue, the loving girl and implicit obedience of several hundred thousand human beings. So Philemon went out with the Parabolani, a sort of organized guild of district visitors, and in their company he saw that afternoon the dark side of that world, whereof the harbour panorama had been the bright one. In squalid misery, filth, prolegacy, ignorance, ferocity, discontent, neglected in body, house and soul by the civil authorities, proving their existence only in aimless and sanguinary riots, there they starved and rotted, heap on heap, the masses of the old Greek population, close to the great food-exporting harbour of the world. Among these, fiercely perhaps, and fanatically, but still among them and for them, laboured those district visitors night and day. And so Philemon toiled away with them, carrying food and clothing, helping sick to the hospital and dead to the burial, cleaning out the infected houses, for the fever was all but perennial in those carters, and comforting the dying with the good news of forgiveness from above, till the larger number had to return to evening service. He, however, was kept by his superior, watching at a sick bedside, and it was late at night before he got home, and was reported to Peter the reader as having acquitted himself like a man of God as, indeed, without the least thought of doing anything noble or self-sacrificing, he had truly done being a monk. And so he threw himself on a truckle bed in one of the many cells which opened off a long corridor and fell fast asleep in a minute. He was just weltering about in a dreary dream jumble of goths dancing with district visitors. Pelagia is an angel with peacock's wings, Hypatia, with horns and cloven feet, riding three hypopotami at once round the theatre. Cyril, standing at an open window, cursing frightfully, and pelting him with flower pots, and a similar self sown aftercrop of his day's impression, when he was awakened by the tramp of hurried feet in the street outside, and shouts, which gradually, as he became conscious, shaped themselves into cries of, Alexander's church is on fire! Help, good Christians, fire, help! Whereat, he sat up in his chuckle bed, tried to recollect where he was, and having with some trouble succeeded, threw on his sheepskin, and jumped up to ask the news from the deacons and monks, who were hurrying along the corridor outside. Yes, Alexander's church was on fire, and down the stairs they poured, across the courtyard and out into the street, Peter's tall figure serving as a standard and a rallying point. As they rushed out through the gateway, Philemon, dazzled by the sudden transition from the darkness within to the blaze of moon and starlight, which flooded the street and walls and shining roofs, hung back a moment. That hesitation probably saved his life, for in an instant he saw a dark figure spring out of the shadow, a long knife flashed across his eyes, and a priest next to him sank above the pavement with a groan, while the assassin dashed off down the street hotly pursued by monks and parabolani philemon who ran like a desert ostrich had soon outstripped all but peter when several more dark figures sprang out of doorways and corners and joined or seemed to join the pursuit suddenly however after running a hundred yards they drew up opposite the mouth of the side street the assassin stopped also peter suspecting something wrong slackened his pace and caught philemon's arm do you see those fellows in the shadow? But, before Philemon could answer, some thirty or forty men, their daggers gleaming in the moonlight, moved out into the middle of the street, 
and received the fugitives into their ranks. What was the meaning of it? Here was a pleasant taste of the ways of the most Christian and civilized city of the empire. Well, thought Philemon, I have come out to see the world, and I seem, at this rate, to be likely to see enough of it. Peter turned at once, and fled as quickly as he had pursued, while Philemon, considering discretion the better part of valor, followed, and they rejoined their party breathless. There is an armed mob at the end of the street. Assassins! Jews! A conspiracy! Up rose a babel of doubtful voices. The foe appeared in sight, advancing stealthily, and the whole party took to flight, led once more by Peter, who seemed determined to make free use, in behalf of his own safety, of the long legs which nature had given him. Philemon followed, sulkily and unwillingly, at a foot's pace, but he had not gone a dozen yards when a pitiable voice at his feet called to him help mercy do not leave me here to be murdered i am a christian indeed i am a christian philemon stopped and lifted from the ground a comely negro woman weeping and shivering in a few tattered remnants of clothing i ran out when they said the church was on fire sobbed the poor creature and the jews met me and wounded me they tore my shawl and tunic off me before i could get any away from that and then our old people ran over me and trod me down and now my husband will beat me if i ever go home quick up the side street or we shall be murdered the armed men whosoever they were were close on them there was no time to be lost and philemon assuring her that he would not desert her hurried her up the side street which she pined on but the pursuers had caught sight of them and while the mass held on up the main side three or four turned aside and gave chase the poor negress could only limp along and philemon unarmed looked back and saw the bright steel points gleaming in the moonlight and made up his mind to die as a monk should nevertheless youth is hopeful one chance for life he thrust the negress into a dark doorway where her color hid her well enough and had just time to ensconce himself behind the pillar when the foremost pursuer reached him he held his breath in fearful suspense should he be seen he would not die without a struggle at least no the fellow ran on panting but in a minute more another came up saw him suddenly and sprang aside startled that start saved philemon quick as a cat he leapt upon him felled him to the earth with a single blow tore the dagger from his hand and sprang to his feet again just in time to strike his new weapon full into the third pursuer's face the man put his hand to his head and recoiled against a fellow ruffian who was close on his heels philemon flushed with victory took advantage of the confusion and before the worthy pair could recover dealt them half a dozen blows which likely for them came from an unpractised hand or the young monk might have had more than one life to answer for as it was they turned and limped off cursing in an unknown tongue and philemon found himself triumphant and alone with the trembling negress and the prostrate ruffian who stunned by the blow and fall lay groaning on the pavement it was all over in a minute the negress was kneeling under the gateway pouring out her simple thanks to heaven for this unexpected deliverance and philemon was about to kneel too when a thought struck him and coolly despoiling the jew of his shawl and sash he handed them over to the poor negress considering them fairly enough as his own by right of conquest but lo and behold as she was overwhelming him with thanks a fresh mob poured into the street from the upper end and were close on them before they were aware a flash of terror and despair and then a burst of joy as by mingled moonlight and torchlight philemon described priestly robes and in the forefront of the battle there being no apparent danger peter the reader who seemed to be anxious to prevent inquiry by beginning to talk as fast as possible ah oh, boy safe the saints be praised we gave you up for dead whom have you here a prisoner and we have another he ran right into our arms up the street and the lord delivered him into our hands he must have passed you so he did said philemon dragging up his captive and here is his fellow scoundrel whereon the two worthies 
were speedily tied together by the elbows and the party marched on once more in search of alexander's church and the supposed conflagration philammon looked round for the negress but she had vanished he was far too much ashamed of being known to have been alone with a woman to say anything about her yet he longed to see her again an interest even something like an affection had already sprung up in his heart toward the poor simple creature whom he had delivered from death instead of thinking her ungrateful for not staying to tell what he had done for her he was thankful to her for having saved his blushes by disappearing so opportunely and he longed to tell her so to know if she was hurt to oh philemon only four days from the laura and a whole regiment of women acquaintances already true providence having sent into the world about as many women as men it may be difficult to keep out of their way altogether perhaps too providence may have intended them to be of some use to that other sex with whom it has so mixed them up don't argue poor philemon alexander's church is on fire forward and so they hurried on a confused mass of monks and populace with their hapless prisoner in the centre who hauled cuffed questioned and cursed by twenty self-elected inquisitors at once thought fit either from jewish obstinacy or sheer bewilderment to give no account whatsoever of themselves as they turned the corner of the street the folding doors of a large gate were rolled open a long line of glittering figures poured across the road dropped their spear butts on the pavement with a single rattle and remained motionless the front rank of the mob recoiled and an awe-struck whisper ran through them the stationaries who are they asked philemon in a whisper the soldiers the roman soldiers answered the whisperer to him philemon who was among the leaders had recalled too he hardly knew why at that stern apparition his next instinct was to press forward as close as he dared and these were roman soldiers the conquerors of the world the men whose name had thrilled him from his childhood with vague awe and admiration dimly heard of up there in the lonely laura roman soldiers and here he was face to face with them at last his curiosity received a sudden check however as he found his arm seized by an officer as he took him to be from the gold ornaments on his helmets and cuirass who lifted his mind stuck threateningly over the young monk's head and demanded what's all this about why are you not quietly in your beds you alexandrian rascals alexander's church is on fire answered philemon thinking the shortest answer the wisest so much the better and the jews are murdering the christians fight it out then turn in man it's only a riot and the steel-clad apparition suddenly flashed round and vanished trampling and jingling into the dark jaws of the guard-house gate while the stream its temporary buried removed rushed on wilder than ever philemon hurried on too with them not without the strange feeling of disappointment only a riot peter was chuckling to his brothers over their cleverness in having kept the prisoners in the middle and stopped the rascal's mouth till they were past the guard-house a fine thing to boast of thought philemon in the face of the men who make and unmake kings and caesars only a riot he and the corpse of district visitors whom he fancied the most august body on earth and alexander's church christians murdered by jews persecution of the catholic faith and all the rest of it was simply then not worth the notice of those forty men alone and secure in the sense of power and discipline among tens of thousands he hated them those soldiers was it because they were indifferent to the cause of which he has inclined to think himself a not unimportant member on the strength of his late samsonic defeat of jewish persecutors at least he obeyed the little porter's advice and felt very small indeed and he felt smaller still being young and alive to ridicule when at some sudden ebb or flow wave or wavelet of the babel sea which weltered up and down every street a shrill female voice informed them from an upper window that alexander's church was not on fire at all that she had gone to the top of the house as they might have gone if they had not been fools etc etc and that it looked as safe and as ugly as ever 
wherewith a brick bat or two having been sent up in an answer she shut the blinds leaving them to halt inquire discover gradually and piecemeal after the method of mobs they had been following the nature of mobs that no one had seen the church on fire or seen any one else who had seen the same or even seen any light in the sky in any quarter or knew who raised the cry or or in short alexander's church was two miles off if it was on fire it was either burned down or saved by this time if not the night air was to say the least chilly and whether it was or not there were ambuscades of jews sudden only knew how strong in every street between them and it might it not be better to secure their two prisoners and then ask for further orders from the archbishop wherewith after the manners of mobs they melted off the way they came by twos and trees till those of a contrary opinion began to find themselves left alone and having a strong dislike to jewish daggers were fain to follow the stream with a panic or two a cry of the jews are on us and a general rush in every direction in which one or two seeking shelter from the awful nothing in neighbouring houses were handed over to the watch as burglars and sent to the quarries accordingly they reached the serapium and there found of course a counter-mob collected to inform that they had been taken in that alexander's church had never been on fire at all that the jews had murdered a thousand christians at least though three dead bodies including the poor priest who lay in the house within were all of the thousand who had yet been seen and that the whole jews carter was marching upon them at which news it was considered advisable to retreat into the archbishop's house as quickly as possible barricade the doors and prepare for a siege a work at which philemon performed prodigies cheering woodwork from the rooms and stones from the parapets before it struck some of the more sober-minded that it was as well to wait for some more decided demonstration of attack before incurring so heavy a carpenter's bill of repairs at last the heavy tramp of footsteps was heard coming down the street and every window was crowded in an instant with eager heads while peter rushed downstairs to hit the large coppers having some experience in the defensive virtues of boiling water the bright moon glittered on a long line of helmets and cuirasses thank heaven it was the soldiery are the jews coming is the city quiet why did not you prevent this villainy a thousand citizens murdered while you have been snoring and a volley of similar ejaculations greeted the soldiers as they passed and were answered by a call to your purchase and sleep you noisy chickens or we'll set the coop on fire about your ears a yell of defiance answered this polite speech and the soldiery who knew perfectly well that the unarmed ecclesiastic within were not to be trifled with and had no ambition to die by coping stones and hot water went quietly on their way all danger was now past and the cackling rose jubilant louder than ever and might have continued till daylight had not a window in the courtyard been suddenly thrown open and the awful voice of cyril commanded silence every man sleep where he can i shall want you at daybreak the superiors of the parabolani are to come up to me with the two prisoners and the men who took them in a few minutes philemon found himself with some twenty others in the great man's presence he was sitting at his desk writing quietly small notes on slips of paper here is the youth who helped me to pursue the murderer and having outrun me was attacked by the prisoners said peter my hands are clean from blood i thank the lord three sat on me with daggers said philemon apologetically and i was forced to take this one's dagger away and beat off the two others with it cyril smiled and shook his head thou art a brave boy but hast thou not read if a man smite thee on one cheek turn to him the other i could not run away as must peter and the rest did so you run away eh my worthy friend it is not written asked peter in his blandest tone if they persecute you in one city flee on to the other cyril smiled again and why could not you run away boy philemon blushed scarlet but he dared not lie there was a um, a poor black woman wounded and trodden down and i dare not leave her for she told me she was a christian right my son right i shall remember this what was her name i did not hear it stay i think she said 
judith ah the wife of the porter who stands at the lecture room door which got confound a devout woman full of good works and sorely ill-treated by her heathen husband peter thou shalt go to her to-morrow with a physician and see if she is in need of anything boy thou hast done well cyril never forgets now bring up those jews the rabbis were with me two hours ago promising peace and this is the way they have kept their promise so be it the wicked is snared in his own wickedness the jews were brought up but kept a stubborn silence your holiness perceives said someone that they have each of them rings of green palm bark on their right hand a very dangerous sign an evident conspiracy commented peter ah what does that mean you rascals answer me as you value your lives you have no business with us we are jews and none of your people said one sulkily none of my people you have murdered my people none of my people every soul in alexandria is mine if the kingdom of god means anything and you shall find it out i shall not argue with you my good friends any more than i did with your rabbis take these fellows away peter and lock them up in the fuel cellar and see that they are guarded if any man lets them go his life shall be for the life of them and the two worthies were let out now my brothers here are your orders you will divide these notes among yourselves and distribute them to trusty and godly catholics in your districts wait one hour till the city be quiet and then start and raise the church i must have thirty thousand men by sunrise what for your holiness asked the dozen voices read your notes whosoever will fight to-morrow under the banner of the lord shall have free plunder of the jews carter outrage and murder only forbidden as i have said it god do so to me and more also if there be a jew left in alexandra by to-morrow at noon go and the staff of orderlies filed out thanking heaven that they had a leader so prompt and valiant and spent the next hour over the whole fire eating millet cakes drinking bad beer likening cyril to barak gideon samson jephthah judas Maccabeus, and all the worthies of the old testament and then started on their pacific errand philemon was about to follow them when cyril stopped him stay my son you are young and rash and you do not know the city lie down here and sleep in the anteroom three hours hence the sun rises and we go forth against the enemies of the lord philemon threw himself on the floor in a corner and slumbered like a child till he was awakened in the gray dawn by one of the parabolani up boy and see what we can do cyril goes down greater than barak the son of abinoam not with ten but with thirty thousand men at his feet ah my brothers said cyril as he passed proudly out in full pontificals with a gorgeous retinue of priests and deacons the catholic church has her organization her unity her common cause her watchwords such as the tyrants of the earth in their weakness and their divisions may envy and tremble at but cannot imitate could orestes raise in three hours thirty thousand men who would die for him as we will for you shouted many voices say for the kingdom of god and he passed out and so ended philemon's first day in alexandria end of chapter five Chapter Six of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Stevens. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter Six: The New Diogenes. About five o'clock the next morning, Raphael Aben Ezra was lying in bed alternately yawning over a manuscript of philo judaeus pulling the ears of his huge british mastiff watching the sparkle of the fountain in the court outside wondering when that lazy boy would come and tell him that the bath was warmed and meditating half aloud alas poor me 
Here I am, back again, just at the point from which I started. How am I to get free from that heathen siren? Plagues on her. I shall end by falling in love with her. I don't know that I have not got a barb of the blind boy in me already. I felt absurdly glad the other day when that fool told me he dare not accept her modest offer. Ha! Ha! A delicious joke it would have been to have seen Orestes bowing down to stocks and stones, and Hypatia installed in the ruins of the Serapeum, as high priestess of the abomination of desolation. And now? Well, I call all heaven and earth to witness that I have fought valiantly. I have faced naughty little Eros like a man, rod in hand. What could a poor human being do more than try to marry her to someone else, in hopes of sickening himself on the whole matter? Well, every moth has its candle, and every man his destiny. But the daring of the little fool! What huge imaginations she has! She might be another Zenobia now, with Orestes as Odonatus, and Raphael Aben Ezra, to play the part of Longinus, and receive Longinus's salary of axe or poison. She don't care for me. She would sacrifice me or a thousand of me, the cold-blooded fanatical archangel that she is, to water with our blood the foundation of some new temple of cast rags and broken dolls. Oh, Raphael Aben Ezra, what a fool you are! You know you are going off as usual to her lecture this very morning. At this crisis of his confessions, the page entered and announced, not the bath, but Miriam, the old woman who, in virtue of her profession, had the private entry of all fashionable chambers in Alexandria, came in hurriedly, and instead of seating herself as usual for a gossip, remained standing, and motioned the boy out of the room. "'Well, my sweet mother, sit. Ah, I see. You rascal, you have brought in no wine for the lady. Don't you know her little ways yet?' "'Eos has got it at the door, of course.' answered the boy, with a saucy air of offended virtue. "'Out with you, imp of Satan!' cried Miriam. "'This is no time for wine-bibbing. Raphael Aben Ezra, why are you lying here? Did you not receive a note last night?' "'A note? So I did, but I was too sleepy to read it. There it lies. Boy, bring it here. What's this? A scrap out of Jeremiah? Arise and flee for thy life, for evil is determined against the whole house of Israel.' "'Does this come from the chief rabbi? "'I always took the venerable father for a sober man. "'Eh, Miriam?' "'Fool! "'Instead of laughing at the sacred words of the prophets, "'get up and obey them. "'I sent you the note. "'Why can't I obey them in bed? "'Here I am, reading hard at the Kabbalah, "'or Philo, who is stupider still. "'And what more would you have?' "'The old woman, unable to restrain her impatience, "'literally ran at him, gnashing her teeth, "'and before he was aware, dragged him out of bed upon the floor, where he stood meekly wondering what would come next. "'Many thanks, mother, for having saved me the one daily torture of life, getting out of bed by one's own exertion. "'Raphael Aben Ezra, are you so besotted with your philosophy and your heathenry, and your laziness, and your contempt for God and man, that you will see your nation given up for a prey, and your wealth plundered by heathen dogs?' I tell you, Cyril has sworn that God shall do so to him, and more also, if there be a Jew left in Alexandra by to-morrow about this time. So much the better for the Jews, then, if they are half as tired of this noisy pandemonium as I am. But how can I help it? Am I Queen Esther, to go to Ahasuerus there in the prefect's palace, and get him to hold out the golden sceptre to me? Fool! If you had read that note last night, you might have gone and saved us, and your name would have been handed down for ever, from generation to generation, as a second Mordecai. My dear mother, Ahasuerus would have been either fast asleep or far too drunk to listen to me. Why did you not go yourself? Do you suppose that I would not have gone if I could? Do you fancy me a sluggard like yourself? At the risk of my life I have got hither in time, if there be time to save you. Well, shall I dress? What can be done now? Nothing. The streets are blockaded by Cyril's mob. There! Do you hear the shouts and screams? They are attacking the farther part of the quarter already. What, are they murdering them? asked Raphael, throwing on his police. Because if it has really come to a practical joke of that kind, I shall have the greatest pleasure in employing a counter-irritant. Here, boy, my sword and dagger, quick! No, the hypocrites! 
No blood is to be shed, they say, if we make no resistance and let them pillage. Cyril and his monks are there to prevent outrage and so forth. The angel of the Lord scatter them. The conversation was interrupted by the rushing in of the whole household, in an agony of terror, and Raphael, at last thoroughly roused, went to a window which looked into the street. The thoroughfare was full of scolding women and screaming children, while men, old and young, looked on at the plunder of their property with true Jewish doggedness, too prudent to resist, but too manful to complain, while furniture came flying out of every window, and from door after door poured a stream of rascality, carrying off money, jewels, silks, and all the treasures which Jewish usury had accumulated during many a generation. But unmoved amid the roaring sea of plunderers and plundered, stood, scattered up and down, Cyril's spiritual police, enforcing by a word an obedience which the Roman soldiers could only have compelled by hard blows of the spear-butt. There was to be no outrage, and no outrage there was, and more than once some man in priestly robes hurried through the crowd, leading by the hand, tenderly enough, a lost child in search of its parents. Raphael stood watching silently, while Miriam, who had followed him upstairs, paced the room in an ecstasy of rage, calling vainly to him to speak or act. "'Let me alone, mother,' he said at last. "'It will be full ten minutes more before they pay me a visit, and in the meantime what can one do better than watch the progress of this, the little exodus? Not like that first one. Then we went forth with symbols and songs to the Red Sea Triumph.' Then we borrowed every woman of her neighbour, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And now we pay them back again. It is but fair, after all. We ought to have listened to Jeremiah a thousand years ago, and never gone back again, like fools, into a country to which we were so deeply in debt. "'A cursed land!' cried Miriam. "'In an evil hour our forefathers disobeyed the prophet, and now we reap the harvest of our sins.' Our sons have forgotten the faith of their forefathers for the philosophy of the Gentiles, and fill their chambers, with a contemptuous look round, with heathen imagery, and our daughters are, look there! As she spoke, a beautiful girl rushed shrieking out of an adjoining house, followed by some half-drunk ruffian, who was clutching at the gold chains and trinkets with which she was profusely bedecked, after the fashion of Jewish women. The rascal had just seized with one hand her streaming black tresses, and with the other a heavy collar of gold, which was wound round her throat, when a priest, stepping up, laid a quiet hand upon his shoulder. The fellow, too maddened to obey, turned and struck back the restraining arm, and in an instant was felled to the earth by a young monk. "'Touchest thou the Lord's anointed, sacrilegious wretch?' cried the man of the desert, as the fellow dropped on the pavement with his booty in his hand. The monk tore the gold necklace from his grasp, looked at it for a moment with childish wonder, as a savage might at some incomprehensible product of civilised industry, and then, spitting on it in contempt, dashed it on the ground, and trampled it into the mud. "'Follow the golden wedge of Achan, and the silver of Iscariot, thou root of all evil!' And he rushed on, yelling, "'Down with the circumcision! Down with the blasphemers!' while the poor girl vanished among the crowd. Raphael watched him with a quaint, thoughtful smile, while Miriam shrieked aloud at the destruction of the precious trumpery. "'The monk is right, mother. If those Christians go upon that method, they must beat us. It has been our ruin from the first, our fancy for loading ourselves with the thick clay.' "'What will you do?' cried Miriam, clutching him by the arm. "'What will you do?' I am safe. I have a boat waiting for me on the canal at the garden gate, and in Alexandria I stay. No Christian hound shall make old Miriam move a foot against her will. My jewels are all buried. My girls are sold. Save what you can, and come with me. My sweet mother, why so peculiarly solicitous about my welfare, above that of all the sons of Judah? Because, because, no, I'll tell you that another time. But I loved your mother, and she loved me. Come. Raphael relapsed into silence for a few minutes, and watched the tumult below. "'How those Christian priests keep their men in order! There is no use resisting destiny. They are the strong men of the time, after all, and the little exodus must needs have its course. Miriam, daughter of Jonathan, I am no man's daughter. I have neither father nor mother, husband nor—call me mother again. 
whatsoever I am to call you, there are jewels enough in that closet to buy half Alexandria. Take them. I am going. With me! Out into the wide world, my dear lady. I am bored with riches. That young savage of a monk understood them better than we Jews do. I shall just make a virtue of necessity, and turn beggar. Beggar? Why not? Don't argue. These scoundrels will make me one, whether I like it or not. So forth I go. There will be few leave-takings. This brute of a dog is the only friend I have on earth, and I love her, because she has the true old, dogged, spiteful, cunning, obstinate Maccabee spirit in her, of which if we had a spark left in us just now, there would be no little exodus. Eh, hey, Bran, my beauty? You can escape with me to the prefects, and save the mass of your wealth. Exactly what I don't want to do. I hate that prefect as I hate a dead camel, or the vulture who eats him. And to tell the truth, I am growing a great deal too fond of that heathen woman there. What? shrieked the old woman. I pat ya. If you choose. At all events, the easiest way to cut the knot is to expatriate. I shall beg my passage on board the first ship to Cyrene, and go and study life in Italy with Heraclean's expedition. Quick, take the jewels and breed fresh troubles for yourself with them. I am going. My liberators are battering the outer door already. Miriam greedily tore out of the closet diamonds and pearls, rubies and emeralds, and concealed them among her ample robes. "'Go! Go! Escape from her! I will hide your jewels!' "'Ay, hide them as Mother Earth does all things, in that all-embracing bosom. You will have doubled them before we meet again, no doubt. Farewell, Mother. But not for ever, Raphael, not for ever. Promise me in the name of the four archangels that if you are in trouble or danger you will write to me, at the house of Eudaemon. The little porter philosopher who hangs about Hypatia's lecture-room. The same, the same. He will give me your letter, and I swear to you I will cross the mountains of Caf to deliver you. I will pay you all back. By Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I swear. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not account you for the last penny. Don't commit yourself to rash promises, my dear lady. If I am bored with poverty, I can but borrow a few gold pieces of a rabbi and turn peddler. I really do not trust you to pay me back, so I shall not be disappointed if you do not. Why should I? Because, because, oh, God, no, never mind, you shall have all back. Spirit of Elias, where is the blacker gate? Why is it not among these, the broken half of the blacker gate talisman? Raphael turned pale. How did you know that I have a blacker gate? How did I, how did I not? cried she, clutching him by the arm. Where is it? All depends on that. Fool! she went on, throwing him off from her at arm's length, as a sudden suspicion stung her. You have not given it to the heathen woman. By the soul of my father's, then, you mysterious old witch, you seem to know everything. That is exactly what I have done. Miriam clapped her hands together wildly. Lost! 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 Not I will have it if I tear it out of her heart. I will be avenged of her, the strange woman who flatters with her words, to whom the simple go in, and know not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. God do so to me, and more also, if she and her sorceries be on earth at twelve months hence. Silence, Jezebel. Heathen or none, she is as pure as the sunlight. I only gave it to her because she fancied the talisman upon it. To enchant you with it, to your ruin! Brute of a slave-dealer, you fancy every one as base as the poor wretches whom you buy and sell to shame, that you may make them as much the children of hell, if that be possible, as yourself. Miriam looked at him, her large black eyes widening and kindling. For an instant she felt for her poniard, and then burst into an agony of tears, hid her face in her withered hands, and rushed from the room, as a crash and shout below announced the bursting of the door. There she goes with my jewels, and here come my guests, with the young monk at their head, one rising when the other sets, a worthy pair of Dioscuri. Come, Bran, boys, slaves, where are you? Steal every one what he can lay his hands on, and run for your lives through the back gate. The slaves had obeyed him already. He walked smiling downstairs through utter solitude, and in the front passage met face to face the mob of monks, costermongers, and dock-workers, fishwives and beggars, who were thronging up the narrow entry, and bursting into the doors right and left, and at their head, alas, the young monk who had just trampled the necklace into the mud, no other, in fact, than Philemon. 
Welcome, my worthy guests. Enter, I beseech you, and fulfil in your own peculiar way the precepts which bid you not be over-anxious for the good things of this life. For eating and drinking, my kitchen and cellar are at your service. For clothing, if any illustrious personage will do me the honour to change his holy rags with me, here are an Indian shawl police and a pair of silk trousers at his service. Perhaps you will accommodate me, my handsome young captain, corrugus of this new school of the prophets. Philemon, who was the person addressed, tried to push by him contemptuously. "'Allow me, sir, I lead the way. This dagger is poisoned, a scratch, and you are dead. This dog is of the true British breed. If she seizes you, red-hot iron will not loose her, till she hears the bone crack. If any one will change clothes with me, all I have is at your service. If not, the first that stirs is a dead man.' There was no mistaking the quiet, high-bred determination of the speaker. Had he raged and blustered, Philemon could have met him on his own ground. But there was an easy self-possessed disdain about him, which utterly abashed the young monk, and abashed, too, the whole crowd of rascals at his heels. "'I'll change clothes with you, you Jewish dog!' roared a dirty fellow out of the mob. "'I am your eternal debtor. Let us step into this side-room. Walk upstairs, my friends.' "'Take care there, sir. That porcelain hole is worth three thousand gold pieces. Broken, it is not worth three pence. I leave it to your good sense to treat it accordingly. Now then, my friend,' and in the midst of the raging vortex of plunderers, who were snatching up everything which they could carry away, and breaking everything which they could not, he quietly divested himself of his finery, and put on the ragged cotton tunic and battered straw hat which the fellow handed over to him. Philemon, who had had from the first no mind to plunder, stood watching Raphael with dumb wonder, and a shudder of regret, he knew not why, passed through him, as he saw the mob tearing down pictures and dashing statues to the ground. Heathen they were, doubtless, but still the nymphs and venuses looked too lovely to be so brutally destroyed. There was something almost humanly pitiful in their poor broken arms and legs, as they lay about upon the pavement. He laughed at himself for the notion, but he could not laugh it away. Raphael seemed to think that he ought not to laugh it away, for he pointed to the fragments, and with a quaint look at the young monk, "'Our nurses used to tell us, if you can't make it, you ought not to break it.' "'I had no nurse,' said Philemon. "'Ah, that accounts for this and other things. Well,' he went on, with the most provoking good nature, you are in a fair road, my handsome youth. I wish you joy of your fellow workmen, and of your apprenticeship in the noble art of monkery. Riot and pillage, shrieking women, and houseless children, in your twentieth summer, are the sure path to a saintship such as Paul of Tarsus, who with all his eccentricities was a gentleman, certainly never contemplated. I have heard of Phoebus Apollo under many disguises, but this is the first time I ever saw him in the wolf's hide. "'Or in the lions,' said Philemon, trying in his shame to make a fine speech. "'Like the ass in the fable. Farewell. Stand out of the way, friends. Wear teeth and poison.' And he disappeared among the crowd, who made way respectfully enough for his dagger and his brindled companion. End of chapter 6「Hypatia」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole, Midway, Massachusetts. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 7. Those by whom offences come. Part 1. Philammon's heart smote him all that day, whenever he thought of his morning's work. Till then all Christians, monks above all, had been infallible in his eyes, all Jews and heathens insane and accursed. Moreover, meekness under insult, fortitude in calamity, the contempt of worldly comfort, the worship of poverty as a noble estate, were virtues which the Catholic Church boasted as her peculiar heritage. 
on which side had the balance of those qualities inclined that morning. The figure of Raphael, stalking out ragged and penniless into the wild world, haunted him, with its quiet self-assured smile, and there haunted him, too, another peculiarity in the man, which he had never before remarked in any one but Arsenius, that ease and grace, that courtesy and self-restraint, which made Raphael's rebukes rankle all the more keenly, because he felt that the rebuker was in some mysterious way superior to him, and saw through him, and could have won him over, or crushed him in argument or intrigue, or in anything, perhaps, except mere brute force. Strange, that Raphael of all men, should in those few moments have reminded him so much of Arsenius, and that the very same qualities which gave a peculiar charm to the latter should give a peculiar unloveliness to the former, and yet be, without a doubt, the same. What was it? Was it rank which gave it? Arsenius had been a great man he knew, the companion of kings, and Raphael seemed rich. He had heard the mob crying out against the prefect for favouring him. Was it then familiarity with the great ones of the world which produced this manner and tone? It was a real strength, whether in Arsenius or in Raphael. He felt humbled before it, envied it. If it made Arsenius a more complete and more captivating person, why should it not do the same for him? Why should not he, too, have his share of it. Bringing with it such thoughts as these, the time ran on till noon, and the midday meal, and the afternoon's work, to which Philammon looked forward joyfully, as a refuge from his own thoughts. He was sitting on his sheepskin upon a step, basking like a true son of the desert, in a blaze of fiery sunshine, which made the black stone work too hot to touch with a bare hand, watching the swallows as they threaded the columns of the Serapium, and thinking how often he had delighted in their air-dance, as they turned and hawked up and down the dear old glen of Scetis. A crowd of citizens with causes, appeals, and petitions were passing in and out from the patriarch's audience-room. Peter and the archdeacon were waiting in the shade close by for the gathering of the Parabolani and talking over the morning's work in an earnest whisper, in which the names of Hypatia and Orestes were now and then audible. An old priest came up, and bowing reverently enough to the archdeacon, requested the help of one of the Parabolani. He had a sailor's family, all fever-stricken, who must be removed to the hospital at once. The archdeacon looked at him, answered an off-hand very well, and went on with his talk. The priest, bowing lower than before, represented the immediate necessity of help. It is very odd, said Peter, to the swallows in the Serapium, that some people cannot obtain influence enough in their own parishes to get the simplest good works performed without tormenting his holiness the patriarch. The old priest mumbled some sort of excuse, and the archdeacon, without deigning a second look at him, said, "'Find him a man, Brother Peter. Anybody will do. What is that boy, Philammon, doing there? Let him go with Master Hierakas. Peter seemed not to receive the proposition favourably, and whispered something to the archdeacon. "'No, I can spare none of the rest. Importunate persons must take their chance of being well served. Come!' Here are our brethren, we will all go together. The farther together, the better for the boy's sake, grumbled Peter, loud enough for Philammon, perhaps for the old priest, to overhear him. So Philammon went out with them, and as he went, questioned his companions, meekly enough as to who Raphael was. A friend of a Hypatia. That name, too, haunted him, and he began as stealthily and indirectly as he could, to obtain information about her. There was no need for his caution, for the very mention of her name roused the whole party into a fury of execration. 
May God confound her, siren, enchantress, dealer in spells and sorceress. She is the strange woman of whom Solomon prophesied. It is my opinion, said another, that she is the forerunner of Antichrist. Perhaps the virgin of whom it is prophesied that he will be born, suggested another. Not that I'll warrant her, said Peter, with a savage sneer. And is Raphael Aben Ezra her pupil in philosophy, asked Philammon. Her pupil in whatsoever she can find, wherewith to delude men's souls, said the old priest. The reality of philosophy has died long ago, but the great ones find it still worth their while to worship its shadow. Some of them worship more than a shadow when they haunt her house, said Peter. Do you think Orestes goes thither only for philosophy? We must not judge harsh judgments, said the old priest. Synesius of Cyrene is a holy man, and yet he loves Hypatia well. He a holy man, and keeps a wife, one who had the insolence to tell the blessed Theophilus himself that he would not be made bishop unless he were allowed to remain with her, and despised the gift of the Holy Ghost in comparison with, of the carnal joys of wedlock, not knowing the scriptures, which saith that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well said Syracus of Rome of such men, can the Holy Spirit of God dwell in other than holy bodies? No wonder that such a one as Synesius grovels at the feet of Orestes' mistress. Then she is profligate, asked Philammon. She must be, has a heathen faith and grace, and without faith and grace are not all our righteousness as filthy rags. What says St. Paul? that God has given them over to a reprobate mind, full of all injustice, uncleanness, covetousness, maliciousness, you know the catalogue, why do you ask me? Alas, and is she this? Alas, and why alas? How would the gospel be glorified if heathens were holier than Christians? It ought to be so, therefore it is so. If she seems to have virtues, they, being done without the grace of Christ, are only bedizened vices, cunning shams, the devil transformed into an angel of light. And as for chastity, the flower and crown of all virtues, whosoever says that she, being yet a heathen, has that, blasphemes the Holy Spirit, whose peculiar and highest gift it is, and is anathema maranatha for ever. Amen. And Peter, devoutly crossing himself, turned angrily and contemptuously away from his young companion. Philammon was quite shrewd enough to see that assertion was not identical with proof. But Peter's argument of, it ought to be, therefore it is, is one which saves a great deal of trouble, and no doubt he had very good sources of information. So Philammon walked on, sad, he knew not why, at the new notion which he had formed of Hypatia, as a sort of awful sorceress, Messalina, whose den was foul with magic rites and ruined souls of men. And yet if that was all she had to teach, whence had her pupil Raphael learned that fortitude of his? If philosophy had, as they said, utterly died out, then what was Raphael? Just then, Peter and the rest turned up a side street, and Philammon and Hierakas were left to go on their joint errand together. They paced on for some way in silence, up one street and down another, till Philammon, for want of anything better to say, asked where they were going. Where I choose at all events. No, young man, if I, a priest, am to be insulted by archdeacons and readers, I won't be insulted by you. I assure you I meant no harm. Of course not. You all learn the same trick, and the young ones catch it of the old ones fast enough. Words smoother than butter, yet very swords. You do not mean to complain of the archdeacon and his companion, said Philammon, who of course was boiling over with pugnacious respect for the body to which he belonged. No answer. Why, sir? Are they not among the most holy and devoted of men? 
"'Ah, yes,' said his companion, in a tone which sounded very like, "'Ah, no.' "'You do not think so?' asked Philammon bluntly. "'You are young, you are young. "'Wait a while till you have seen as much as I have. "'A degenerate age, this, my son, "'not like the good old times, "'when men dare suffer and die for the faith. "'We are too prosperous nowadays, "'and fine ladies walk about with Magdalens "'embroidered on their silks, "'and gospels hanging around their necks. "'When I was young, they died for that, with which they now bedizen themselves. But I was speaking of the Parabolani. Ah, there are a great many among them who have not much business where they are. Don't say I said so. But many a rich man puts his name on the list of the guild just to get his exemption from taxes and leaves the work to poor men like you. Rotten, rotten, my son, and you will find it out. The preachers now people used to say, I know Abbot Isidora did, that I has as good a gift for expounding as any man in Pelusium. But since I came here eleven years since, if you will believe it, I have never been asked to preach in my own parish church. You surely jest. True as I am a christened man, I know why, I know why. They are afraid of Isidora's men here. Perhaps they may have caught the holy man's trick of plain speaking, and ears are dainty in Alexandria, and there are some in these parts, too, that have never forgiven him the part he took about those three villains, Mark, Zosimus, and Martinian, and a certain letter that came of it, or another letter either, which we know of, about taking arms for the church from the gains of robbers and usurers. Cyril never forgets. So he says to every one who does him a good turn, and so he does to every one who he fancies has done him a bad one. So here am I slaving away, a subordinate priest, while such fellows as Peter the Reader look down on me as their slave. But it's always so. There never was a bishop yet, except the blessed Augustine, would to heaven I had taken my abbot's advice, and gone to him at Hippo, who have not his flatterers and his tail-bearers, and generally the archdeacon at the head of them, ready to step into the bishop's place when he dies, over the heads of hard-working parish priests. But that is the way of the world. The sleekest and the oiliest and the noisiest, the man who can bring in most money to the charities, never mind whence or how, the man who will take most of the bishop's work off his hand, and agree with him in everything he wants, and save him, by spying and eavesdropping, the trouble of using his own eyes. That is the man to succeed in Alexandria, or Constantinople, or Rome itself. Look now. There are but seven deacons to this great city, and all its priests, and they and the archdeacon are the masters of it, and us. They and that Peter, manage Cyril's work for him, and when Cyril makes the archdeacon a bishop, he will make Peter archdeacon. They have their reward, they have their reward, and so has Cyril, for that matter. How? Why, don't say I said it. But what do I care? I have nothing to lose, I'm sure. But they do say that there are two ways of promotion in Alexandria, one by deserving it, the other by paying for it, that's all. Impossible. Oh, of course, quite impossible. But all I know is just this, that when that fellow Martinian got back again into Pelusium, after being turned out by the late bishop for a rogue and hypocrite as he was, and got the ear of this present bishop, and was appointed his steward and ordained priest, I'd as soon have ordained that street dog and plundered him and brought him to disgrace. For I don't believe this bishop is a bad man, but those who use rogues must expect to be called rogues, and ground the poor to the earth, and tyrannized over the whole city, so that no man's property or reputation, scarcely their lives, were safe. And after all, had the impudence, 
when he was called on for his accounts, to bring the church in as owing him money. I just know this, that he added to all his other shamelessness this, that he offered the patriarch a large sum of money to buy a bishopric of him. And what did you think the patriarch answered? Excommunicated the sacrilegious wretch, of course. Sent him a letter to say that if he dared to do such a thing again, he should really be forced to expose him. So the fellow, taking courage, brought his money himself the next time, and all the world says that Cyril would have made him a bishop after all, if Abbot Isidora had not written to remonstrate. He could not have known the man's character, said poor Philammon, hunting for an excuse. The whole delta was ringing with it. Isidora had written to him again and again. Surely then his wish was to prevent scandal, and preserve the unity of the church in the eyes of the heathen. The old man laughed bitterly. Ah, the old story, of preventing scandals by retaining them, and fancying that sin is a less evil than a little noise, as if the worst of all scandals was not the being discovered in hushing up a scandal. And as for unity, if you want that, you must go back to the good old days of Diocletian and Decius. The persecutors? Aye, boy! to the times of persecution, when Christians died like brothers, because they lived like brothers. You will see very little of that now, except in some little remote county bishopric, which no one ever hears of from year's end to year's end. But in the cities it is all one great fight for place and power. Every one is jealous of his neighbour. The priests are jealous of the deacons, and good cause they have. The county bishops are jealous of the Metropolitan, and he is jealous of the North African bishops, and quite right he is. What business have they to set up for themselves, as if they were infallible? It's a schism, I say, of complete schism. They are just as bad as their own Donatists. Did not the Council of Nice settle that the Metropolitan of Alexandria should have authority over Libya and Pentapolis? according to the ancient custom. Of course he ought, said Philammon, jealous for the honour of his own patriarchate. And the patriarchs of Rome and Constantinople are jealous of our patriarch. Of Cyril? Of course, because he won't be at their beck and nod, and let them be lords and masters of Africa. But surely these things can be settled by councils. Councils? Wait till you have been at one. The blessed abbot Isidora used to say that if he ever was a bishop, which he never will be, he is far too honest for that, that he would never go near one of them, for he never had seen one which did not call out every evil passion in men's hearts, and leave the question more confounded with words than they found it, even if the whole matter was not settled beforehand by some chamberlain or eunuch or cook sent from court, as if he were an anointed vessel of the Spirit, to settle the dogmas of the Holy Catholic Church. Cook! Why? Valen sent his chief cook to stop Basil of Caesarea from opposing the court doctrine. I tell you, the great battle in these cases is to get votes from courts, or to get to court yourself. When I was young, the Council of Antioch had to make a law to keep bishops from running off to Constantinople to intrigue, under pretense of pleading the cause of the orphan and widow. But what's the use of that, when every noisy and ambitious man shifts and shifts from one sea to another, till he settles himself close to Rome or Byzantium, and gets the emperor's ear, and plays into the hands of his courtiers? Is it not written, Speak not evil of dignities, said Philammon, in his most sanctimonious tone. Well, what of that? I don't speak evil of dignities when I complain of the men who fill them badly, do I? I never heard that interpretation of the text before. Very likely not. There's no reason why it should not be true in orthodox. You will soon hear a good many more things which are true enough, though whether they are orthodox or not, 
the court cooks must settle. Of course I am a disappointed, irreverent old grumbler. Of course, and of course too, young men must needs by their own experience, instead of taking old folks at a gift. There, use your own eyes and judge for yourself. There you may, you may see what sort of saints are bred by this plan of managing the Catholic Church. There comes one of them. Now I say no more. As he spoke, two tall negroes came up to them, and set down before the steps of a large church which they were passing, an object new to Philammon. A sedan-chair, the poles of which were inlaid with ivory and silver, and the upper part enclosed in rose-coloured silk curtains. "'What is inside that cage?' asked he of the old priest, as the negro stood wiping the perspiration from their foreheads, and a smart slave-girl stepped forward, with a parasol and slippers in her hand, and reverently lifted the lower edge of the curtain. "'A saint, I tell you. An embroidered shoe, with a large gold cross on the instep, was put forth delicately from beneath the curtain, and the kneeling maid put on the slipper over it. There, whispered the old grumbler, not enough, you see, to use Christian men as beasts of burden, Abbot Isidora used to say, I, and told Iron, the pleader to his face, that he could not conceive how a man who loved Christ, and knew the grace which has made all men free, could keep a slave. Nor can I, said Philammon. But we think otherwise, you see, in Alexandria here. We can't even walk up the steps of God's temple without an additional protection to our delicate feet. I had thought it was written, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Aye, and there are a good many more things written which we do not find it convenient to recollect. Look, there is one of the pillars of the church, the richest and most pious lady in Alexandria. End of chapter 7, part 1「Hypatia」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 7 Those by Whom Offences Come. Part 2 and forth stepped a figure, at which Philammon's eyes opened wider than they had done even at the sight of Pelagia. Whatever thoughts the rich and careless grace of her attire might have raised in his mind, it had certainly not given his innate Greek good taste the inclination to laugh and weep at once, which he felt at this specimen of the tasteless fashion of an artificial and decaying civilization. Her gown was stuffed out behind, in a fashion which provoked from the dirty boys who lay about the steps gambling for pistachios on their fingers, the same comments with which St. Clement had upbraided from the pulpit the Alexandrian ladies of his day. The said gown of white silk was bedizened from waist to ankle with certain mysterious red and green figures, at least a foot long, which Philammon gradually discovered to be a representation, in the very lowest and ugliest style of fallen art, of Dives and Lazarus, while down her back hung, upon a bright blue shawl, edged with embroidered crosses, Job sitting, potsherd in hand, surrounded by his three friends. A memorial, the old priest whispered, of a pilgrimage which she had taken a year or two before to Arabia to see and kiss the identical dunghill on which the patriarch had sat. Round her neck hung, by one of half a dozen necklaces, a manuscript of the Gospels, gilt-edged and clasped with jewels. The lofty diadem of pearls on the head carried in front a large gold cross, while above and around it her hair, 
stiffened with pomatum, was frizzled out half a foot from a wilderness of plaits and curls, which must have cost some hapless slave-girl an hour's work, and perhaps more than one scolding, that very morning. Meekly, with simpering face and downcast eyes, and now and then a penitent sigh and shake of the head, and pressure of her hand on her jewelled bosom, the fair penitent was proceeding up the steps, when she caught sight of the priest and the monk, and turning to them, with an obeisance of the deepest humility, entreated to be allowed to kiss the hem of their garments. "'You had far better, madam,' said Philammon, bluntly enough, "'kiss the hem of your own. "'You carry two lessons there, which you do not seem to have learnt yet.' In an instant her face flashed up into pride and fury. "'I asked for your blessing, and not for a sermon. "'I can have that when I like.' "'And such as you like,' grumbled the old priest, as she swept up the steps, tossing some small coin to the ragged boys, and murmuring to herself, loud enough for Philammon's hearing, that she should certainly inform the confessor, and that she would not be insulted in the streets by savage monks. Now she will confess her sins inside, all but those which she has been showing off to us here outside, and beat her breast, and weep like a very maudlin, and then the worthy man will comfort her with, what a beautiful chain, and what a shawl, allow me to touch it. How soft and delicate this Indian wool! Ah! If you knew the debts which I have been compelled to occur in the service of the sanctuary, and then of course the answer will be, as indeed he expects it should, that if it can be of the least use in the services of the temple, she of course will think it only too great an honour, and he will keep the chain, and perhaps the shawl too, and she will go home, believing that she has fulfilled to the very letter the command to break off her sins by alms-giving, and only sorry that the good priest happened to hit on that particular jew What? asked Philammon. Dare she actually not refuse such importunity? From a poor priest like me, stoutly enough but from a popular ecclesiastic like him. As Jerome says, in a letter of his I once saw, ladies think twice in such cases, before they offend the city newsmonger. Have you anything more to say? Philammon had nothing to say, and wisely held his peace, while the old grumbler ran on. Ah, boy, you have yet to learn city fashions. When you are a little older, Instead of speaking unpleasant truth to a fine lady, with a cross on her forehead, you will be ready to run to the pillars of Hercules at her beck and nod, for the sake of her disinterested help towards a fashionable pulpit, or perhaps a bishopric. The lady settled that for us here. The women? The women, lad. Do you suppose that they heap priests and churches with wealth for nothing? They have their reward. Do you suppose that a preacher gets into the pulpit of that church there, without looking anxiously, at the end of each peculiarly flowery sentence, to see whether her saintship there is clapping or not? She, who has such a delicate sense for orthodoxy, that she can scent out Novartianism or Oregonism, where no other mortal nose would suspect it, she who meets at her own house weekly, all the richest and most pious women of the city, to settle our discipline for us, as the court cooks do our doctrine. She who has even, it is whispered, the ear of the Augusta Pulcheria herself, and sends monthly letters to her at Constantinople, and might give the patriarch himself some trouble if he crossed her holy will. What? Will Cyril truckle to such creatures? Cyril is a wise man in his generation, too wise, some say, for a child of the light. But at least he knows there is no use fighting with those whom you cannot conquer, and while he can get money out of these great ladies for his almshouses and orphan-houses and lodging-houses and hospitals and workshops and all the rest of it, 
and in that I will say for him, there is no man on earth equal to him, but Ambrose of Milan and Basil of Caesarea. Why, I don't quarrel with him for making the best of a bad matter. And a very bad matter it is, boy, and has been ever since emperors and courtiers have given up burning and crucifying us, and taken to patronizing and bribing us instead. Philammon walked on in silence by the old priest's side, stunned and sickened. And this is what I have come out to see, reeds shaken in the wind, and men clothed in soft raiment, fit only for king's palaces. For this he had left the dear old Laura, and the simple joys and friendships of childhood, and cast himself into a roaring whirlpool of labour and temptation. This was the harmonious strength and unity of that church Catholic, in which, as he had been taught from boyhood, there was but one Lord, one faith, one spirit. This was the indivisible body, without spot or wrinkle, which fitly joined together and compacted by that which every member supplied, according to the effectual and proportionate working of every part, increased the body, and enabled it to build itself up in love. He shuddered as the well-known words passed through his memory, and seemed to mock the base and chaotic reality around him. He felt angry with the old man for having broken his dream. He longed to believe that his complaints were only exaggerations of cynic peevishness, of selfish disappointment, and yet had not Arsenius warned him. Had he not foretold word for word what the youth would find, what he had found? Then was St. Paul's great idea an empty and an impossible dream? No, God's word could not fail, the church could not err. The fault could not be in her, but in her enemies. Not as the old man said, in her too great prosperity, but in her slavery. And then the words which he had heard from Cyril at their first interview rose before him as the true explanation. How could the church work freely and healthily, while she was crushed and fettered by the rulers of this world? And how could they be anything but the tyrants and antichrists they were, while they were menaced and deluded by heathen philosophy and vain systems of human wisdom? If Orestes was the curse of the Alexandrian church, then the Hypatia was the curse of Orestes. On her head the true blame lay. She was the root of the evil. Who could extirpate it? Why should not he? It might be dangerous, yet, successful or unsuccessful, it must be glorious. The course of Christianity wanted great examples. Might he not, and his young heart beat high at the thought, might he not, by some great act of daring, self-sacrifice, divine madness of faith, like David's of old, when he went out against the giant, awaken selfish and luxurious souls to a noble emulation, and recall to their minds, perhaps to their lives, the patterns of those martyrs who were the pride, the glory, the heirloom of Egypt. And as figure after figure rose before his imagination, of simple men and weak women, who had conquered temptation and shame, torture and death, to live for ever on the lips of men, and take their seats among the patricians of the heavenly court, with brows glittering through all eternities, with a martyr's crown, his heart beat thick and fast, and he longed only for an opportunity to dare and die and the longing begot the opportunity. For he had hardly rejoined his brother visitors when the absorbing thought took word again, and he began questioning them eagerly for more information about Hypatia. On that point, indeed, he obtained nothing but fresh invective. But when his companions, after talking of the triumph which the true faith had gained that morning, went on to speak of the great overthrow of paganism twenty years before, under the patriarch Theophilus, 
of Olympiodorus and his mob, who held a Serapium for many days by force of arms against the Christians, making sallies into the city, and torturing and murdering the prisoners whom they took, of the martyrs who, among those very pillars which overhung their heads, had died in torments rather than sacrifice to Serapis, and of the final victory, and the soldier who, in presence of the trembling mob, clove the great jaw of the colossal idol, and snapped for ever the spell of heathenism. Philammon's heart burned to distinguish himself like that soldier, and to wipe out his qualms of conscience by some more unquestionable deed of Christian prowess. There were no idols now to break, but there was philosophy. Why not carry war into the heart of the enemy's camp, and be at Satan in his very den? Why does not some man of God go boldly into the lecture-room of the sorceress, and testify against her to her face? Do it yourself, if you dare, said Peter. We have no wish to get our brains knocked out by all the profligate young gentlemen in the city. I will do it, said Philammon. That is, if his holiness allows you to make such a fool of yourself. Take care, sir, of your words. You revile the blessed martyrs, from St. Stephen to St. Telemachus, when you call such a deed foolishness. I shall most certainly inform his holiness of your insolence. Do so, said Philammon, who, possessed with a new idea, wished for nothing more. And there the matter dropped for the time. The presumption of the young in this generation is growing insufferable, said Peter, to his master that evening. So much the better. They put their elders on their mettle in the race of good works. But who has been presuming to-day? That mad boy whom Pambo sent up from the deserts dared to offer himself as champion of the faith against Hypatia. He actually proposed to go into her lecture-room and argue with her to her face. What think you of that for a specimen of youthful modesty and self-distrust? Cyril was silent a while. What answer am I to have the honour of taking back? A month's relegation to Nitria on bread and water. You, I am sure, will not allow such things to go unpunished. Indeed, if they do, there is an end to all authority and discipline. Cyril was still silent, whilst Peter's brow clouded fast. At last he answered, The cause wants martyrs. Send the boy to me. Peter went down with a shrug, and an expression of face, which looked but too like envy, and ushered up the trembling youth, who dropped on his knees as soon as he entered. So you wish to go into the heathen woman's lecture-room and defy her. Have you courage for it? God will give it to me. You will be murdered by her pupils. I can defend myself, said Philammon with a pardonable glance downward at his sinewy limbs. And if not, what death more glorious than martyrdom? Cyril smiled genially enough. Promise me two things. Two thousand, if you will. Two are quite difficult enough to keep. Youth is rash in promises and rasher in forgetting them. Promise me that, whatever happens, you will not strike the first blow. I do. Promise me again that you will not argue with her. What then? Contradict, denounce, defy. But give no reasons. If you do, you are lost. She is subtler than a serpent, skilled in all the tricks of logic, and you will become a laughing-stock, and run away in shame. Promise me. I do. Then go. When? The sooner the better. At what hour does the accursed woman lecture to-morrow, Peter? We saw her going to the museum at nine this morning. Then go at nine to-morrow. There is money for you. What is this for? asked Philammon, fingering curiously the first coins which he ever had handled in his life. To pay for your entrance. To the philosopher none enters without money. Not so to the church of God, open all day long to the beggar and the slave. If you convert her, well, and if not, 
and he added to himself between his teeth, and if not, well also, perhaps better. I said Peter bitterly, as he ushered Philammon out, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, young fool. What evil spirit sent you here to feed the noble patriarch's only weakness? What do you mean? asked Philammon, as fiercely as he dare. The fancy that preachings and protestations and martyrdoms can drive out the Canaanites, who can only be got rid of with the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. His uncle Theophilus knew that well enough. If he had not, Olympiodorus might have been master of Alexandria, an incense burning before Serapis to this day. I go, and let her convert you. Touch the accursed thing like Aachen, and see if you do not end by having it in your tent. Keep company with the daughters of Midian, and see if you do not join yourself to Baal poor, and eat the offerings of the dead. And with this encouraging sentence, the two parted for the night. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight, Part One of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter Eight, The East Wind, Part One. As Hypatia went forth the next morning, in all her glory, with a crowd of philosophers and philofasters, students and fine gentlemen, following her in reverend admiration across the street to her lecture-room, a ragged beggar-man, accompanied by a huge and villainous-looking dog, planted himself right before her, and extending a dirty hand, whined for an alms. Hypatia, whose refined taste could never endure the sight, much less the contact, of anything squalid and degraded, recoiled a little, and bade the attendant slave get rid of the man with a coin. Several of the younger gentlemen, however, considered themselves adepts in that noble art of upsetting, then in vogue in the African universities, to which we all have reason enough to be thankful, seeing that it drove St. Augustine from Carthage to Rome, and they, in compliance with the usual fashion of tormenting any simple creature who came in their way, by mystification and insult, commenced a series of personal witticisms, which the beggar bore stoically enough. The coin was offered him, but he blandly put aside the hand of the giver, and keeping his place on the pavement, seemed inclined to dispute Hypatia's farther passage. "'What do you want?' "'Send the wretch and his frightful dog away, gentlemen,' said the poor philosopher in some trepidation. "'I know that dog,' said one of them. "'It is Aban Ezra's. "'Where did you find it before it was lost, you rascal?' "'Where your mother found you when she palmed you off upon her good man, my child, in the slave market. "'Fair Sybil, have you already forgotten your humblest pupil, as these young dogs have?' who are already trying to upset their master and instructor in the angelic science of bullying. And the beggar, lifting his broad straw hat, disclosed the features of Raphael Aben Ezra. And Hypatia recoiled with a shriek of surprise. Ah, you are astonished. At what, I pray? To see you, sir, thus. Why, then? You have been preaching to us all a long time the glory of abstraction from the allurements of sense. It augurs ill, surely, for your estimate either of your pupils or of your own eloquence, if you are so struck with consternation because one of them has actually at last obeyed you. What is the meaning of this masquerade, most excellent sir? asked Hypatia, and a dozen voices beside. Ask Cyril. I am on my way to Italy in the character of the new Diogenes, to look, like him, for a man. When I have found one, I shall feel great pleasure in returning to acquaint you with the amazing news. Farewell. I wish to look once more at a certain countenance, 
though i have turned as you see cynic and intend henceforth to attend no teacher but my dog who will luckily charge no fees for instruction if she did i must go untaught for my ancestral wealth made itself wings yesterday morning you are aware doubtless of the plebiscitum against the jews which was carried into effect under the auspices of a certain holy tribune of the people infamous and dangerous my dear lady success is inspiriting and theon's house is quite as easily sacked as the jews quarter beware come come aben ezra cried the young men you are far too good company for us to lose you for that rascally patriarch's fancy we will make a subscription for you eh and you shall live with each of us month and month about we shall quite lose the trick of joking without you thank you gentlemen but really you have been my butts far too long for me to think of becoming yours madam one word in private before i go Hapadia leant forward, and, speaking in Syriac, whispered hurriedly, "'Oh, stay, sir, I beseech you. You are the wisest of my pupils, perhaps my only true pupil. My father will find some concealment for you from these wretches. And if you need money, remember, he is your debtor. We have never repaid you the gold which—' "'Fairest muse, that was but my entrance fee to Parnassus.' it is i who am in your debt and i have brought my arrears in the form of this opal ring as for shelter near you he went on lowering his voice and speaking like her in syriac hypatia the gentile is far too lovely for the peace of mind of raphael the jew and he drew from his finger miriam's ring and offered it impossible said hypatia blushing scarlet i cannot accept it i beseech you it is the last earthly burden i have except this snail's prison of flesh and blood my dagger will open a crack through that when it becomes intolerable but as i do not intend to leave my shell if i can help it except just when and how i choose and as if i take this ring with me some of heracleon's circumcellions will assuredly knock my brains out for the sake of it I must entreat. Never! Can you not sell the ring and escape to Synesius? He will give you shelter. A hospitable hurricane. Shelter, yes, but rest, none. As soon pitch my tent in the crater of Etna. Why, he will be trying day and night to convert me to that eclectic farrago of his, which he calls philosophic Christianity. Well, if you will not have the ring, it is soon disposed of. We Easterns know how to be magnificent and vanish as the lords of the world ought. And he turned to the philosophic crowd. Here, gentlemen of Alexandria, does any gay youth wish to pay his debts once and for all? Behold the rainbow of Solomon, an opal such as Alexandria never saw before, which would buy any one of you, and his Macedonian papa, and his macedonian mamma and his macedonian sisters and horses and parrots and peacocks twice over in any slave market in the world any gentleman who wishes to possess a jewel worth ten thousand gold pieces will only need to pick it out of the gutter into which i throw it scramble for it you young phaedrias and pamphili there are ladus and thedus enough about who will help you to spend it and raising the jewel on high, he was in the act of tossing it into the street, when his arm was seized from behind, and the ring snatched from his hand. He turned fiercely enough, and saw behind him, her eyes flashing fury and contempt, old Miriam. Bran sprang at the old woman's throat in an instant, but recoiled again before the glare of her eye. Raphael called the dog off, and turning quietly to the disappointed spectators, it is all right my luckless friends you must raise money for yourselves after all which since the departure of my nation will be a somewhat more difficult matter than ever the overruling destinies whom as you all know so well when you are getting tipsy not even philosophers can resist 
have restored the rainbow of solomon to its original possessor farewell queen of philosophy when i find the man you shall hear of it mother i am coming with you for a friendly word before we part though he went on laughing as the two walked away together it was a scurvy trick of you to balk one of the nation of the exquisite pleasure of seeing those heathen dogs scrambling in the gutter for his bounty hypatia went into the museum utterly bewildered by this strange meeting and its still stranger end she took care nevertheless to betray no sign of her deep interest till she found herself alone in her little waiting-room adjoining the lecture hall and there throwing herself into a chair she sat and thought till she found to her surprise and anger the tears trickling down her cheeks not that her bosom held one spark of affection for raphael if there had ever been any danger of that the wily jew had himself taken care to ward it off by the sneering and frivolous tone with which he quashed every approach to deep feeling either in himself or in others as for his compliments to her beauty she was far too much accustomed to such to be either pleased or displeased by them but she felt as she said that she had lost perhaps her only true pupil and more perhaps her only true master for she saw clearly enough that under that silenus mask was hidden a nature capable of perhaps more than she dare think of she had always felt him her superior in practical cunning and that morning had proved to her what she had long suspected that he was possibly also her superior in that moral earnestness and strength of will for which she looked in vain among the enervated greeks who surrounded her and even in those matters in which he professed himself her pupil she had long been alternately delighted by finding that he alone of all her school seemed thoroughly and instinctively to comprehend her every word and chilled by the disagreeable suspicion that he was only playing with her and her mathematics and geometry and metaphysic and dialectic like a fencer practising with foils while he reserved his real strength for some object more worthy of him more than once some paradox or question of his had shaken her neatest systems into a thousand cracks and opened up ugly depths of doubt even on the most seemingly palpable certainties or some half-jesting allusion to those hebrew scriptures the quantity and quality of his faith in which he would never confess made her indignant at the notion that he considered himself in possession of a reserved ground of knowledge deeper and surer than her own in which he did not deign to allow her to share and yet she was irresistibly attracted to him that deliberate and consistent luxury of his from which she shrank he had always boasted that he was able to put on and take off at will like a garment and now he seemed to have proved his words to be a worthy rival of the great stoics of old time could zeno himself have asked more from frail humanity moreover raphael had been of infinite practical use to her he worked out unasked her mathematical problems he looked out authorities kept her pupils in order by his bitter tongue and drew fresh students to her lecture by the attractions of his wit his arguments and last but not least his unrivalled cook and cellar above all he acted the part of a fierce and valiant watchdog on her behalf against the knots of clownish and often brutal sophists the wrecks of the old cynic stoic and academic schools who with venom increasing after the want of parties with their decrepitude assailed the beautifully bespangled card castle of neoplatonism as an empty medley of all greek philosophies with all eastern superstitions all such philistines had as yet dreaded the pen and tongue of raphael even more than those of the chivalrous bishop of cyrene though he certainly to judge from certain of his letters hated them as much as he could hate any human being which was after all not very bitterly but the visits of cynesius were few and far between the distance between carthage and alexandria and the labour of his diocese 
and worse than all the growing difference in purpose between him and his beautiful teacher made his protection all but valueless and now aben ezra was gone too and with him were gone a thousand plans and hopes to have converted him at last to a philosophic faith in the old gods to have made him her instrument for turning back the stream of human error ay how often had that dream crossed her and now who would take its place athanasius synesius in his good nature might dignify him with the name of brother but to her he was a powerless pedant destined to die without having wrought any deliverance on the earth as indeed the event proved plutarch of athens he was superannuated syrianus a mere logician twisting aristotle to mean what she knew and he ought to have known aristotle never meant her father a man of triangles and conic sections how paltry they all looked by the side of the unfathomable jew spinners of charming cobwebs but would the flies condescend to be caught in them builders of pretty houses if people would but enter and live in them preachers of superfine morality which their admiring pupils never dreamt of practising without her she well knew philosophy must die in alexandria and was it her wisdom or other and more earthly charms of hers which enabled her to keep it alive sickening thought oh that she were ugly only to test the power of her doctrines ho oh, the odds were fearful enough already she would be glad of any help however earthly and carnal but was not the work hopeless what she wanted was men who could act while she thought and those were just the men whom she would find nowhere but she knew it too well in the hated christian priesthood and then that fearful iphigenia sacrifice loomed in the distance as inevitable the only hope of philosophy was in her despair she dashed away her tears and proudly entered the lecture hall and ascended the tribune like a goddess amid the shouts of her audience what did she care for them would they do what she told them she was half through her lecture before she could recollect herself and banish from her mind the thought of raphael and at that point we will take the lecture up Quote, truth where is truth but in the soul itself facts objects are but phantoms matter woven ghosts of this earthly night at which the soul sleeping here in the mire and clay of matter shudders and names its own vague tremors sense and perception yet even as our nightly dreams stir in us the suspicion of mysterious and immaterial presences unfettered by the bonds of time and space so do these waking dreams which we call sight and sound they are divine messengers whom zeus pitying his children even when he pent them in this prison-house of flesh appointed to arouse in them dim recollections of that real world of souls whence they came awakened once to them seeing through the veil of sense and fact the spiritual truth of which they are but the accidental garment concealing the very thing which they make palpable the philosopher may neglect the fact for the doctrine the shell for the kernel the body for the soul of which it is but the symbol and the vehicle what matter then to the philosopher whether these names of men hector or priam helen or achilles were ever visible as phantoms of flesh and blood before the eyes of men what matter whether they spoke or thought as he of sios says they did what matter even whether he himself ever had earthly life the book is here the word which men call his let the thoughts thereof have been at first whose they may now they are mine i have taken them to myself and thought them to myself and made them parts of my own soul nay they were and ever will be parts of me 
for they even as the poet was even as i am are but a part of the universal soul what matter then what myths grew up around those mighty thoughts of ancient seers let others try to reconcile the cyclic fragments or vindicate the catalogue of ships what has the philosopher lost though the former were proved to be contradictory and the latter interpolated the thoughts are there and ours let us open our hearts lovingly to receive them from whencesoever they may have come as in men so in books the soul is all with which our souls must deal and the soul of the book is whatsoever beautiful and true and noble we can find in it it matters not to us whether the poet was altogether conscious of the meanings which we can find in him consciously or unconsciously to him the meanings must be there for were they not there to be seen how could we see them there are those among the uninitiate vulgar and those too who carry under the philosophic cloak hearts still uninitiate who revile such interpretations as merely the sophistic and arbitrary sports of fancy it lies with them to show what homer meant if our spiritual meanings be absurd to tell the world why homer is admirable if that for which we hold him up to admiration does not exist in him will they say that the honour which he has enjoyed for ages was inspired by that which seems to be his first and literal meaning and more will they venture to impute that literal meaning to him can they suppose that the divine soul of homer could degrade itself to write of actual and physical feastings and nuptials and dances actual nightly thefts of horses actual fidelity of dogs and swineherds actual intermarriages between deities and men or that it is this scenic vulgarity which has won for him from the wisest of every age a title of the father of poetry degrading thought fit only for the coarse and sense-bound tribe who can appreciate nothing but what is palpable to sense and sight as soon believe the christian scriptures when they tell us of a deity who has hands and feet eyes and ears who condescends to command the patterns of furniture and culinary utensils and is made perfect by being born disgusting thought as the son of a village maiden and defiling himself with the wants and sorrows of the lowest slaves End quote. End of chapter eight part one Chapter 8, Part 2 of Hypatia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. Hypatia by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 8, The East Wind. Part 2. Quote, it is false blasphemous the scriptures cannot lie end quote, cried a voice from the farther end of the room it was philemon's he had been listening to the whole lecture and yet not so much listening as watching in bewilderment the beauty of the speaker the grace of her action the melody of her voice and last but not least the maze of her rhetoric as it glittered before his mind's eye like a cobweb diamonded with dew a sea of new thoughts and questions if not of doubts came rushing in at every sentence on his acute greek intellect all the more plentifully and irresistibly because his speculative faculty was as yet altogether waste and empty undefended by any scientific culture from the inrushing flood for the first time in his life he found himself face to face with the root questions of all thought. Quote, what am I and where? End quote. Quote, what can I know? End quote. And in the half terrified struggle with them, he had all but forgotten the purpose for which he entered the lecture hall. He felt that he must break the spell. Was she not a heathen and a false prophetess? 
here was something tangible to attack and half an indignation at the blasphemy half in order to force himself into action he had sprung up and spoken a yell arose quote, turn the monk out end quote. Quote, throw the rustic through the window end quote cried a dozen young gentlemen several of the most valiant began to scramble over the benches up to him and philemon was congratulating himself on the near approach of a glorious martyrdom when hypatia's voice calm and silvery stifled the tumult in a moment quote, let the youth listen gentlemen he's but a monk and a plebeian and knows no better he has been taught thus let him sit here quietly and perhaps we may be able to teach him otherwise End quote. and without interrupting even by a change of tone the thread of her discourse she continued quote, listen then to a passage from the sixth book of the iliad in which last night i seemed to see glimpses of some mighty mystery you know it well yet i will read it to you the very sound and pomp of that great verse may tune our souls to a fit key for the reception of lofty wisdom for well said abomnon the teacher that quote, the soul consisted first of harmony and rhythm and ere it gave itself to the body had listened to the divine harmony therefore it is that when after having come into a body it hears such melodies as most preserve the divine footstep of harmony it embraces such and recollects from them that divine harmony and is impelled to it and finds its home in it and shares of it as much as it can share End quote. and therewith fell on philemon's ear for the first time the mighty thunder roll of homer's verse quote, so spoke the stewardess but hector rushed from the house the same way back down stately streets through the broad city to the scion gates whereby he must go forth toward the plain there running toward him came andromache his ample dowered wife etion's child etion the great-hearted he who dwelt in theme under placos in the woods of placos ruling over killick men his daughter wedded hector brazen helmed and met him then and with her came a maid who bore in arms a playful-hearted babe an infant still akin to some fair star only and well-loved child of hector's house whom he had named scamandrios but the rest astyanax because his sire alone upheld the wheel of ilion the holy he smiled in silence looking on his child but she stood close to him with many tears and hung upon his hand and spoke and called him quote, my hero thy great heart will wear thee out thou pitiest not thine infant child nor me the hapless soon to be thy widow the greeks will slay thee falling one and all upon thee but to me were sweeter far having lost thee to die no cheer to me will come thenceforth if thou shouldst meet thy fate woes only mother have i none nor sire for that my sire divine achilles slew and wasted utterly the pleasant homes of killick folk in thebe lofty walled and slew etion with the sword yet spared to strip the dead awe kept his soul from that therefore he burnt him in his graven arms and heaped a mound above him and around the damsels of the aegis holding zeus the nymphs who haunt the upland planted elms and seven brothers bred with me in the halls all in one day went down to hades there for all of them swift-foot achilles slew beside the lazy kind snow-white sheep and her my mother who of late was queen beneath the woods of places he brought here among his other spoils yet set her free again receiving ransom rich and great but artemis whose bow is all her joy smote her to death within her father's halls hector so thou art father to me now mother and brother and husband fair and strong oh come now pity me and stay thou here upon the tower 
nor make thy child an orphan and me thy wife a widow range the men here by the fig tree where the city lies lowest and where the wall can well be scaled for here three times the best have tried the assault round either ajax and adomineus and round the atridae both and tydeus' son whether some cunning seer taught them craft or their own spirit stirred and drove them on End quote. then spake tall hector with the glancing helm all this too i have watched my wife yet much i hold in dread the scorn of trojan men and trojan women with their trailing shawls if like a coward i should skulk from war beside i have no lust to stay i have learnt i to be bold and lead the van of fight to win my father and myself a name for well i know at heart and in my thought a day will come when ilios the holy shall lie in heaps and priam and the folk of ashes beard priam perish all but yet no woe to come to trojan men not even to hecabe nor priam king nor to my brothers who shall roll in dust many and fair beneath the strokes of foes so moves me as doth thine when thou shalt go weeping led off by some brass harnessed greek robbed of the daylight of thy liberty to weave an argos at another's loom or bear the water of Mycenae home or hyperia with unseemly toils while heavy doom constrains thee and perchance the folk may say who see thy tears run down quote, this was the wife of hector best in fight at ilium of horse-taming trojan men End quote. so will they say perchance while unto thee now grief will come for such a husband's loss who might have warded off the day of thrall but may the soil be heaped above my corpse before I hear thy shriek and see thy shame. Quote. He spoke and stretched his arms to take the child, but back the child upon his nurse's breast shrank, crying, frightened at his father's looks, fearing the brass and crest of horse's hair which waved above the helmet terribly. Then out that father, dear, and mother laughed and glorious hector took the helmet off and laid it gleaming on the ground and kissed his darling child and danced him in his arm and spoke in prayer to zeus and all the gods quote, zoo and ye other gods o grant that this my child like me may grow the champion here as good in strength and rule with might in troy that men may say quote, the boy is better far than was his sire end quote when he returns from war bearing a gory harness having slain a foeman and his mother's heart rejoice thus saying on the hands of his dear wife he laid the child and she received him back in fragrant bosom smiling through her tears quote. Quote, such is the myth do you fancy that in it homer meant to hand down to the admiration of ages such earthly commonplaces as a mother's brute affection and the terrors of an infant surely the deeper insight of the philosopher may be allowed without the reproach of fancifulness to see in it the adumbration of some deeper mystery the elect soul for instance is not its name astyanax king of the city by the fact of its ethereal parentage the leader and lord of all around it though it knows it not a child as yet it lies upon the fragrant bosom of its mother nature the nurse and yet the enemy of man andromache as the poet well names her because she fights with that being when grown to man's estate whom as a child she nourished fair is she yet unwise pampering us after the fashion of mothers with weak indulgences fearing to send us forth into the great realities of speculation there to forget her in the pursuit of glory she would have us while away our prime within the harem and play for ever round her knees and has not the elect soul a father too whom it knows not hector he who is without unconfined unconditioned by nature yet its husband the all-pervading plastic soul informing organizing whom men call zeus the lawgiver 
ether the fire osiris the life-giver whom here the poet has set forth as the defender of the mystic city the defender of harmony and order and beauty throughout the universe apart sits his great father priam the first of existences father of many sons the absolute reason unseen tremendous immovable in distant glory yet himself amenable to that abysmal unity which homer calls fate the source of all which is yet in itself nothing without predicate unnameable from it and for it the universal soul thrills through the whole creation doing the behests of that reason from which it overflowed unwillingly into the storm and crowd of material appearances warring with the brute forces of gross matter crushing all which is foul and dissonant to itself and clasping to its bosom the beautiful and all wherein it discovers its own reflex impressing on it its signature reproducing from it its own likeness whether star or demon or soul of the elect and yet as the poet hints in anthropomorphic language haunted all the while by sadness weighed down amid all its labours by the sense of a fate by the thought of that first one from whom the soul is originally descended from whom it and its father the reason before it parted themselves when they dared to think and act and assert their own free will and in the meanwhile alas hector the father fights around while his children sleep and feed and he is away in the wars and they know him not know not that they the individuals are but parts of him the universal and yet at moments oh thrice blessed they whose celestial parentage has made such moments part of their appointed destiny at moments flashes on the human child the intuition of the unutterable secret in the spangled glory of the summer night in the roar of the nile flood sweeping down fertility in every wave in the awful depths of the temple shrine in the wild melodies of old orphic singers or before the images of those gods of whose perfect beauty the divine theosophists of greece caught a fleeting shadow and with the sudden might of artistic ecstasy smote it as by an enchanter's wand into an eternal sleep of snowy stone in these there flashes on the inner eye a vision beautiful and terrible of a force an energy a soul an idea one and yet millionfold rushing through all created things like the wind across a lyre, thrilling the strings into celestial harmony. One life blood through the million veins of the universe, from one great unseen heart, whose thunderous pulses the mind hears far away, beating forever in the abysmal solitude, beyond the heavens and the galaxies, beyond the spaces and the times, themselves but veins and runnels from its all-teeming sea happy thrice happy they who once have dared even though breathless blinded with tears of awful joy struck down upon their knees in utter helplessness as they feel themselves but dead leaves in the wind which sweeps the universe happy they who have dared to gaze if but for an instant on the terror of that glorious pageant who have not like the young astyanics clung shrieking to the breast of mother nature scared by the heaven-wide flash of hector's arms and the glitter of his rainbow crest happy thrice happy even though their eyeballs blasted by excess of light wither to ashes in their sockets were it not a noble end to have seen zeus and die like semele burnt up by his glory happy thrice happy though their mind reel from the divine intoxication and the hogs of circe call them henceforth madmen and enthusiasts enthusiasts they are for deity is in them and they in it for the time this burden of individuality vanishes 
and recognizing themselves as portions of the universal soul they rise upward through and beyond that reason from whence the soul proceeds to the fount of all the ineffable and supreme one and seeing it become by that act portions of its essence they speak no more but it speaks in them and their whole being transmuted by that glorious sunlight into whose rays they have dared like the eagle to gaze without shrinking becomes an harmonious vehicle for the words of deity and passive itself utters the secrets of the immortal gods what wonder if to the brute mass they seen as dreamers be it so smile if you will but ask me not to teach you things unspeakable above all sciences which the word battle of dialectic the discursive struggles of reason can never reach but which must be seen only and when seen confess to be unspeakable hence thou disputer of the academy hence thou sneering cynic hence thou sense-worshipping stoic who fanciest that the soul is to derive her knowledge from those material appearances which she herself creates hence and yet no stay and sneer if you will it is but a little time a few days longer in this prison house of our degradation and each thing shall return to its own fountain the blood drop to the abysmal heart and the water to the river and the river to the shining sea and the dewdrop which fell from heaven shall rise to heaven again shaking off the dust grains which weighed it down thawed from the earth frost which chained it here to herb and sward upward and upward even through stars and suns through gods and through the parents of the gods pure and pure through successive lives till it enters the nothing which is the all and finds its home at last End quote. And the speaker stopped suddenly, her eyes glistening with tears, her whole figure trembling and dilating with rapture. She remained for a moment motionless, gazing earnestly at her audience, as if in hopes of exciting in them some kindred glow, and then, recovering herself, added, in a more tender tone, not quite unmixed with sadness, quote, Go now, my pupils. Hypatia has no more for you today. Go now and spare her at least woman as she is after all the shame of finding that she has given you too much and lifted the veil of isis before eyes which are not enough purified to behold the glory of the goddess farewell End quote. she ended and philemon the moment that the spell of her voice was taken off him sprang up and hurried out through the corridor into the street so beautiful so calm and merciful to him so enthusiastic towards all which was noble had not she too spoken of the unseen world of the hope of immortality of the conquest of the spirit over the flesh just as a christian might have done was the gulf between them so infinite if so why had her aspirations awakened echoes in his own heart echoes too just in such as the prayers and lessons of the Laura used to awaken. If the fruit was so like, must not the root be like also? Could that be a counterfeit? That a minister of Satan in the robes of an angel of light? Light, at least, it was purity, simplicity, courage, earnestness, tenderness, flashed out from eye, lip, gesture. A heathen, who disbelieved what was the meaning of it all but the finishing stroke yet remained which was to complete the utter confusion of his mind for before he had gone fifty yards up the street his little friend of the fruit basket whom he had not seen since he vanished under the feet of the mob in the gateway of the theatre clutched him by the arm and burst forth breathless with running Quote, the g gods were eat their favors uh, on those who, who who least deserve them rash and insolent rustic 
and this is the reward art of thy madness off with you said philemon who had no mind at the moment to renew his acquaintance with the little porter but the guardian of parasols kept a firm hold on his sheepskin fool hypatia herself commands yes you will see her have speech with her while i i the illuminated i the appreciating i the obedient i the adoring who for these three years past have grovelled in the kennel that the hem of her garment might touch the tip of my little finger i i i what do you want madman she calls for thee insensate wretch theon sent me breathless at once with running and with envy go favourite of the unjust gods who is theon her father ignorant he commands thee to be at her house here opposite to-morrow at the third hour hear and obey there they are coming out of the museum all the parasols will get wrong oh miserable me and the poor little fellow rushed back again while philemon at his wit's end between dread and longing started off and ran the whole way home to the serapeum regardless of carriages elephants and foot passengers and having been knocked down by a surly porter and left a piece of his sheepskin between the teeth of a spiteful camel neither of which insults he had time to resent arrived at the archbishop's house found peter the reader and tremblingly begged an audience from cyril End of chapter eight chapter nine of hypatia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david cole medway massachusetts hypatia by charles kingsley chapter nine the snapping of the bow Cyril heard Philammon's story and Hypatia's message with a quiet smile, and then dismissed the youth to an afternoon of labour in the city, commanding him to mention no word of what had happened, and to come to him that evening and receive his order when he should have had time to think over the matter. So forth Philammon went with his companions, through lanes and alleys hideous with filth and poverty, compulsory idleness and native sin. Fearfully real and practical it all was, but he saw it all dimly as in a dream. Before his eyes one face was shining, in his ears one silvery voice was ringing. He is a monk and knows no better. True, and how should he know better? How could he tell how much more there was to know? In that great new universe, in such a cranny whereof his life had till now been passed. He had heard but one side already. What if there were two sides? Had he not a right, that is, was it not proper, fair, prudent, that he should hear both, and then judge? Cyril had hardly, perhaps, done wisely for the youth in sending him out about the practical drudgery of benevolence, before deciding for him what was his duty with regard to Hypatia's invitation. He had not calculated on the new thoughts which were tormenting the young monk. Perhaps they would have been unintelligible to him had he known of them. Cyril had been bred up under the most stern dogmatic training in those vast monastic establishments which had arisen amid the neighbouring saltpetre quarries of Nitria where thousands toiled in voluntary poverty and starvation at vast bakeries, diaries, brickfields, tailor's shops, carpenter's yards, and expended the profits of their labour, not on themselves, for they had need of nothing, but on churches, hospitals, and arms. Educated in that world of practical industrial production, as well as of religious exercise, which by its proximity to the great city accustomed monks to that world which they despised, entangled from boyhood 
in the intrigues of his fierce and ambitious uncle Theophilus, Cyril had succeeded him in the Patriarchate of Alexandria without having felt a doubt, and stood free to throw his fiery energy and clear practical intellect into the cause of the Church without scruple, even where necessary without pity. How could such a man sympathize with a poor boy of twenty, suddenly dragged forth from the quiet cavern shadow of the Laura into the full blaze and roar of the world's noonday? He too was cloister-bred, but the busy and fanatic atmosphere of Nitria, where every nerve of soul and body was kept on a lifelong artificial strain, without rest, without simplicity, without human affection, was utterly antipodal to the government of the remote and needy, though no less industrious commonwealths of Cenobites, who dotted the lonely mountain glens, far up into the heart of the Nubian desert. In such a one Philammon had received, from a venerable man, a mother's sympathy as well as a father's care, and now he yearned for the encouragement of a gentle voice, for the greeting of a kindly eye, and was lonely and sick at heart. And still Hypatia's voice haunted his ears, like a strain of music, and would not die away. That lofty enthusiasm, so sweet and modest in its grandeur, that tone of pity, in one so lovely it could not be called contempt, for the many, that delicious phantom of being an elect spirit, unlike the crowd, and am I altogether like the crowd, said Philammon to himself, as he staggered along under the weight of a groaning fever patient. Can there be found no fitter work for me than this, which any porter from the quay might do as well? Am I not somewhat wasted on such toil as this? Have I not an intellect, a taste, a reason? I could appreciate what she said. Why should not my faculties be educated? Why am I only to be shut out from knowledge? There is a Christian gnosis as well as a heathen one. What was permissible to Clement? He had nearly said to Oregon, but checked himself on the edge of heresy. Is surely lawful for me? Is not my very craving for knowledge a sign that I am capable of it? Surely my sphere is the study rather than the street. And then his fellow labourers, he could not deny it to himself, began to grow less venerable in his eyes. Let him try as he might to forget the old priest's grumblings and detractions. The fact was before him. The men were coarse, fierce, noisy, so different from her. Their talk seemed mere gossip, scandalous too, and hard-judging most of it, about that man's private ambition and that woman's proud looks. And who had stayed for the Eucharist the Sunday before, and who had gone out after the sermon? And how the majority who did not stay could possibly dare to go, and how the minority who did not go could possibly dare to stay? Endless suspicions, sneers, complaints. What did they care for the eternal glories and the beatific vision? Their one test for all men and things, from the patriarch to the prefect, seemed to be, did he or it advance the cause of the church? Which Philammon soon discovered to mean their own cause, their influence, their self-glorification. And the poor boy, as his faculty for fault-finding quickened under the influence of theirs, seemed to see under the humble stock phrases in which they talked of their labours of love, and the future reward of their present humiliations, a deep and hardly hidden pride, a faith in their own infallibility, a contemptuous impatience of every man, however venerable, who differed from their party on any, the slightest matter. They spoke with sneers of Augustine's Latinizing tendencies, and with open execrations of Chrysostom, as the vilest and most impious of schismatics, and for aught Philammon knew, they were right enough. But when they talked of wars and desolation, past and impending, 
without a word of pity for the slain and ruined, as a just judgment of heaven upon heretics and heathens, when they argued over the awful struggle for power which, as he gathered from their words, was even then pending between the Emperor and the Count of Africa, as if it contained but one question of interest to them. Would Cyril, and they as his bodyguard, gain or lose power in Alexandria? And lastly, when at some mention of Orestes, and of Hypatia as his counsellor, they broke out into open imprecations of God's curse, and comforted themselves with the prospect of everlasting torment for both. He shuddered and asked himself involuntarily, Were these the ministers of a gospel? Were these the fruits of Christ's spirit? And a whisper thrilled through the inmost depth of his soul, Is there a gospel? Is there a spirit of Christ? Would not their fruits be different from these? Faint and low and distant was that whisper, like the mutter of an earthquake miles below the soil. And yet, like the earthquake roll, it had in that one moment jarred every belief and hope and memory of his being, each a hair's breadth from its place. Only one hair's breadth, but that was enough. His whole inward and outward world changed shape, and cracked at every joint. What if it were to fall in pieces? His brain reeled with the thought. He doubted his own identity. The very light of heaven had altered its hue. Was the firm ground on which he stood, after all, no solid reality, but a fragile shell which covered what? The nightmare vanished and he breathed once more. What a strange dream! The sun in the exertion must have made him giddy. He would forget all about it. Weary with labour, and still wearier with thought, he returned that evening, longing and yet dreading to be permitted to speak with Hypatia. He half hoped at moments that Cyril might think him too weak for it, and the next, all his pride and daring, not to say his faith and hope, spurred him on. Might he but face the terrible enchantress, and rebuke her to her face, and yet so lovely, so noble as she looked. Could he speak to her, except in tones of gentle warning, pity, counsel, entreaty? Might he not convert her, save her? Glorious thought, to win such a soul to the true cause! to be able to show, as the first fruits of his mission, the very champion of heathendom. It was worth while to have lived only to do that, and having done it, to die. The archbishop's lodgings, when he entered them, were in a state of ferment even greater than usual. Groups of monks, priests, parabolani, and citizens rich and pure, were hanging about the courtyard, talking earnestly and angrily. A large party of monks fresh from Nitria, with ragged hair and beards, and the peculiar expression of countenance which fanatics of all creeds acquire, fierce and yet abject, self-conscious and yet ungoverned, silly and yet sly, with features coarsened and degraded by continual fasting and self-torture, prudishly shrouded from head to heel in their long ragged gowns, were gesticulating wildly and loudly, and calling on their more peaceable companions, in no measured terms, to revenge some insult offered to the church. "'What is the matter?' asked Philammon, of a quiet, portly citizen, who stood looking up with a most perplexed visage at the windows of the patriarch's apartments. "'Don't ask me.' I have nothing to do with it. Why does not His Holiness come out and speak to them? Blessed Virgin, Mother of God, that we were well through it all. Coward! bawled a monk in his ear. These shopkeepers care for nothing but seeing their stall safe. Rather than lose a day's custom, they would give the very churches to be plundered by the heathen. We do not want them, cried another. We managed Dioscorus, and his brother, and we can manage Orestes. 
What matter what answer he sends? The devil shall have his own. They ought to have been back two hours ago. They were murdered by this time. He would not dare to touch the archdeacon. He would dare anything. Cyril should never have sent them forth as lambs among wolves. What necessity was there for letting the prefect know that the Jews were gone? He would have found it out for himself fast enough, the next time he wanted to borrow money. "'What is all this about, reverend sir?' asked Philammon, of Peter the reader, who made his appearance at that moment in the quadrangle, walking with great strides, like the soul of Agamemnon, across the meads of Asphodel, and apparently beside himself with rage. "'Ah, you there! You may go to-morrow, young fool. The patriarch can't talk to you. Why should he? Some people have a good deal too much notice taken of them, in my opinion. Yes, you may go. If your head is not turned already, you may go and get it turned to-morrow. We shall see whether he who exalts himself is not abased before all is over. And he was striding away, when Philammon, at the risk of an explosion, stopped him. His Holiness commanded me to see him, sir, before. Peter turned on him in a fury. Fool! Will you dare to intrude your fantastical dreams on him at such a moment as this? He commanded me to see him, said Philammon, with the true soldier-like discipline of a monk, and see him I will in spite of any man. I believe in my heart you wish to keep me from his counsels and his blessings. Peter looked at him for a moment, with a right wicked expression, and then, to the youth's astonishment, struck him full in the face, and yelled for help. If the blow had been given by Pambo in the Laura a week before, Philammon would have borne it. But from that man, and coming unexpectedly as the finishing stroke to all his disappointment and disgust, it was intolerable, and in an instant Peter's long legs were sprawling on the pavement, while he bellowed like a bull for all the monks in Nitria. A dozen lean brown hands were at Philammon's throat as Peter rose. "'Seize him! Hold him!' half blubbered he. "'The traitor, the heretic! He holds communion with heathens. Down with him! Cast him out! Carry him to the archbishop!' While Philammon shook himself free, and Peter returned to the charge. "'I call all good Catholics to witness!' He has beaten an ecclesiastic in the courts of the Lord's house, even in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, and he was in Hypatia's lecture-room this morning. A groan of pious horror arose. Philammon set his back against the wall. His Holiness the Patriarch sent me. He confesses, he confesses. He deluded the piety of the Patriarch into letting him go, under colour of converting her, and even now he wants to intrude on the sacred presence of Cyril, burning only with a carnal desire that he may meet the sorceress in her house to-morrow. Scandal! Abomination in the holy place! And a rush at the poor youth took place. His blood was thoroughly up. The respectable part of the crowd, as usual in such cases, prudently retreated, and left him to the mercy of the monks, with an eye to their own reputation for orthodoxy, not to mention their personal safety. And he had to help himself as he could. He looked round for a weapon. There was none. The ring of monks were baying at him like hounds round a bear, and though he might have been a match for any one of them singly, yet their sinewy limbs and determined faces warned him that against such odds the struggle would be desperate. Let me leave this court in safety. God knows whether I am a heretic, and to him I commit my cause. The holy patriarch shall know of your iniquity. I will not trouble you. I give you leave to call me heretic or heathen if you will, if I cross this threshold, till Cyril himself sends for me back to shame you. And he turned and forced his way to the gate, amid a yell of derision, which brought every drop of blood in his body into his cheeks. Twice, as he went down the vaulted passage, a rush was made on him from behind, but the soberer of his persecutors checked it. Yet he could not leave them, young and hot-headed as he was, 
without one last word, and on the threshold he turned. You, who call yourselves the disciples of the Lord, and are more like the demoniacs who abode day and night in the tombs, crying and cutting themselves with stones. In an instant they rushed at him, and luckily for him, rushed also into the arms of a party of ecclesiastics, who were hurrying inwards from the street, with faces of blank terror. "'He has refused,' shouted the foremost. "'He declares war against the Church of God.' "'Oh, my friends,' panted the archdeacon, "'we are escaped like the bird out of the snare of the fowler. "'The tyrant kept us waiting two hours at his palace gates, "'and then sent lictors out upon us, with rods and axes, "'telling us that they were the only message "'which he had for robbers and rioters. "'Back to the Patriarch! and the whole mob streamed in again, leaving Philammon alone in the street, and in the world. Whither now? He strode on in his wrath some hundred yards or more before he asked himself that question, and when he asked it he found himself in no humour to answer it. He was adrift and blown out of harbour upon a shoreless sea, in utter darkness. All heaven and earth were nothing to him. He was alone in the blindness of anger. Gradually one fixed idea, as a light-tower, began to glimmer through the storm, to see Hypatia and convert her. He had the patriarch's leave for that. That must be right. That would justify him, bringing him back, perhaps, in a triumph more glorious than any Caesar's, leading captive in the fetters of the gospel, the queen of heathendom, Yes, there was that left for which to live. His passion cooled down gradually as he wandered on in the fading evening light, up one street and down another, till he had utterly lost his way. What matter? He should find that lecture-room to-morrow at least. At last he found himself in a broad avenue, which he seemed to know. Was that the sun-gate in the distance? He sauntered carelessly down it, and found himself at last on the great esplanade, whither the little porter had taken him three days before. He was close then to the museum and to her house. Destiny had led him, unconsciously, towards the scene of his enterprise. It was a good omen. He would go thither at once. He might sleep upon her doorstep as well as upon any other. Perhaps he might catch a glimpse of her going out or coming in, even at that late hour. It might be well to accustom himself to the sight of her. There would be the less chance of his being abashed to-morrow, before those sorceress eyes, and moreover, to tell the truth, his self-dependence and his self-will too, crushed, or rather laid to sleep, by the discipline of the Laura, had started into wild life and given him a mysterious pleasure, which he had not felt since he was a disobedient little boy, of doing what he chose, right or wrong, simply because he chose it. Such moments come to every free-willed creature. Happy are those who have not, like poor Philammon, been kept by a hotbed cultivation from knowing how to face them. But he had yet to learn or rather his tutors had to learn, that the sure path toward willing obedience and manful self-restraint lies not through slavery, but through liberty. He was not certain which was Hypatia's house, but the door of the museum he could not forget. So there he sat himself down under the garden wall, soothed by the cool night and the holy silence, and the rich perfume of the thousand foreign flowers which fill the air with enervating balm. There he sat, and watched, and watched, and watched in vain, for some glimpse of his one object. Which of the houses was hers? Which was the window of her chamber? Did it look into the street? What business had his fancy with women's chambers? But that one open window, with the lamp burning bright inside, he could not help looking up to it, he could not help fancying, hoping. He even moved a few yards to 
to see better the bright interior of the room. High up as it was, he could still discern shelves of books, pictures on the walls. Was that a voice? Yes, a woman's voice, reading aloud in meter, was plainly distinguishable in the dead stillness of the night, which did not even awaken a whisper in the trees above his head. He stood, spellbound by curiosity. Suddenly the voice ceased, and a woman's figure came forward to the window, and stood motionless, gazing upward at the spangled star-world overhead, and seeming to drink in the glory and the silence and the rich perfume. Could it be she? Every pulse in his body throbbed madly. Could it be? What was she doing? He could not distinguish the features, but the full blaze of the eastern moon showed him an upturned brow between a golden stream of glittering tresses which hid her whole figure except the white hands clasped upon her bosom. Was she praying? Were these her midnight sorceries? And still his heart throbbed and throbbed, till he almost fancied she must hear its noisy beat. And still she stood motionless, gazing upon the sky, like some exquisite chryselephantine statue, all ivory and gold. And behind her, round the bright room within, paintings, books, a whole world of unknown science and beauty, and she the priestess of it all, inviting him to learn of her and be wise. It was a temptation. He would flee from it, fool that he was, and it might not be she after all. He made some sudden movement. She looked down, saw him, and shutting the blind, vanished for the night. In vain, now that the temptation had departed, he sat and waited for its reappearance, half cursing himself for having broken the spell. But the chamber was dark and silent henceforth, and Philammon, wearied out, found himself soon wandering back to the Laura in quiet dreams, beneath the balmy, semi-tropic night. End of chapter 9《ハパティア》ッドハパティア。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole.《ハパティア》by Charles Kingsley. Chapter 10 The Interview. Part 1. Philammon was aroused from his slumbers at sunrise the next morning by the attendants who came in to sweep out the lecture-rooms, and wandered, disconsolately enough, up and down the street, longing for, and yet dreading, the three weary hours to be over, which must pass before he would be admitted to Hypatia. But he had tasted no food since noon the day before. He had but three hours' sleep the previous night, and had been working, running, and fighting for two whole days, without a moment's peace of body or mind, sick with hunger and fatigue, and aching from head to foot, with his hard night's rest on the granite flags, he felt as unable as man could well do to collect his thoughts or brace his nerves for the coming interview. How to get food he could not guess, but having two hands, he might at least earn a coin by carrying a load, so he went down to the esplanade in search of work. Of that, alas, there was none. So he sat down upon the parapet of the quay, and watched the shoals of sardines which played in and out over the marble steps below, and wondered at the strange crabs and sea locusts which crawled up and down the face of the masonry, a few feet below the surface scrambling for bits of offal, and making occasional fruitless dashes at the nimble little silver arrows which played around them. And at last his whole soul, too tired to think of anything else, became absorbed in a mighty struggle between two great crabs, which held on stoutly, each by a claw, to his respective bunch of seaweed, while with the others they tugged, one at the head and the other at the tail of a dead fish which would conquer, I which. 
and for five minutes Philammon was alone in the world with the two struggling heroes. Might not they be emblematic? Might not the upper one typify Cyril, the lower one Hypatia, and the dead fish between himself? But at last the deadlock was suddenly ended, the fish parted in the middle, and the typical Hypatia and Cyril, losing hold of their respective seaweeds by the jerk, tumbled down, each with its half-fish, and vanished head over heels into the blue depths in so undignified a manner that Philammon burst into a shout of laughter. "'What's the joke?' asked a well-known voice behind him, and a hand patted him familiarly on the back. He looked round and saw the little porter, his head crowned with a full basket of figs, grapes, and watermelons, on which the poor youth cast a longing eye. "'Well, my young friend, and why are you not at church? Look at all the saints pouring into the caesarium there behind you.' Philammon answered sulkily enough, something inarticulate. "'Ho, ho! Quarrelled with the successor of the apostles already? Has my prophecy come true, and the strung meat of pious riot and plunder proved too highly spiced for young, young palate, eh?' poor Philammon, angry with himself for feeling that the porter was right, shrinking from the notion of exposing the failing of his fellow Christians, shrinking still more from making such a jackanapes his confidant, and yet yearning his loneliness to open his heart to some one, he dropped out, hint by hint, word by word, the events of the past evening, and finished by a request to be put in the way of earning his breakfast. Earning your breakfast? Shall the favourite of the gods, shall the guest of Hypatia, earn his breakfast, while I have an obol to share with him? Base thought! Youth, I have wronged you. Unphilosophically, I allowed, yesterday morning, envy to ruffle the ocean of my intellect. We are now friends and brothers, in hatred to the monastic tribe. I do not hate them, I tell you, said Philammon. But those Nitrian savages— are the perfect examples of monkery, and you hate them, and therefore, all greatest containing the less, you hate all less monastic monks. I have not heard logic lectures in vain, now up. The sea woos our dusty limbs. Nerids and tritons, charging no cruel coin, call us to nature's baths. At home a mighty sheet-fish smokes upon the festive board. Beer crowns the horn, and Ernians deck the dish. Come then, my guest and brother. Philammon swallowed certain scruples about becoming the guest of a heathen, seeing that otherwise there seemed no chance of having anything else to swallow, and after a refreshing plunge in the sea, followed the hospitable little fellow to Hypatia's door, where he dropped his daily load of fruit, and then into a narrow by-street, to the ground floor of a huge block of lodgings with a common staircase, swarming with children, cats, and chickens, and was ushered by his host into a little room, where the savoury smell of broiling fish revived Philammon's heart. "'Judith, Judith, where lingerest thou? Marble of Pentelicus, foam-flake of the wine-dark main, lily of the Mariotic lake, you accursed black Andromeda!' If you don't bring the breakfast this moment, I'll cut you in two. The inner door opened, and in bustled, trembling, her hands full of dishes, a tall, lithe negress, dressed in true negro fashion, in a snow-white cotton shift, a scarlet cotton petticoat, and a bright yellow turban of the same, making a light in that dark place, which would have served as a landmark a mile off. She put the dishes down, and a porter majestically waved Philammon to a stool, while she retreated and stood humbly waiting on her lord and master, who did not deign to introduce to his guest the black beauty which composed his whole seraglio. But indeed such an act of courtesy would have been needless, for the first morsel of fish was hardly safe in poor Philammon's mouth, when the negress rushed upon him, caught him by the head, and covered him with rapturous kisses. Up jumped the little man with a yell, brandishing a knife in one hand and a leek in the other. 
while Philammon, scarcely less scandalized, jumped up too, and shook himself free of the lady, who, finding it impossible to vent her feelings further on his head, instantly changed her tactics, and wallowing on the floor, began frantically kissing his feet. "'What is this? Before my face! Up, shameless baggage, or thou diest the death!' And the porter pulled her up upon her knees. "'It is the monk, the young man I told you of, who saved me from the Jews the other night. What good angel sent him back here, that I might thank him?' cried the poor creature, while the tears ran down her black shining face. "'I am that good angel,' said the porter, with a look of intense self-satisfaction. Arise, daughter of Erebus, thou art pardoned, being but a female. What says the poet? Woman is passion's slave, while rightful lord o'er her and passion rules the nobler male. Youth to my arms! Truly say the philosophers, that the universe is magical in itself, and by mysterious sympathies links like to like. The prophetic instinct of thy future benefits towards me, drew me to thee as by an invisible warp, hawser, or chain cable, from the moment I beheld thee. Thou went a kindred spirit, my brother, though thou knewest it not. Therefore I do not praise thee, no, nor thank thee in the least, though thou hast preserved for me the one palm which shadows my weary steps, the single lotus-flower, in this case black not white, which blooms for me, above the mud-stained ocean wastes of the hillic Barabbas. That which thou hast done, thou hast done by instinct, by divine compulsion. Thou couldst no more help it than thou canst help eating that fish, and art no more to be praised for it. Thank you, said Philammon. Comprehend me. Our theory in the schools for such cases is this, has been so at least for the last six months. Similar particles, from one original source, exist in you and me. Similar causes produce similar effects. Our attractions, antipathies, impulses, are therefore, in similar circumstances, absolutely the same. And therefore you did the other night exactly what I should have done in your case. Philammon thought the latter part of the theory open to question, but he had by no means stopped eating when he rose and his mouth was much too full of fish to argue. "'And therefore,' continued the little man, "'we are to consider ourselves henceforth as one soul in two bodies. You may have the best of the corporeal part of the division, yet it is the soul which makes the person. You may trust me. I shall not disdain my brotherhood. If any one insults you henceforth, you have but to call me.' and if I be within hearing, why by this right arm? And he attempted a pat on Philammon's head, which, as there was a head and shoulders difference between them, might on the whole have been considered, from a theatric point of view, as a failure. Whereupon the little man seized the calabash of beer, and filling therewith a cow's horn, his thumb on the small end, raised it high in the air. To the tenth news, and to your interview with her, and removing his thumb, he sent a steady jet into his open mouth, and having drained the horn without drawing breath, licked his lips, handed it to Philammon, and flew ravenously upon the fish and onions. Philammon, to whom the whole was supremely absurd, had no invocation to make, but one which he felt too sacred for his present temper of mind. So he attempted to imitate the little man's feet, and, of course, poured the beer into his eyes and up his nose and in his bosom, and finally choked himself black in the face, while his host observed smilingly, Aha, rustic! Unacquainted with the ancient and classical customs preserved in this centre of civilization by the descendants of Alexander's heroes, Judith, clear the table. Now to the sanctuary of the muses. Philammon rose and finished his meal by a monkish grace. A gentle and reverent Amen rose from the other end of the room. It was the negress. She saw him look up at her, dropped her eyes modestly, and bustled away with the remnants, while Philammon and his host started for Hypatia's lecture-room. 
"'Your wife is a Christian?' asked he, when they were outside the door. "'Ahem! The barbaric mind is prone to superstition. Yet she is, being but a woman and a negress, a good soul and thrifty, though requiring, like all lower animals, occasional chastisement. I married her on philosophic grounds. A wife was necessary to me for several reasons. But mindful that the philosopher should subjugate the material appetite, and rise above the swinish desires of the flesh, even when his nature requires him to satisfy them, I purposed to make pleasure as unpleasant as possible. I had the choice of several cripples. Their parents, of ancient Macedonian family like myself, were by no means averse. But I required a housekeeper, with whose duties the want of an arm or a leg might have interfered. "'Why did you not marry a scold?' asked Philammon. Pertinently observed, and indeed the example of Socrates, rose luminous more than once before my imagination. But philosophic calm, my dear youth, and the peaceful contemplation of the ineffable? I could not relinquish those luxuries. So having, by the bounty of Hypatia and her pupils, saved a small sum, I went out, bought me a negress, and hired six rooms in the block we have just left, where I let lodgings to young students of the divine philosophy. Have you any lodgers now? Ahem! Certain rooms are occupied by a lady of rank. The philosopher will, above all things, abstain from babbling. To bridle the tongue is too, but there is a closet at your service, and for the hall of reception, which you have just left, are you not a kindred and fraternal spark? We can combine our meals, as our souls are already united. Philammon thanked him heartily for the offer, though he shrank from accepting it, and in ten minutes more found himself at the door of the very house which he had been watching the night before. It was she, then, whom he had seen. He was handed over by a black porter to a smart slave-girl, who guided him up, through cloisters and corridors, to the large library, where five or six young men were sitting, busily engaged, under Theon's superintendence, in copying manuscripts and drawing geometric diagrams. End of chapter 10, part 1